analysts and a lot going on so we got a busy morning ahead but firstly just kind of set the stage here for the indexes the s p 500 pretty clear trend is still coming off of the high from this year lower highs lower lows got the big nice bounce and then a little bit of a fade on inflation at the second half of last week but so far this was pretty impressive the fact that we got through to 4400 and above again coming off the two days following inflation and then going into the weekend with the earnings from the banks not exactly lighting a fire under the market kind of what you expect generally the way it is the first day of earnings when it kicks off let's see what happens today and as we get a little time to process some of the financial earnings still though you have obviously cut through to the summer low this fall so you definitely have a trend in the s p big differences between the s p 500 and the nasdaq we're going to be joined by the russell indexing team this morning to talk about the constitution of the, the market and how different indexes have been trading and you can really see the big difference between tech and the rest of the market when you look at the nasdaq versus the s p 500 because the queues held below from the summer this past couple months that was an important development it means that we're not exactly trending downward big tech companies have obviously been doing a ton of legwork to keep the market afloat and that's where we're at huge degree of outperformance over the past year even though it kind of got chipped away at here in the last couple months as we had that macro pressure from interest rates the tech trade is still very much the stalwart the backbone of this market that keeps it together especially when you think about chip makers so it's going to be interesting to see how the market responds today to some news that the u.s is going to limit china's access to some of our best technology market doesn't seem to have a big problem with some of the u.s china controversy in terms of economics and trade the chip makers have been very solid and that's basically why the nasdaq has been able to hold these uh, levels because you've got companies like nvidia that refuse to break you've also got alphabet and you've also got amazon over the last uh, week making 52 week highs not records but 52 week highs so strength in a couple big cap key names have been frankly the story as simple as it may be even with all of that macro pressure that has been applied to the market the last couple months from the move in interest rates kind of looking like maybe it's going to take even more to keep tech down so this is definitely the bullish hope that you can at least maintain this range maybe if you really get a bullish development to try and trade above where we were in the late summer early fall late august basically kind of the next test of this range for the nasdaq if you look at the move in of banks last week in particular jp morgan after earnings big red candle not exactly what you want to see especially from a stock that's been a fantastic outperformer for the sector a very unique trade and so the red candle we got here i mean this is pretty ugly stuff uh, it's not exactly the worst because you still had an advance on the day and there's a gap up here but to drop as severely as jp morgan did throughout the session definitely uh, should keep us on our toes going into the meat of earnings season as we really kick it off here to see the report that led to an early rally faded by the time we were done on Friday. Not exactly encouraging. However, a little bit more encouragement if you look at uh, some of the tech earnings that are coming out and we move past the bank sector. Nobody really expects the banks to be the, uh, the real uh, strong point of this market going into this earnings season. The tech is going to have to live up to the expectations a lot more than banks are at this point. JP Morgan's an outlier in terms of its performance. Last thing, though, that developed over the past 10 days that deserves some attention is in the bond market and the yield curve. We had a pretty dramatic change in the direction of the yield curve around inflation data last week. Now, we saw all this widening out of the curve, the steepening that was happening as the long end was selling off, and 10 year yields were rising faster than twos. This is the tens to twos spread. That steepening, generally a good thing. What the market we know doesn't like from last year is curve flattening and inversion around and fed and inflation data so when you get last just on the margin the last week some of that flattening coming back in it's just something you want to keep an eye on because if the market does start to price in higher odds of a hike this curve probably starts to reflatten again and we know that risk assets don't like that so far just a little small amount there market not freaking out about inflation 
A lot of that, I think, still contingent on the language we're getting from the Fed speakers. Kevin Hanks host a fast market because even though some of the data have been coming in warm, of course, this summer and this fall, it doesn't seem like any of the language from the Fed speak, and we have got a lot of it coming up this week are really pushing for a hike. I had to bring out, get out my thesaurus this morning, a legion of Fed speakers. How's that one? Nice, yeah, yeah I like well, that. Yeah, Jerome Powell speaking on Thursday at the Economic Club of New York. That'll be the key. And then we get in after Friday, we're in the quiet period. So a lot of Fed speakers. If you look on the calendar, it is a whole page of Fed speakers coming out throughout the week. So they'll get real loud ahead of being quiet. In, in the next yeah. week and into the Fed meeting. But uh, a lot to talk about there. It seems like let's watch for the overall tone going into their it, it, into their Fed speak because is it the, I think we're done raising interest rates. It's just how long is the rhetoric switching? It's kind of pivoting to how long do we keep rates high, not how high can they go? It looks like from some of the rhetoric, if you read between the lines, no one really wants to say it. They, they say data dependent, they say a lot of things, but some people are starting to tap, uh, tiptoe around, we're done in terms of raising interest rates. So that's I interesting. You know, Oliver, this market, the end of last week, you and I spoke Friday afternoon, the risk off assets were blowing up all during the day Friday. It felt like the market was bracing for something that might happen over the weekend. Well, we really didn't get it. Matter of fact, things have, getting via possible diplomacy a little better they're they're evacuating people out of the out of gaza city as many as six hundred thousand people have been evacuated they're evacuating people from northern israel on the lebanon border so things you know whatever everyone feared is not as bad at least to start the week right yeah. it looks like civilians are getting out of the way the market's taking a little bit of that and then nothing has happened yet president biden going to israel rumored or hinted at that also seems to push back that narrative of any imminent event mm -hmm. and i think that's what the market you see the risk off assets are all easing back off their highs from last week markets are all higher start the week that start the week oliver obviously it still feels like this overall market is bracing for some headline some event out of the israel you know out of israel and gaza city so that's what we're still all clenched and waiting for the thing about that is from a geopolitical perspective connected to the market it seems so far that the evidence in my mind is quite limited that this is having as big of an impact as the russia ukraine situation that hit right in the middle of an inflationary right. event that was already happening because we did get the first reaction initially with israel we saw the defense stocks rally big yes. that day you saw the move in crude crude since has been uh stuck still below 90. it's been pretty well bid yep. but nothing the way that we saw the commodity market respond in the russia ukraine event so it seems like to me the market can at least in its hierarchy of uh catalysts shift that situation down a bit for now when you've got stuff like consensus forming around fed speakers right. that their whole policy regime might be coming to a close here and that's where the data comes in it feels like all our data the big chunk of our data was last week i know yes. we get some more this week but Your retail sales tomorrow retail sales, morning right these are kind of you know if we didn't make the move last week in bonds on inflation it's um i wonder if we're going to be able to make any big breakout moves without that level of data coming yeah with all the geopolitics with everything that happened this week stocks were higher yeah they weren't higher by a ton but they were still higher significant so that's pretty well off stocks are going to open up higher this morning it looks like if we can quiet the noise from geopolitics that u.s stocks want to go higher they're feeling pretty good about interest rates they're pr feeling pretty good about inflation so it looks like without that blanket over this market that that, that stocks want to at least for this morning drift higher so good news here but obviously wednesday uh netflix and tesla we move from financials yes. and airlines and a little bit of healthcare to large cap tech and that's, that's where things get big. real interesting that's yeah right. and you know not to downplay the role of the banks or the healthcare, etc but the expectations are not extremely high for these it right. feels like the valuation that's built up in this market still is very much surrounding tech yeah. 
airlines going and through consumer. that capacity discussion that they talk about that always puts a little downward pressure on them banks you already mentioned the yield curve but now when we get to high cap tech and all these stocks that have you know they they were very cheap at one time oliver in terms of pe ratios they're not now you get meta in the high 30s you're not talking about cheap anymore in some of these names right now they got to put up a number or they've got downside risk the fact that we had a few fresh 52 week highs in the past yeah. week from alphabet and amazon definitely starts to put the pressure on the earnings to perform stock like tesla too the, the long-term chart there's an exciting right. one i love you got, you got the yeah. lower highs you got the higher lows it's like you got to put up a number and you got to guide yeah right it, it's going to be it's going to be multi it's that three-pronged look at earnings it's it's earnings per share it's revenue and then it's the guidance yeah not going to be a lot of appetite for misses uh, on the mm -hmm. mega caps at this point right so right. Right. they've run a long way maybe we get a couple days here for bulls to find their legs mm -hmm. after a little bit of a uh, uh rough into no last news. week no news is good news oliver okay all right thanks uh, Kev, for the look here. Let's talk some more tech with some of the developments happening out of China in particular with Renita Young, Senior Markets Correspondent. Renita, let's talk Apple first. Then we're going to talk about the headline overall from the government. Mm -hmm. Still trying to figure out how China's going to get access to our chips, but Apple in particular, what's the latest? Well, right now, stock this stock is down this morning in the pre-market. It's because we find out that the iPhone 15 is not doing as well in China as one would have expected, mm. and definitely not as well as in the U.S. Two separate analyses show that sales of the iPhone 15 are far worse than sales of the iPhone 14 and if these analyses are correct then that would make China the or this time around the worst China debut for the iPhone since around 2018 mm. coincidentally that was when China had a couple of local phones that were heating up the competition and that's also part of the story today now counterpoint research counterpoint research data that shows that sales of the iPhone 15 are down four and a half percent compared with the iPhone 14 over the first 17 days after release this research company blames the China slump on the economy that still hasn't rebounded from that COVID slump yet but Jeffrey's analysts they say the iPhone 15 sales are down by a double digit percentage and this is weak demand and rising competition mm. they note in particular Huawei's phone that they put out a few weeks before the iPhone went on the market that outsold Apple in its debut by the way and if this time around is even a tougher time for Apple because of that fact number one when the iPhone 15 came out also Jeffrey says that it Huawei actually has the top spot in the market now over Apple and it's possible that it could have that as well into 2024 the trends are suggesting that mm -hmm. and then also Apple is seeing the weakest iPhone demand in a decade weakest smartphone demand in a decade when it comes to this new set in China we also have backlash from the iPhone overheating as well not sure how many more reports have come out about that it hasn't been as prevalent in the news lately good as it was morning the first week sure, but it doesn't help. right but welcome it doesn't to help happy money it Monday thank you for being here as well with the you guys had a good weekend well rested for the week ready for Monday Ready to be disciplined and be patient. Hurry up and wait. That's what you gotta do. Uh, thank you guys for being here. We're gonna be streaming stocks, options, futures trading today. We'll be looking at uh, technical analysis, watching SPY, trading dailies on the SPY, daily options. Mm, I'm doing some theta farming maybe too if opportunity presents itself. And trading shares, futures, we'll see. I haven't traded futures in a bit. Thanks for being here. Sub up, like up, comment down. Happy money sticks around. You can follow us on Twitter as well at happymoneyyt. We have a Discord server. Link for those are both in the description. And I'll put a link in chat as well. Guts. Hope you had a good weekend as well, man. Mine was good. Yeah, another weekend that felt long for some reason, which I guess is nice. Nice reset. Good morning, Sir Dalla. Good morning. Uh, yeah, kind of. Yeah. 
Gotta get back into it. Get in get in slow, get my momentum. Just scanning some uh different stocks here pre-market for the Theta farm. Do have news on Rad. It's halted. Filing for chapter eleven. Um and then liquor, I don't know if it's up, but it's up 132%. We also have Spy, it's up pre-market about half percent, 0.6. So yesterday I was getting a little bit of, uh, the VIX was probably climbing with all the volatility we were getting. Um, kind of those last two days back to back. Yeah, pretty good sell-offs. Um, good for trading though. Want the volatility to go up, want the VIX to go up. That's all good for, good for trading. So we'll see. To where we're headed. Um, that engulfing candle on Thursday met by another red candle volume on Friday. So, yeah, I think we still could be in a, an uptrend here um, for potentially the rest of the year uh, into the new year for Santa Claus rally. So let's see, it's about mid-October. Um, curious if we break this channel, if we do get some more upside, if we fill this gap, and if we find resistance here, or if we break up above it and some horizontal resistance here, or even fill that gap. Um, or is this is this the top of this trend and we just sell off and make new lows? But I think volatility is to be expected. Got earnings coming uh, next few weeks as well, so should see some volatility with that. I don't know the news on liquor. Didn't see anything on Weeble, so don't know why it's rallying. That has been a dumpster fire IPO, though. Tuphead. Oh, it's Tupperware. Wait, what? Did Tup start? I don't remember this last week. I started ripping again. I kind of do. Interesting. Yeah, I guess I did put a channel in there. That's right. That's right. Like I said, it's like a long weekend, kind of interesting. Series up five and a half percent on Friday. It looks like it's down three percent pre market here. A lot of earnings, a lot of earnings coming up. Open door. You know, Jimmy close to 16. Hmm. Maybe within its range, major calls. If you're holding 16 strike, you don't want a 16. <laughs> you want like 14 strike calls for that price. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just been in this downtrend pretty much since what, two earnings ago? Yeah. And then RC bought in, uh, or no, was this, this was, uh, yeah, this was RC, I think. And then also a couple other insiders. And yeah, since then it's just been 
pretty steep downtrend. So, expecting that to continue until we break one of these resistance lines here, which could happen. We saw that RSI divergence. Um, we have an inverse head, we have an inverse shoulder, just need to break here and build another shoulder and then, then it could look good. As far as this Friday, 16, I don't know. 15 now, it really depends on the market for those probably next few days and how earnings go with everything else. BITF, Bit Farms, how about a something I can watch or what do you mean cover it? But yeah, we know we know a one world currency is coming. about seven minutes to open here um gonna be trading with the third string to start so it'll be tomorrow's options on spy and then wait for a try and wait for all of them for a perfect setup but uh with a smaller cash account now i'll, I'll be uh just doing one trade one trade with it and choosing the whole account oh so, yeah and those will be dailies Oh yeah, the other news, if you guys didn't hear, it's in my title, or on my tweet. Um, Rad filed for Chapter 11, which I suspected was coming. So, it's halted. And we'll see what we get on the other side. Um, this is probably the best case for them, just to settle the lawsuits, the opioid lawsuits that are against them. Uh, the DOJ is suing them and probably others too that I don't know about but uh, yeah so it's gonna settle those in chapter 11 and probably close some stores as well uh, they got or let me read, just read this they got a big funding loss or for the bankruptcy also chapter 11 like six, five billion or something crazy drugstore chain right it filed for bankruptcy late Sunday saying it will close more of its stores and it named a new CEO as part of restructuring. The pharmacy chain is facing a number of lawsuits related to the country's opioid epidemic and the, the company said chapter 11 bankruptcy filing will allow it to resolve litigation claims in an equitable manner. Rite Aid is the latest company embroiled in the opioid crisis to file for bankruptcy. In August, drug maker Mellencrod filed for its second bankruptcy in three years, helping it reduce settlement payments by roughly one billion for its alleged role in the epidemic. Isn't that funny? Um, yeah, there's some companies that just go through bankruptcy multiple times and just, if there's any big, any problem that's pretty big, they just, oh, chapter 11, protect us. Um, it's kind of interesting how companies are now just kind of using that as a crutch almost. The plan was approved last week. Rite Aid said it secured. Yeah, listen. Rite Aid said it secured 3.45 billion in new financing from lenders to support the company through the bankruptcy process. So lenders are giving Rite Aid a 3.45 billion to support them through bankruptcy. That's awesome. So I'm pretty pretty bullish on it going through it. Really. In a separate release, the company said Jeffrey Stein will take over as CEO with immediate effect, replacing Elizabeth Burr, who has held the role on an interim basis since January. Uh, the Justice Department sued Rite Aid in March, allegedly knowingly violated, uh, filled unlawful prescriptions. Uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll see. I got uh, I got a bunch of calls on it. Not a bunch. I got a bunch of time on them, though. Which, uh, 
with this little pump, I could have done pretty well in shorter term ones, but um, I, I got it more for coming back out of bankruptcy. So they're for January 2025. And I might get better deals as this thing gets resumed and I mean, it could very well become much cheaper penny stock when it's in chapter 11, I don't know. Or maybe it'll just be halted the whole time it's in chapter 11. I don't know quite how that works, but awesome, woo! Seven minutes to open, or sorry, three minutes to open. Um, yeah, so rad was the news. So one of the things we're following, then liquor. Uh, I don't know what news there is, but they've been doing awful. Oh, what? Delivering to Costco. Liquor announced that through its custom marketing campaign and strategic efforts, Bond Pain Whiskey is now displayed on the shelves of the retail giant, Costco. The order has officially been delivered to the following Costco stores across Southern California is now available for purchase. Uh, the accomplishment marks a significant milestone for both Liquor House and Bond Pain Whiskey, solidifying their presence in the alcohol shelves of one of the lar nation's largest retailers, just in time for Halloween season. I don't see how that benefits liquor too much. Um, where's the whiskey company? It's probably what that rip is from. I think so. Okay, Spy looks like it's open up about half percent. Mm, Jimmy's pretty much flat. AMC's down two and a half. We did get some preliminary numbers on uh, the Taylor Swift movie. I think it was like 95 million in the first weekend or the first night. Or not the first weekend because we don't have numbers for that yet. I think that was the first night. So pretty good. Uh, so opening weekend record for a concert movie which yeah I'd killed the last one which was I think Justin Bieber's. That was back in like 2011 or something. So Thank you guys for your support this morning. Free market likes. Thank you. Four of you for your thumbs ups. I appreciate it. Yeah, I wouldn't mess with the guts. Kind of uh I knew it was gonna bounce at some point, but yeah, it's so trash. So trash. All right, there's the silent bell that we don't have to endure. on the spy maybe maybe be alright for now liquor's up 160% Premium is flat AMC's down half a percent spy is up 0. 0.6 
Vita was up. Yeah, I saw crypto was pumping. Um, I guess the news in the Middle East is settled a little bit. I'm not sure. He works up six and a half. I can't remember what happened with this one. Remember, I think I got in it. Or no, I, I couldn't because of fidelity. I'm still in fidelity. Um, back up six point seven. Mara, another crypto. Crypto stocks up 13%. Peloton, New Egg. Big lots. Got some bouncers. Spy, new high there. Halted. Bets down 10%. Tupperware's down 5%. Like that gas is down. AMC is now down 2.5. Could be a sell the news type of thing. Buy new high there. Neg is now down two and a half. Maybe I hadn't woken up yet. Yeah. the most exciting thing on my watch list right now. I <laughs> have to stream on for your cat. <laughs> Thanks, Tasty. That's awesome. Miss you too, man. Hope work's going good. So this week we have some some data. If you're listening pre market. There's a lot of Fed speakers. Um, today we had what Empire State Manufacturing Survey at eight thirty, ten thirty. We have Fed Harker, four thirty. We have him again. And then Tuesday we have retail sales. Retail sales at eight thirty. Uh, industrial production capacity utilization 915 and then at Bowman is at 1030 business inventories at 10 home builder confidence index at 10 Fed president Barkin at 1045 Fed president Ashkari at 1030 so tomorrow morning a lot of Fed speakers ready to trigger stop losses Then Wednesday, we have housing starts, building permits, and then Waller at 12, Williams at 12.30. These are both Fed speakers. 
Fed Beige Book on Tuesday as well at 2 p.m. Buy a new high there. Uh, Thursday, big day. We have initial jobless claims at 8.30. Billy Fed Manufacturing Survey. At 8.30 and then 10, we have existing home sales as well as U.S. leading economic indicators. Noon, we have Jerome Powell speaking. Um, so we'll try and watch that. 120, Fed President Goolsby, 130, Fed Vice Chair Barr, 4 o'clock, Fed President Bostic. Yeah, tons of Fed speakers. So, good, could see a lot of volatility this week. And we have earnings. Let's look at their earnings calendar, see what's coming. there in VWAP for SPY. Lira came down some as below VWAP. It's up 108 still. Oh, Snap is rallying. 8% on Snap. Hmm. Buy below VWAP here. cup maybe being formed maybe for low of the day retest yep. does have earnings on the 24th so a little pre earnings run up begun down two and a half. Fourteen and a half dollars on Jimmy. Let's see, AMC's down four and a half. Back to nine.
I'll break through that channel. views but it's rallying get a few puts there close on the low of the day Very small position size in this early in the morning. Receives a rating update from top analysts. Maybe that was the news? I don't know. Amy's down two and a quarter. Snap up nine and a half now. AMC bounced a little bit. It's only down one. Lululemon's being added. What did I see? Being added to the spy, maybe? What was the news on here? Yeah, Lulu's replacing Activision on the S&P 500. So that's pretty bullish. That actually will probably have a continued rally. It very well could, as the index buys in. Uh, liquor, 99%. And on GME. to my buy-in so put a stop break even which might get triggered right away I uh, jumped over my stop or no it did yeah it did <laughs> stupid good fidelity
back up to VWAP. Set up for choppy morning. GNS is up 5%. Setting up for some morning chop. A few calls there. Hi, back to VWAP. I'll close the first one high a day. We just VWAP chop here. Blue lemon, 8%. Up Wide range of consolidation, yep. Still nothing to see there. You just have volatility. It's exciting because it makes big moves, but it's all still stuck in this range. Um, it's either accumulating or distributing. We'll decide which way it's going to go after. Uh, 
based on this chart. Hmm, I really, it's hard to say. Maybe it's bullish, I mean, it's above moving averages. It's a bullish accumulation. And you can definitely trade it intra intra week just in this range, you know, shorting it up here and going long somewhere down here. Spy above VWAP now. Well, I'm sore from this weekend. I don't know what you know it was a good weekend. I think you're sore from being hurt, which I'm not, thankfully. Driven is up three and a half. So high of the day was 434.76. I did have a pretty big gap up, so um, yeah. If we get a big, a big day intraday. It'll probably be to the downside. Just the upside. I mean, you figure a huge day would be another percent from here. Not a huge, but a big day. And the downside, you could have another percent and a half. I can't remember exactly what it was, but the percentage of times that spy moves it was like you can look up the stats on like spy movements and how what the percentage of for the percentage of movement and like after over one and a half percent comes down dramatically, then over three percent is like less than less than five percent of the time or less than three percent. Very very low. Here coming down a bit. 74%. Take a little profit on those calls and put a stop on them. Ah, oh, there's a little flush to be what. Second too late. A stop for the rest. My cost basis on this actually isn't too bad, so I might not get stopped out. It's possible, I think. Choppy morning. Oh, uh, yeah, dang it. <laughs> that just stopped me out, too. Hmm. I wasn't going to, and I'm like, this isn't really. Very good yet. And the VWAP chap.
back into puts there. Breaking view up. This is the scalping I should probably limit myself to. I'm doing very small positions, so. Um, Yeah, I'm out of those. I'm out. Let it do its thing. Ops is up 6.7. It's not a bad bounce for tops. I gotta have my tops. to be found. I didn't follow any barbecue news over the weekend, was there? Anything going on? Ten AM, do we have any data? No, ten thirty Hark Harker starts speaking. Wolf, Macy's, Green, GPS. Looks like retail's up.
I'm melting up slowly. If you get a double top on it up here. To VWAP. I need of that VWAP chop. price action man Ooh. below VWAP, get a low of the day. I'm right back up above VWAP. Building all sorts of liquidity this morning. Things breaking down below VWAP now.
Hawaiian Electric. What's been going on with that? Bulls really want to see us take out 20 morning Lichtenstein. the line in the sand for Boy, I feel like Bitcoin's closer to that though I feel like I'd take the chart over BTC versus gold because I mean we needed this bounce for gold off the 1840 but still we got this pretty well mm -hmm. established downtrend happen it looks like we're pulling back this morning exactly where you'd expect if that downtrend is going to hold downtrend within the randomness of this bigger range i think so yes but there definitely is energy and momentum associated with this move recently from 1820 i think it was back again to just shy of 1950 overnight that's a big move oliver so let's keep an eye on that is, again yeah. with the dollar relatively stable right around this 106 handle but Further acceleration again opens up the door for retest. This could finally be what the bulls need to take out that 2100 level if, and you know, not hopefully doesn't become the case, but if the situation uh, in the Middle East worsens. Sure, okay, all right, at least we know kind of what make, uh, makes gold tick now. Yes. It seems uh, they yes. did catch that kind of uh, risk off safety kind of trade, but Back see if you can get basics, above 2000 bucks. Yeah, exactly, all right, uh, thanks Ben for the look here. A little volatility and some of the uh, outside asset classes, BTC and gold. Let's get back to earnings and let's keep our focus here on the giants. Kevin Green looking at Netflix this week. Uh, all right, this has got to be an important quarter for them, uh, Kevin, because after the big run up off the bottom, chart kind of stalled out in the middle of that long-term range. Yeah, we are seeing a potential uh, back and fill when you're looking at this gap up from May of this year. So it is going to be a very important report. We actually are going to have that on Wednesday after the market close. And we are actually seeing UBS lowering their price target on the stock to $500, and that's down from $525. But they also do maintain their buy rating. They do believe that the company is going to uh, be able to meet the street's expectations when it comes to top line and bottom line growth. And they do expect accelerating uh, operating income for Q3 as well and also hearing some optimistic commentary coming from their executives uh for q4 here now the street is actually expecting uh, revenue spy, we can upload it to the upside six percent on a year-over-year -year basis and when you're looking at the downside growth streets looking for growth at around 11.9 percent on a year-over-year -year basis i think the biggest hurdle right now when it comes to netflix is just being able to really uh detail their strategy moving forward we've seen a lot of growth when it comes to uh some of the other markets as far as the asia pacific market Double top. And in the Middle Eastern markets as well. That has actually been a really surprising area to see a lot of this growth, but now they're going to have to be able to capitalize on that uh, because we are seeing a little bit of a plateau when it comes to North Amer the North American market and trying to increase subscribers, but we know that the North American market in itself There's is a new high profitable. on SPY. So I think that's going to be the biggest case. We're also going to get a little bit of an Retest update the top on of this their channel. when it comes to games. They did roll out a couple of games throughout the quarter. Let's see if that's going to actually increase user engagement, if they're seeing any type of follow through uh, on that end or if it is uh, potentially falling flat on its face I think that's going to be uh, to be seen here so overall yes we are going to have uh, these numbers once they do roll out here hopefully you are able to see uh, roll out of an upside surprise have the stock recover some of AP its uh, gains that we saw at the earlier part of this year uh, and hopefully not filling that gap to the downside that we saw in May okay so this is uh, a big test of some of their new measures they've taken to keep uh, bottom line profit not only intact but trying to grow a little bit right i mean netflix hasn't been like a top line story for a while it's very much become a, a bottom line story a no sharing of we'll accounts, break out of that channel sure get money from everyone and uh as much as possible right i mean it's not like big big growth expectations uh, are necessarily the standard here anymore 
I don't believe so. I mean, they've been able to prove themselves as far as having pricing power over the last year, year and a half. That's what's, what's what has been really driving uh, that top line growth here. But I think the question now, Oliver, is how are they going to be able to kind of implement that same strategy that they're utilizing here in the United States Pretty big and, bounce Canada, actually on spy. Uh, and apply so that for some range of the other markets that they've seen just ugly. rapid growth when it comes to the new users because I don't know if they are respect this channel to either. Or increase those prices even by a little bit. Uh, that I don't like to trade just in the channel on usually. Their, uh, um, on their top line income statement here. And oh, I'm not sure if they yeah, are uh, prepared to uh, maybe increase those prices for those particular markets or if it is about time. Um, and maybe they try to test to see uh, the retention strength that they have with some they're of these consumers. They're currently up 30% now. They're going to sell off. When it comes to uh, the type of content Could that they sold on the pre-market highs. Uh, being able to uh, hit on all measures when they're it comes to thousand, some of these markets. Like, you know, we've seen uh, the Squid Games a couple of years ago, very popular. Uh, but I don't think they thought it was going to be as popular here in, the, in North America as it was. So I think they have a, uh, the ability to continue to grow. Um, I think it's just utilizing that pricing power and some of the other emerging segments that really have been untapped over the last couple of years. Uh, going to be particularly appealing to get some fresh uh, 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 Korean content if uh, the riders here are still on strike. As far as the labor element goes in America, do you expect them to comment on that? Uh, yeah, definitely. They're going to probably have to adjust their guidance because they have uh, moved their guidance to the downside uh, as far as the expenses because of these strikes. But if they do expect to have uh, these strikes uh, resolved here across the board uh, in the next coming uh, in, in the next quarter, then they're going to have to probably adjust their their guidance moving forward. And I'm not sure if the street is going to be really factoring that in at this point in time because it's been a very volatile situation. But the street actually did complement it uh, when it did cut its expenses because of uh, uh, you know these writer strikes so i'm not sure if the opposite's going to also uh, Should have left that other channel downside here would have seen okay. the breakout of that wedge coming right. sooner uh, shares okay hanging in there about 57 going into earnings i'm still rough uh, three weeks so wasn't really ready for it slide down from <coughs> since uh, me. the month of september began so it's really liquor is probably gonna go red and a half almost uh that this thing's pretty much gone straight down but at least uh perhaps that sets up a bid if you look at the 52 week chart, you know, you can take that line and connect the lows. It does still look like it's uptrending and that this would basically be right on that uptrend line. So uh, hopefully uh, for bulls, they uh, show some stability in that uh, er earnings potential that they've really tried to define for themselves with the crackdown on the account sharing and uh, some of the uh, margin metrics. So uh, good report, Kevin, and it should be a fun one uh, coming up here. But uh, not our focus just yet, as we still have a couple days till Netflix. Let's do some training with Alan Nuckman joining us. He's the chief market strategist at bullseyeoption.com, down at the floor to Cebo. All right, so we got fake Bitcoin headlines. We got Fed speak. We got earnings out. Hi there on Spy. Kind of stuff this week. What are you excited about? I'm excited about the price positives from last week. It didn't feel like it, but the stock market was positive. Uh, if you look at the S&P, another positive week and back-to-back. Uh, -back. And for the Nasdaq, it was back-to-back-to-back. -to -back -to -back. So up we've got 1%. three positives weeks. But looking at the S&P, we're getting this close to filling in that gap at 4,400. Mm -hmm. And that's the midpoint of this larger overall range. And if we can get a pop up to that 4,600 top, then we're going to be uh, up, up, and away. Uh, and the S&P is set up very, very nicely here. Okay. So, uh, 46 uh, or 43, uh, uh, 63 this 4, morning on the index. Yeah, futures able to hold that 43.50. I mean, hey, we're pretty close to the year to date highs. What uh, needs to happen for us to get there, Alan? You need bonds to rally big. You need uh, Overstock's up seven and uh, a half. Netflix to crush earnings alongside Tesla. What do you think is the key Sounds here? Like to the there. Key to the sun, the highway. New high on spy. Right, now, I'm a former, I would not classify myself as a big time uh, floor trader in the treasury bonds way back in the day. I dabbled and I learned Full the markets. Closure. But I think you guys, you guys are over focused on this, uh, the 10 year yield. I mean, yeah, yeah, we're at four, whatever, four, seven. If you look at the 30 year chart, we're, this is nowhere for, you know, we, this is, we've been below five for the longest period of time, but five, six, is kind of the average in the big picture. What I'm looking at, obviously, is earnings. Earnings season has started, and the banks. Uh, you can't ignore the banks. What's up, Ali? Sam, aloha, man. Back in March, the it's banks been a good made weekend. billions. We I'm had Wells Fargo, six. Out. Bank of America, seven. Citibank, 
three and JP Morgan 13. I'm not good with numbers, but that's $30 billion of pure profit from four banks. They are printing money. Printing Literally. Money. Now, if you look at the interest rate <laughs> futures, they're telling us there's a 30% chance that we could have one more tiny little uh, hike here. But then if you look at the end of 2024, there's a 96% chance that we're lower than we are here uh, by the end of 2024. So the markets are telling us this is it. This is done. The, yeah, the the 10 year yield is driven by supply and demand. It's not driven by what the Fed does. And we've had a healthy bounce from zero, zero. I can uh, get on board with that uh, logic here that the market uh, does seem to be saying some of those big uh, financial risks are behind us. And uh, also, frankly, right. bonds don't really sell off in an, an environment where there's you know, financial systemic risk. We did see that investors bought bonds on some risk off the last couple of weeks. There were a few days there where even the pressure right. of treasury auctions, inflation, still people bought bonds as a safety trade. And to your point, maybe we finally outgrew our interest rate tech dependency of the last couple of years because 10-year right. yields are going higher today and the NASDAQ's jamming too. So of course, you know my only question, Alan, why the heck are you trading steel and not <laughs> Netflix or Tesla? I'm Peter lynching you today. I <laughs> trade what I know. This is what I know. Look at my hands. I grew up in the iron mines, all right? I know oh, iron ore. Those again. Those and this is soft. Uh, yeah. it, <laughs> those are trader hands. <laughs> this, these are trader hands, right. But I grew up and I understand the dynamics. And Ben was talking about the dollar starting to decline. We saw a $97 move in gold last week. So the metals are starting to show some strength here. And from risk reward, this is what I like. I, I do want to mention a couple things that you didn't talk about the celebration we didn't celebrate last week was the one year low in the s p yep. and also was one year ago I last week I, I the a bit. i'll send it to you it's on twitter the, I, there was a consensus <laughs> there was a consensus a hundred percent consensus there would be a recession I see and like. guess what not even calling a recession doesn't That's mean good. the market has to go down there's still money good of you but anyways True. let's get back into cleveland cliffs okay. cleveland cliffs is nah, 50% off its 2022 top it's 30 percent off its february top so it's about risk reward we're at 15 and a quarter it's been between 10 and 30 for a couple of years so this 15 is an important mid yeah rad, rad file for chapter 11. and uh we've been between 14 and 18 consolidating oh, like my friend ben uh, likes to see between Not 14 on and 18 side. for six months a breakout of that range targets 22 so there's a lot there but the key for me is my leverage buying indicator that there's loading up in the options bullish options in this particular place sustained buying not just you know one time uh unusual option activity i'm seeing sustained option buying over the period of the last couple of weeks and that's very very bullish for me i like that okay so uh, the commodity move to your point, I did, do think you made a good point about the metals in general and the way gold caught that bid. Kind of similar to the way uh, CLF Cleveland Cliffs here bounced off that $14. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're looking for this, I mean, summer highs of 17 and a half would be nice, uh, but obviously right. a, a push even higher than there. But like, do you take some profit if we get to the summer high or are you swinging for the fences on this one? I always have my targets in place, and I have a 50% 50, 50 target on half my positions and 100% target on the second half. Now, that can happen uh, if we get a modest move in the underlying stock. So I'm looking at the April $12 call trade for about four and a quarter. The expiration break even on it's a dollar higher. Now, April has six months of time, and it's only $50 more expensive than January for twice as much time. So it's about math here. Uh, and if we it's break out of this here. range, you know, 18 is the top of the range. We break out of the range. Like I said, 22 is the target. Uh, and this can get this can get moving. So uh, let's see where we go. But again, it's a limited risk play. I have the right to be long from 12, which is below the, the recent range wow, way down near the lows. It's it's, you know, three dollars in the money. Uh, and so it's all about the math here. It's as much the stock as as the strategy, as much the strategy as the stock. So I like to I like to intertwine those together is just about probability and math and being in position for success uh and i'm looking for these metals because the dollar you know 
how much more power can the dollar have if we're not going to raise rates? And it's, sure. it's the markets are telling us we're not. No. We're going to maybe have one more little tiny one, <laughs> but that's over the course of next year, we're going to be cutting. So cutting does not help the dollar strengthen. Okay. That's that's common sense. All right. Again, well, that's where we depart a little bit. I'm not seeing the cuts that you see, but hey, your point about the dollar well taken. We can't get through 106, uh, it seems. Cleveland Cliffs. Yeah, it'll probably come back. $12 probably strike get resumed at some buying. point. So as long as the thing doesn't fall apart, you're in pretty good shape. Right. And, uh, you'd like the, the, the bounce Deep in the money. In the metals. All right. Thank you, Mr. Norman. Always All a right. lively Monday convo. Appreciate it, sir. Looks like you're only 13% now. Yeah, I'm still going red. Train, Cleveland Cliffs to the upside. When we come back, let's go for a ride and a convertible ETF. See the way we did that there? Woof. Woof is up Up on 30, almost an hour into the day. Up at a chop here in the morning. Breaking out to the upside on Spy. You guys are at seven likes so far. I appreciate the seven of you, thank you. Happy Money Monday. Got a good weekend. That liquor chart. Nine and a half on Snap. Yay, they filled. out to next resistance more major not too major but friday's high 436.45 
me. Can't catch a bid. Still down 1.7. MC also down 1.7. Looky, looky. It does for investors. And why we think it's so attractive right now is given the equity interest rates that are higher, this equates to better coupons for investors. We're seeing a ton of new issuance right now. Um, you know, we've looked at convertible space over the last 15 years, and a lot of the convertible uh, products have been losing market share to the corporate bond market. Companies were looking to the corporate sector or corporate bonds for uh, interest there. And so the convertible space is really doing well, and we're seeing a lot of movement into that. And again, this maturity wall that's coming in, we're seeing a lot of folks looking to the convertible oh, space to have to refinance that debt and use the convertibles. And so we think it's a great time to be in the space. Okay, come back to just for a second, the concept of Delta here in the choice of which assets go in. It's options traders, we think about stop Delta on the rest. Off, but uh, maybe a little bit of a, a different perspective here when we're thinking about these bonds. Sure, yeah, if you look at a price track of a convertible bond, a convertible bond can act somewhere. a lot like a fixed income security. It wasn't it a great opportunity. And it can act like it's equity component. I just played it basically on the break of that channel, the upside, which stock is moving up. Isn't my favorite. So if you look at the broad convertible so space, pretty quick today, to take a little profit a there. It's looking pretty heavy into the fixed income make side. Play risk free. And so we really see an opportunity to own the equity sensitive side of the convertible space. We think it's an area in the market that's been missed. We think it's an ETF that will have a, a lot of resonation in the market. I see. So. Delta in this case being like uh, you know you're high there on option, the, the oh, option price moving relative to the underlying price. This is right. uh, uh, where it is on 45. the equity spectrum. Higher delta meaning that it's moving more as an equity kind of linked to asset. That's right. That's right. And again, if you look at the broad convertibles market Take right now, off up there. they look Given very my, fixed income heavy. My entry is on a um, many breakout. Many convertibles trade like bonds Jeez, because that favorite. conversion premium is far out of the money. And so we built this ETF and what we thought was missing in the convertible space was the equity sensitive side. And so this is the this is using the convertibles market for growth. And so historically, what that segment of the market has delivered is a great risk reward profile relative to owning small and mid cap growth stocks and relative to the S&P 500 yeah. equal weight index. So also for existing convertible investors, it really allows you to take a step up in growth right now with your uh, existing convertibles exposure. I see. So uh, as far as the asset allocation goes, this is gonna be, uh, I, I guess, Ideally, it's going to be somewhat more on the equity side. You might take a sliver out of your equity holdings uh, to use this fund, to put it in this fund, but it is going to trade a little bit differently. Like it's not going to be uh, a kind of a pure stock, uh, a, a beta, right? It's going to, I mean, I'm assuming these, right. these trade a little bit uh, differently. That's right. I would view this particular ETF in the equity category. You know, a lot of uh, folks will put convertibles in the fixed income category because they can tend to trade more like a fixed income or the underlying bond. Here, we're looking at the equ equity sensitive segment. And so I would view this as a uh, stock alternative, you know, alternative to small and mid cap growth stocks, an alternative to an equal weight product. Mm. We're also seeing lately more large cap names, uh, more rated names come into the convertible space to take advantage of the better financing rates. And so I think we could see that um, take place over the coming years as well. But yeah, I would put this in the equity alternative category. Still on 1030, sure. one hour in. So a big one in there. Still very, very uh, early. Caribbean, Royal Caribbean. Your likes, guys, appreciate it. You. Uh, we just saw the market hated Rivian's convertible issuance. Um, I don't Ten know and a half now over stock. specific stocks, but I mean, this is kind of the point though, is that you're gonna be generally getting exposure to companies that are uh, uh, conceivably or ostensibly kind of on the up and up. The growth trajectory, of course. Pretty if, hard at uh, resistance it's coming up too. That, it, it could be very bad news for startups. So, um, I mean, is this a, sure. a higher <coughs> risk, higher reward situation? Yeah, you know, typically if a company wants to, you know, issue uh, debt, they, they could use the, cap, the capital markets to do it. They could use the corporate bond markets to do it. If you just do an IPO or raise stocks, you know, that, that tends to uh, perform poorly for the share price. The convertible might sit in between that where, you know, the, the market may not accept that right away, but you're not going to get as big of a hit initially on the stock price. 
because you have the convertible bond nature. And so you still have the bond component. And so, you know, Rivian may have taken a hit, but we don't necessarily expect that to be the case long term as the company continues to grow out of that um, potential oh, dilution above. over time. And so that's that's what we broke we're above yesterday's high, Friday's yeah. high. So uh, it sounds like uh, nice. maybe a, a, my kind of simpleton analysis would be that you want exposure to the growth cohort of companies and uh, you are using the convertible ETFs as kind of a way to distinguish those that you think have a better chance to, to make it basically. I mean, like, it sounds like you believe the convertible wow, it's ETFs is a smarter way for some of these companies to get the money and the capital they need to, to go or do you move go. already? I think so, especially today as rates have risen and we're seeing potentially higher for longer. A lot exactly. of companies are starting to look to the convertible markets for that uh, better financing opportunities. And then on the investor side, you know, they're getting paid to wait from an income perspective. They're poised to rally if the stock price improves and does well. And so from CVRT's perspective, we're really looking at that equity sensitive portion of the curve. It identifies those companies who have proven their ability to grow, who are already growing, and we're locking in an ownership uh, of that inside the ETF. And so we think that um, you know can bode well for folks. All right, uh, fascinating, Matt. Uh, thanks for the explanation. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Have a good one, Matt Kaufman, head of ETFs at Calamos Investments. All right, a convertible ETF. Uh, we'll definitely watch it. Uh, pretty interesting way to narrow down the growth basket. When we come back. The chart master team taking a look at this week's uh, earnings. We do have some important names coming up and a pretty interesting group from groceries to fire planes and some healthcare. opportunity to grab some more calls. Spine's up quite a bit though. But got another couple of resistances to potentially test. One at 437.72. Maybe that pre-market 438.60.
MC down 2.6. Jimmy's coming down here too. Here, Rick sold off. It seems like there's uh, a lot of difficulty uh, with this stock breaking through the last uh, six months of downtrend. Yeah, and we did look like we were breaking through to the upside on Friday and earlier today. The move is getting slapped back down, though. We're, we're back beneath the boundaries of nine and a half on Lululemon. Overstock's ten and a half. Those yearly highs, and you know, it's it's uh, an interesting situation here because. If we had looked at this chart maybe two weeks ago, it would have looked pretty bad here. You know, we, we had this long consolidation period here that lines up with our volume profile point of control near 452, then a big break to the downside once we, once we did kind of crack through the lower end of this range here. Then we had this situation here, big turnaround. Uh, unfortunately, it was because of news of worsening, you know, geopolitical conflict here, but that was uh, the Monday open after we had uh, the, the news of the Israel and Hamas conflict here. So, uh, you know, now we're in an interesting situation because we are not breaking through our resistance, but we have our moving averages starting to trend upward or sideways so that the trend is improving here. It kind of is up in the air, though, whether this is something that's going to stick because we also did not fill our little gap that we formed here near about 445, just above that point. We've also got our purple 252 day exponential moving average just above that point. So uh, 445 to 446 is a serious area to clear uh, for resumption of some kind of uh, uh, major uptrend here. RSI improved, though moved out of the oversold area very sharply with our, our gap up there. Now we're just hanging out above that 50 midline, kind of uh, consolidating a little bit here. But uh, if we were to keep moving to the upside, this area that I mentioned before, that's the first place to watch. Then the old highs right around here, near about 457 would be a second mark to beat. To the downside, right here really caught my eye, the old lows after the gap and roughly in line with our, our 21 day EMA near about 424 or so. Super uh, gappy chart in the last couple months makes it kind of a tough read, but ultimately that's why I think we just kind of fall back on the trend line you've got there until proven otherwise. It seems like investors should be pretty wary of risk to the downside until we really get through 450 bucks and, and beyond and try and turn the thing around. Uh, very interesting. Uh, look here, the short term versus the long term for Lockheed, pretty different. The long term for Albertsons chart actually looks pretty good, uh, Renita, but of course there's still some unknowns here for this company and uh, what form it's going to take uh, going forward. It is, especially with that proposed acquisition of the company by Kroger. Now, adjusted earnings are expected to come in lower year over year at 57 cents a share, and revenues expected to rise year over year to $18.2 billion. But we should look to hear more information on that proposed $24.6 billion acquisition of Albertson. Kroger is expected to do so. Recent reports say that it may face a lawsuit from California's <laughs> attorney general over concerns that it may cause harm to workers and consumers. And they're re still reviewing the proposed sale of 413 stores to see his wholesale grocers. That would seek to address some of the antitrust concerns. Now, Kroger claims in response to that proposed lawsuit, the supposed lawsuit that may come. Kroger claims that only non-unionized retailers would, like Walmart and Amazon, would be able to benefit if the merger is blocked. And they maintain that Kroger's uh, and Albertson's joining would be like good down here a bit. for customers. They say it would bring more union jobs. They're continuing that song as well. Hmm. Well, it seems like uh, so far there's been enough pushback uh, to try and assess the chart, I think, from like the possibility, from the perspective of the possibility the deal doesn't even go through, uh, because it, it's been trading on its own, even with this lingering in the background. Last earnings, which beat expectations, seem to establish some support in the chart around 21 bucks, Rick. Uh, but again, there is this kind of existential unknown, so I don't know how much volatility there can really be, but so far there's been a decent amount, actually.
Yeah, we really gave back a lot of this big move upward here. You know, you had mentioned the last earnings event creating a floor. It also kind of created a ceiling. We had a ceiling in place here just above 22. Since we broke above that point, a steep rise upward into the yearly highs there near 24, just below the $24 mark. Added Since to my then, calls though, there. we formed a shape I've been seeing a lot lately, this lopsided triangle shape. Maybe add some more. Trend, shorter term downtrend and odds with each other. It did play out to the downside this time. We filled the gap that formed right here near 22.55. Looked like we were going below our 63 EMA on Friday here, but we recovered now. Now we're kind of in between our 21 and 63 day EMAs. The 21 day EMA is starting to roll over to the downside. 63 days still trending up. So we've got some conflict there. Uh, it depends on what way you want to look at it, but the if you couple in the RSI rolling over to the bearish side here, these could be signs of early potential trend change, especially because we broke through our uptrend line here. So if we were to keep going to the downside, 63 day EMA is the line in the sand for starters. Then 2218 just below that here based on those old highs to the upside. We've got our 21 day EMA to crack near 2281 and then the old highs right here near uh, just above 23. Okay, so pretty good uh, generally, but short term a little bit of a fade it's kind of like the Lockheed chart flipped upside down mm -hmm. short yep. term on Lockheed looking better than the long term short term here looking a little bit worse than the long term all right last one J&J a &J. little profit uh, we talked this morning about how uh, Pfizer's COVID sales declining have been a factor in that stocks under performance Renita J&J mm -hmm. &J has got a whole other business attached to it but uh, also <laughs> Uh, even for that too now kind of some questions about uh, what it's going to look like going forward you're right because this will be the first earnings report after spinning off that consumer health business yep. into Kenview it started mm -hmm. trading on the NYSE on May 4th and with that change J, &J is now focusing on pharmaceuticals and med tech and so analysts are expecting adjusted earnings to come in at two dollars and fifty two cents a share revenue twenty one billion dollars they're also expecting the pharmaceutical segment or J&J &J, I should say is expecting their pharmaceutical segment to have higher sales from some new key drugs so we'll look to hear from that and also J&J &J expects the med tech segment to continue to see recovery back in if we break this channel worldwide procedure volume since elective surgeries have come back into the fold after a long wait after whole COVID this is gonna be really interesting uh, chart going forward because without the consumer business to kind of act as a ballast to the uh, drug pipeline now it might just have a little bit more volatility when it's very drug very tech focused mm -hmm. pretty choppy chart Rick is there anything we can make uh, out of this uh, at the moment well, the trend is down, you know, overall, I would say, because we had an uptrend line going across the lows here in blue, broke to the downside. We also broke through a more steep trend line going down off these, these recent highs here. But now we've got a more shallow downtrend in place still, starting with the post gap open. So moving averages all trending down, price below all three of them. Uh, not looking too good. We failed at cracking above our, our okay, yellow 21 back up. EMA, which was in conflict channel. with our more Bulls, shallow trend line here. More so high the day. Support at 154, our old lows. RSI trending upward here, but still bearish here. So, uh, you know, if we were to look toward the upside, convenient confluence right there near 161 based on our uptrend line and our 63-day EMA. But the real point to beat 166. Look how many times we topped out around this area and bottomed out there once too. That mm -hmm. would be a key price level to take out. Okay, uh, we're pretty far away from it right now. So pressure on J&J &J to prove that uh, their new streamlined business model is going to be what investors want. All right, nice uh, work for the earnings prep here team. Nita Young and Rick Ducat. Thanks guys. Let's bring in Jenny Horner. Oh, Let's uh, talk about us. a big move in Lulu shares. It's a bullish day here in the market, and Lulu kind of leading the charge, Jenny. 52 week high. 52 week high, and the best and we're now in the NASDAQ on reports that it's going to be joining the SP 500 effective on Wednesday, oh replacing Activision Blizzard. Oh I have to say, though, I, I don't think I realized that it wasn't yet in the SP 500 because, as far as criteria goes, when you look at the SP 500, it's obviously the 500 largest companies, but there also has to be consistent profitability, consistent trading volume with a market cap of at least 14 and a half billion mind you through Friday's close Lulu market cap was around 50 billion.
billion. So they fit down. all the criteria quite well. The stock has risen 200% in the last three years alone. It has very consistent compound annual growth rates that are relatively healthy. It's also been relatively resilient on the year in light of some of the difficulties that have faced so many of these apparel and athletic retailers. But because there are certain criteria for companies to join the S&P 500, there is the common cycle for stocks to come in and to come out. And interesting enough, actually, in recent years, since about the late 1970s, companies that were taking an average time in the index of around 35 years, that's increased. We see mm. now more of a cycle, stock cycling through relatively quicker just compared to historical levels. The average tenure now is close to 20 years, which does find that companies are just you know moving more, more rapidly than they once were, say, 40 years ago, 50 oh. years ago at this point, which I thought was interesting. Stocks often do see historically a bump when they join the S&P 500 due to that additional investor coverage as well as just additional institutional funds. So definitely seen as a, a positive for Lululemon. And again, frankly, Oliver, I don't know why they weren't in it to begin with. I do know that I am somewhat biased. I do love Lululemon's products, but all in all, they are consistently profitable and have a market cap that's over three times the size of the, you know, what right now we're seeing what is the minimum to get into the index. Yeah, it seems like maybe a little overdue here. Break out to 52 week highs, not the record, but as good of a sign that it could fight for a new record as any. So uh, thanks for the update, Jenny. Big rally here and uh, seemingly the implications of joining the S&P means that Lulu has lasting power. Uh, I'm wearing some Lulu and it ain't my suit. Wait, Jenny uh, Horn likes Lululemon. <laughs> Got it. Write that down. Make a note. Got it. I think Joe Mazzola does too. Uh, Director of Trading and Education, Charles Schwab. Uh, at, you know, what a segue. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yep. You're, you're an Under yeah, Armour guy. We've already yeah. established that, uh, Kevin. I have I kind of go in in between, back and forth. Lulu's up big. Market's up big. What stands out to you this morning, Joe? We got a pretty nice rip going here. Yeah, it's interesting. Yields are up too. So, yep. uh, you know, I think there was a lot of uh, question about uh, you know global conflicts over the weekend. Would would anything uh, emerge that um, you know could lead to more kind of you know destruction? In the, in the Gaza Strip, and then also kind of de destruction for the markets. I think we got through the weekend okay, and the markets took a little bump off of that, uh, a little bit of a bid. You know, this this is a big week for earnings, guys. I mean, 10% of the S&P 500 is kicking off this week. Um, you know, you got a market trading at about 18 times on a forward PE. So, you know, it, the rubber's got to meet the road a little bit to justify that. Uh, but to this point, you know, 6% of the S&P 500 is reported. About 84% have beat on the uh, bottom line, so on the earnings, and then about 66% uh, have beat on the top line. So, so far, so good. Yields up, stocks up. Seems like market bulls here are saying, bring it for earnings, Kevin. Mm -hmm. I think this is a geopolitical relief rally here okay. that we're seeing. I think the, uh, you know, think about this. Let's put out the scenario. There was the potential, the probability of a disastrous event over the weekend right? It looks like via uh, diplomacy, some of that is loosening up. Still high probability for some event, but the, you know, 600,000 people have evacuated uh, Gaza City. That's really good news for uh, overall the, the, hor the horrific event that could be coming. I think the market's taken some relief in that. Um, the fact that nothing happened when a market was bracing for it over the weekend, you saw it in the risk off assets on Friday. I think there's a bit of a relief rally there. It still feels to me like the market is bracing though for something on the horizon. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, whether it's uh, geopolitics or, or something else, the VIX has been between 16 and 20 like every other day, yeah. which is a pretty decent little trading range for VIX that shows, I think, that there's some Might be a double top there on SPY. Am I stopping? The source. Uh, and of course, earnings Scaled up to a pretty large position. That's, uh, that's the highlight here. I, you know, because it's not an inflation leak, we just we'll had that. Mm -hmm. Because all the Fed speakers seem to be very much on the same page right now. I don't know, it kind of seems to me like a decent setup here, Joe, because... Um, the earnings for uh, earnings in general, just what they do is they generally beat. They don't really miss. Mm -hmm. Analysts do a good job kind of lowballing, and so do the companies. So, so then what's kind of like the wild card, if not geopolitics, then? I mean, Powell's not going to surprise us with any new language, is he? 
I would doubt that. And, and remember, this is the last week before they go uh, kind of silent uh, before the November 1st decision on uh, Fed rate policy, which is, uh, you know, markets pricing in about, um, what, a 6 or 7% chance yeah, of a it's raise. Done. So basically, it's not going to happen, not, right? Yeah, it's done, right. December, it's already moved down to, you know, 25%. So the likelihood of that happening is kind of slim as well, too. Um, it, but look, guys, this is a trader's market. I think that's exactly what this market is right now. It's you know 4,200 on the low end on the S and P and 4,500 on the top end, and you kind of trade it in between. And not only does it you know happen in equities, it's happening in bonds too. You know, 4.8 percent on the 10 year, that might be the top end, and 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 4.5 percent uh, might be the low end. So you're just seeing this choppiness kind of around a, a mean as as we're kind of moving changes. Like I said, it's great for active investors and traders. It's a great opportunity. That's kind of, I do kind of like that point, Kevin, because a lot of this is about holding levels rather than returning to highs so far. I mean, the S&P got back to 4,400, but as soon as it tried to get above it last week, smack down. NASDAQ able to hold the summer low, but still below the summer high. And I feel like that's an important distinction that requires some new event to kind of light a spark if we're going to get back to actual highs. Yeah, the new event is the new event is large cap tech exactly. earnings yeah. is going to be it's the Tesla, next drive. basically, Ex right? Well, in a way, it's Tesla, sure, but it's also Meta, it's also Amazon and Google, and I think it's that magnificent seven. But it's interesting, Oliver. Bonds, bonds uh, lower, gold lower, VIX lower the exact opposite of Friday's trade. Mm -hmm. And even though yields are higher, stocks still like it. That tells me geopolitical risk, you know, lightning slightly. You think the weekend element, kind of the, the factor there with I, Friday's fade? I thought everyone was expecting some type of event over the weekend that didn't happen. And now, okay. now if you're stuck long, if you're stuck short, you're chasing. Sure, all right, uh, Trader's Market. Thanks, John Mazzola, Kevin Hanks. That's it for us here on Morning Trade Live. Thank you for joining Trading 360 with Caroline Woods is up next.
I got, yeah, I got stopped out from the rest of those calls. Might be starting to round. Roll over up here. We'll see, maybe one last, one last little push. Jamie flushing through the lows. Broke the lows. Oh, I broke multi-year lows. There it is, 1430. Down 4%. There's SPY, new high. Thought about it, but I wait for wait for the reversal. <coughs> this liquidity being belt was Had exposure from here still, but then added heavy to it, so I brought my average up. So my stop pulled out all of them, unfortunately. It's okay, I think we might be starting to roll over up here. There's a test of... Is that Thursday's high? Thursday and Wednesday? Close to it? Calls of Macy's, nice cuts. Blackberry calls. Just bounce straight, huh? Yeah, I think it got pretty wrecked. Well, <clears throat> they're splitting, they're like spinning off or whatever. I think that's probably why. Starting to roll over a bit. It's 11 o'clock, 30 minutes to EU close. Probably start entering some puts on the break of this channel. revenue to come in two billion lower than had been expected so pretty significant guidance cut but moderna did respond saying they're still comfortable with the six to eight billion dollars in their fiscal covid vaccine revenue that they see as far as sales go saying that following this announcement they actually maintained their statement and they said that they are right now anticipating revenues to remain rocky but still relatively consistent so it's amazing to me that when we're seeing moderna down because they're actually still staying on the same course they had previously laid out, whereas Pfizer now updating investors. I will say the street does typically like answers, so the fact that we now have at least some reduced expectations could be seen as a positive, but it's very interesting to me that the name this, this name is hang, hanging on to its gains so well today, Caroline, on what was some pretty, again, negative news. That's right. As we can see, Moderna share is down about 5.6%. Pfizer, though, up about 5.3%. Mm -hmm. Both posting pretty steep year-to-date losses. Pfizer down about 34% year-to-date, whereas Moderna's down almost 50% year-to-date. We'll leave it there. Jenny Horan, Markets Correspondent, thanks so much. Thanks, Caroline.
Let's get some news or some insights on the news that's shaping the markets. And for that, we welcome in Kevin Gordon, senior investment strategist at Charles Schwab. He joins me at the desk. Kevin, so good to have you here. Hi, Thanks Carly. for well, kicking off the week. It's been a while. Good yeah, to see you. It has. Yeah. Um, so it's stocks in rally mode this morning, yeah. seeing lots of green. Uh, Jimmy flush and more, 5% uh, down. I mean, yeah, it's a big, big break there. Limited. Well, limited if you don't get that, that little head and shoulders and rejecting that so resistance by the move this morning a lot ten dollars here we go underperformed um, <clears throat> not just over the past couple of months but really year to date and actually even you know since last year since the market's low last year so small caps MC down 2.6 portion um, you know, up 11 now down the cap spectrum anything and more cyclically oriented is what's leading today so if that's just a head fake you know we need a little bit more time to sort of see if that's the case. But if you start to see breadth improve under the surface, which it really hasn't over the past couple of months, then I think you could probably have stronger legs into the end of the year. But if it doesn't, um, then you're going to have more of a thin rally like we had, you know, at many points earlier in the year. And I think that would be sort of a negative divergence where you start to see some more material breakdown under the surface. I'd be more on watch for that than I would some of the headline indexes and what they're showing. But given the fundamentals, because this market certainly has a fair share of headwinds right now, yeah. can you make the case that breath should improve? You can. I mean, I think you have to, certainly for earnings season, I mean, I think it's coming at a good time where you have had a deterioration in breadth since July, since the most recent peak in July. Um, and if you start to see, particularly with what we're most focused on, a rebound in not as much earnings growth itself, but actually sales growth. Because mm -hmm. revenue has been, I think, the more of the pain point for a lot of firms. You've had basically no revenue growth in the second quarter. Um, you're expected to almost hover in similar territory as of now for the third quarter. And then in inflation adjusted terms, you're actually still down. So you really need to see this, that start to turn because if you have revenue growth that's declining but you have earnings growth that's picking up, that means earnings are sort of growing for the wrong reasons with right. aggressive cost cutting being the case. So um, you need to see that dynamic, I think, clear itself. And you know it's probably not going to get solved in one quarter, but if you get a more solid trajectory in terms of earnings Let's estimates throughout the quarter, you start to see more of a stabilization in things like ISM manufacturing, some of the regional PMIs, some of the housing data, which we get later this week, mm -hmm. then I think you probably build more of the fundamental case, but you're not quite there yet. Well, let's talk about your expectations for earnings season. Yeah. We're still in the early days. So far, so good, although yeah. some may argue it's just that expectations have been lowered so much. Earnings season really picks up steam this week yeah. oh, with yeah. some big names like Tesla and Netflix. Uh, what are you expecting? Um, well, I think overall the trajectory is probably correct in terms of what analysts are expecting in terms of that hook pattern you keep seeing first quarter and second quarter. That was the case. But I think um, in, in, maybe in terms of bringing it back to realistic expectations and what is to be expected now that you're you know, almost two years into the Fed tightening cycle, this is typically the time you start to see more hits to the labor market. A lot of the headwinds for labor haven't cleared in our opinion. That doesn't mean that earnings need to go back down and you need to go back into an earnings bear market. But flat to no earnings growth is very different than double digit earnings growth when right. you've gone back into a durable cyclical recovery. So I think that's probably what needs to be explored more. And back to the point on revenue growth, that's pro that, that was the focus in our opinion in second quarter because you had seen basically no reward from the market for even names that were beating earnings estimates and earnings expectations. Um, so if that happens again, which I would argue Friday was a little bit of um, sort of a precursor to that because for all the excitement about some of the big beats for bank earnings, the bank index closed lower. Mm -hmm. um, it gapped mm -hmm. higher in the initially in the day and then it wiped out all of the gains. So if that excitement continues to fade and you start to see more of that pattern, then I would probably um, you know, take a little bit more caution and, and look for certainly names that are up in quality across the spectrum, but especially with the interest, interest rate environment that we're in right now, you have to be much more focused on quality parts of the market. Okay, and it seems like this market is largely shrugging off some of the geopolitical risk that we're, we're facing, but as those risks globally appear to really mount, yeah. where should investors be seeking safety, or is that the right strategy? You mentioned quality, but yeah. are there safe plays out there amidst... Of, well, you know, the, the yeah, there's headwinds. a couple of ways. I think for safety in the equity market, the, the quality approach, not necessarily from a, from a sector standpoint, because actually since the July peak, you know, we've been in this downtrend. Um, if you were to go to the traditional defensives, staples, utilities, those are the two worst performing sectors right. since July. And they've got their own set of sets of issues. But I think for, you know, especially a sector like utilities, something that's heavily indebted, doesn't have a really strong interest coverage ratio, really gets hit by higher interest expense. 
um, and that build up in debt over time. So when you combine that and the fact that yields have gone up, not only are they suffering from that, but also just the sort of competitive nature of yields across the board, across the curve. Um, so you can play defense in the equity market by staying up in quality, but you can also play defense in the bond market from an income hedge perspective. Um, we think that works really well. Our chief fixed income strategist, Kathy Jones, has been arguing for this for a long time this year, saying that you know if you're wanting to extend duration, now is probably the time. Um, so there are a couple of ways to do it, especially in the face of a conflict, um, you know, not only two wars now going on, but a conflict that we really have no insight into as to where it goes. Um, and you know, obviously the, the channel to watch is oil prices and seeing what spikes there, but you probably don't get a material shift um, unless you start to get more involvement or more clarity on what Iran's position is from here. All right, so there's geopolitics, there's earnings, yes. there's the higher for longer narrative, yeah. or at least high for longer narrative. There's a lot. <laughs> what is the biggest challenge for the market right now? Um, Oh gosh, I would probably say all of the above is the catch-all, right? The easy answer. <laughs> I didn't but give no, you that as an option. <laughs> I, I think I think that uh, geopolitics aside, because that's always kind mm -hmm. of a looming issue. Probably the interest environment, because I think you know now that we're getting a couple of years after this Fed tightening cycle, some parts of inflation are still taking longer to get back down. The fact that the wage story still hasn't been solved in terms of what the Fed has been comfortable with from a wage growth standpoint. Um, Looking for some puts on the break of this channel here. And what are we going into? in terms of a secular period. First is it longer rates, or is it rates for longer? Position. Or are we gonna go back into and slip back into that lower growth, slower for longer, that we, we got so used to? Our sense is probably not. You probably have more of a volatile inflation and economic a nice backdrop trend here, in front of us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, too soon to tell, so I think just right now, embrace the normal for what it is. Um, the fact that rates have risen, the fact that volatility is back in multiple pockets of the market, and actually being driven by something like currency and bond volatility, not, not as much equity volatility this All year. Right. All right, we yeah. have to leave it there. Always appreciate your you. insights. We'll keep an eye on Would take calls up from the break of this uh, side, but today, so we'll see I think uh, we're continue. starting to see it roll over a bit. Thanks so much. It's Kevin well, Gordon, Charles Schwab. First well, reward up here is not as great. 360. Next up, it's time for the big three. Three stocks, three charts, three trades. Ben Lichtenstein will go through the technicals. And Jessica Inskip from Options Play will take us through the trades for CrowdStrike, Amazon, and CBS Health. That's next on Trading 360 on Schwab Network. A little Network. starter we'll position right there. Easy does it. Easy now, big fella. It take time. AMC down 3.6. Maybe down 4.8. Next support, maybe 12.5.
you nice doing just flat <clears throat> put that up like seven percent this morning Blackberries up six Top is up five. Uh oh. Top and tops both up. Tops actually looks like a nice solid bounce. Take a little profit there. investment thesis whenever I'm placing a trade even or from the investing perspective. And a lot of that has to do with the AI revolution and how something will translate into that and help with some of the broader macro headwinds. So looking at CrowdStrike, for example, because of the geopolitical issues, that's one piece of it. But in addition to that, as we have these hearings on AI, those closed doors ones that we've been, been seeing, 
this is a solution and cybersecurity that's going to start becoming a bigger issue so that high valuation <coughs> price earnings it's really where i believe that the e in the equation isn't properly evaluated and then we'll see an increase in implied volatility which translates over to why you want to go long an option not short because it can also increase in value even if the stock stays the same if that implied volatility spikes up so that's the the choice of the trade but also why choosing CrowdStrike altogether there's more opportunity okay. for revenue yeah. All right, I appreciate the thought process behind it. So let's move on to your next trade, which is Amazon, also having a pretty impressive year. Spice them down a little bit. Strike levels, but up, call it almost 60% year to date. Look to get back in this and puts maybe on a retest of the shoulder up here, Tell top of the channel. Yeah, so this first piqued my interest really with artificial this could just, intelligence. This still could be bulls build liquidity, honestly. But also have some large language not, models that they're using and working with, and that access to data certainly makes it a, a, an interesting perspective from an AI perspective. Now, their logistics, they've also been doing some regionalized logistics, which has helped with their prime delivery, and they have have cross-product penetration as far as prime video over to prime Prime uh, on the shopping side, on the e-commerce side. Now, thinking about what we hear with Target and Walmart and how there's this big theft issue, that isn't really prevalent with Amazon because of the way that their storefronts are. It's up's pretty high. E so they're not susceptible, as susceptible certainly as some, as those other big players. And their Prime Days have been doing really, really well. So I think it, it's interesting, and I, I believe that will translate positively over into earnings. However, the trade that I'm setting up is more of a long-term play because of volatility that is, is happening around these type of securities i'm looking to sell a december 1st 131 put that's collecting a premium about earlier today the the midpoint was 620 and that allows me to one i achieve max gain if this is above my strike price so i, I sold an at the money one so as long as amazon stays where it is or moves slightly higher but if the trade were to move adversely i'd still keep that six dollars and 20 cents per share which allows me to essentially purchase amazon at a discount and add it to my longer term portfolio Okay, Ben, what do you see in the chart for Amazon? Caroline, this one's telling a little bit of a different story than what we just looked at in terms of crowd. We've got a trend lower here on the 30-minute candle chart. We've got migration of value to the downside, and this is pro playing out over a couple different time frames. Let's begin first <coughs> and foremost with the 30-minute candle. And as I just identify these areas of consolidation that have formed at lower and lower levels, you're going to see exactly what I'm talking about in terms of uh, some of the price activity we're seeing here. Taking a look at area 140, 138, and currently balancing around 129. So you've got this upper extreme here around 134. Uh, below 129 opens up a door for a retest of 123, and I'm giving the benefit of the doubt to the bears in this instance because of the fact that, well, here you can see that we had been trending higher in a very well-defined staircase type pattern, but look what happened here as we were Balancing around 138, talking about into the middle of uh, August, beginning of September, the Bulls wanted to see a breakout. We got that to the upside, 146. They wanted to see follow through a new area. You closed in nine minutes. Level. We didn't get that. Not only didn't we get that, but we've rolled over back down below 131. I think that was taking out a key area that we established on the way up. So at the very least, we've lost that momentum <coughs> to the upside. Could be in a wider range at this area here. But until we break out above 146, that bull trend that working assumption that we had been establishing areas of value and in a bull trend has been invalidated. Closed. Taking a look here, I wanted to show Closed you what's going on. There. Speaking of, you can see how we've weakened a bit here on this longer term. That recent top yep. we just talked about, again, that 146 level break. coincided with the highs that we saw back in, uh, well, June, July of last year. And again, also off. held that key area 150 in terms of this trend that we've seen lower here in the weekly. So I see a bit of a bearish pattern playing out here. All right. And Jessica, you mentioned Amazon doesn't have to deal with theft, but CVS Health certainly does. Uh, talk to us about your final trade, CVS. They certainly do. So this one, I, I pulled a screen with some very, very specific criteria. Um, and this actually piqued my interest in addition to with a news headline that they released after the market close on Friday. So they did an update to their, their Medicare Advantage Part D star ratings, which is just a, a, some quality bonus payments that they can get. And that would help offset any losses that they have had. So that, that 
certainly plays well when I, I pulled the screen just to, to validate that thought process from seeing that headline. And additionally, Rite Aid filed for bankruptcy, which would be good for CBS gathering some more market share. But as far as the fundamentals are concerned, they have an average price target of about 90.16. That is 26% upside from here. Their forward PE for 12 months is 8.3 times next year's earnings. So that is very cheap from a valuation perspective. So it looks to me, even from a technical perspective, and I, I'm looking at this on a weekly chart, and I'm sorry I didn't send that over, Ben, but it, it looks to me that it's forming a base from the analyst price targets and evaluation perspective, it has a lot of room for upside. And the news headlines are certainly helping with that. That could translate positively into earnings. All right. So, Ben, CVS up almost 2% today, down more than 20% year to date. Take us through the technicals for CVS. Yeah, you know, as I looked at uh, CVS, I, I think it's kind of saw sort of this mix of the two names that we just uh, uh, broke down. Taking a look first and foremost, the recent momentum has been to the upside, kind of balancing around 71 and holding above that right now. So I think that's somewhat bullish. As you can see, the breakout above 66 from a few weeks ago and how we've managed to accept this new upper level. The what concerns <coughs> me is we recently broke above and tried to break out uh, above 75, almost <coughs> identical in terms of what we just looked at a minute ago with that failed attempt to break out and how we had come back off. Uh, um, but taking a look here, you can see a bit of a bearish pattern that's been playing out here with this longer term going back to February. And we're looking at four hour candle charts here. We were up around 90, uh, 91. You can see most of the conviction occurred to the downside before we started to balance out and we've gone sideways. We've got a pretty well defined upper extremes here now established. And this is right around that, what was at the $78 level. So again, as long as we hold above 71, potential to retest that level, but still random within this range and limited in terms of conviction. I did take a look at the weekly chart, as Jessica mentioned, that bottoming pattern form. And interestingly enough, that would coincide with a key area over here that we established this range that we were in, we'll call it 2019 into 2020, before the big move up we saw. Five uh, minutes, you close, pandemic, market's getting close. But you can also see how we've really lost that momentum to the upside, and so just maybe back into this comfortable zone. I wanted to show you where we were relative to the 50, the 200-day moving average, because I think this sort of feeds into a bit more of a bearish pattern here as well, holding below the 200 that longer dated. RSI is kind of limited. It hasn't really shown a lot of enthusiasm to the upside. So again, there I guess there's two different ways to approach this, maybe something for both sides, depending on what you're looking for in this one. All right, we'll leave it there. Ben Lichtenstein, Jessica Inskip of Options Play. Thank you both so much for being here. Coming up next, we're going to continue to spotlight healthcare and what investors should take away from Rite Aid's Chapter 11 filing and also a warning for Walgreens. Stay with us. We'll be back after this quick break. Trading the trending names every Bounced back up to view up there. Pulled down Jimmy Low, uh, I don't know. Ten bucks. Depends on your time frame.
this week. Hello, this week. Maybe 10 bucks. <laughs> uh, depends on how the market does, I guess. Also, how earnings go. A lot of Fed speakers. Uh, it's been outpacing to the downside, though, pretty well. So, 12 and a half, maybe. I don't know if I can do that this week. But it, it could, actually. Just had the set and shoulders and break of the low after consolidating here for like 10 days. So, volume today is a little, little bigger, too. Yeah, maybe 12 and a half. You look at uh, E Trade's chart because Weeble actually has it wrong. A break on the upside of this. I think I'm gonna get back into calls. Mm hmm. Break of head and shoulders. Bullish. There's a channel break. Bulls are building liquidity. You close right there on the dot. Hit the top of the channel just perfectly. Here's a channel break, potentially for some puts. Be patient. Chopped around this range for an hour now. Once we know the move, it should be pretty obvious. It should be large enough to make it worth a while. Make that nice right shoulder there, though. Perfectly. Perfect little head and shoulders up there if this plays out. Trading account, dailies.
Give me above you up now. Point eight. <coughs> AMC down four point rejecting this the top of this channel you've got a nice head and shoulders there it breaks there nice, nice long play to tie the day or even past that there and I got him on the trading account Let's see if we can break this low over here. Look for uh, first profits at fifty WAP. Thanks so much. Great. Really appreciate those picks. Coming up next, it's time for the disruptor as George Sillis walks us through a potential trade for Arista Networks after it was added to Evercore ISI's tax. I'd like to see a breakdown out of this channel too.
couple off. What that line's from, that's a high from somewhere. profit on this channel. October? I don't know, Mr. Invest. Off there in case you don't quite make it to be WAP.
You're just gonna call? Yeah, it might be. This could be bulls build liquidity. Still could. Case. on VWAP. Forgot about my other put. I was supposed to close out a VWAP. Dang it. <laughs> On my trading account. the rest of those puts. I'm closing the put on the trading account. <sighs> I just forgot about it. Well, up like 25%. There's only one contract though. No, that account's done for the day. Dumb is all the trading I've done today is still less than half of the profits I gave away at the end of Friday. Sucks about being up and then giving it back. Never want to do that. Oh, 
on the day it's like oh it's not much I just get back a bit but then you start to think oh wait on another day this would be a, this would be a whole good day of gains <laughs> Very early, ten minutes to noon. Your hit, Stellantis, is performing much better than the other two in terms of uh, year-to-date performance, but uh, we haven't seen huge declines from uh, from these strikes. And I guess, do you think that there's one that's poised to perform better than the others? I think in the near term, the auto industry's inventories appear to be healthy enough to sustain a a, a strike. And the car company's balance sheets are also pretty well positioned here. They're, they're healthy enough to withstand these strikes. And I think that provided that the stoppage isn't prolonged, if, this, if the UAW and Big Three fail to reach a deal soon, the strike expands to more workers and more plants. The impact on the supply chain could be extensive and potentially devastating. And in that case, I think you would see the stock prices uh, reacting accordingly. All right. David, would you rather be a buyer of the big three at a, maybe a value right now or a Tesla? <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a tough one. Um, I, I think if you believe um, in being a long-term investor, it's probably a, a good time to look at GM and Ford, provided you think that they'll uh, come out with a contract that uh, can let both sides win. But that's a big if right now. They're, they're highly speculative names. The problem with Tesla, of course, it's also highly speculative, but gaining scale, and you're subject to the immense key man risk uh, in Elon Musk and his behavior. Andrew, we're almost out of time, but what about you? Tesla or the big three? Oh, gosh. Um, I guess I'll go a different direction. I think for this earnings season, I would be more positive on select product cycles. So uh, maybe one could take a look at a company like Mobileye that develops and deploys advanced driver assistance. Oh, no, you can't answer that. Systems. All right, we'll leave it, it was there. very Andrew clear. Wong, Runny Mead Capital Management, David Whiston, Morningstar, thank you both so much for your insights. That's going to do it for Trading 360. I'm Caroline Woods. <clears throat> Hope Elise. We'll be back with you at 2 p.m. Eastern for the watch list, but stay tuned because Fast Market is next. Have a good one. You could think.
I'll be looking for calls again on a break of this channel up here. Let's this break here. I like that as much though. this month into their earnings and Bank of America which is down about 18% in 2023 and also reports quarterly results tomorrow morning and like Bolio will break down consumer sentiment data on Target which has bounced off a three and a half year lows over the last week on the back of an upgrade that we saw last week now two and a half hours into the trading day stocks are sharply higher and bonds are dumping amid dip diplomatic efforts to prevent the Isra Israel Hamas war from expanding into a regional conflict. The developments in the Middle East continue to influence the direction of U.S. Treasury rates, which are higher as traders reverse their risk off sentiment from Friday when they were buying bonds and buying gold, uh, and the dollar is also lower. Now, let's take a look at the four major indices, which are off a session highs, but still solidly in the green. We've got all 11 of the S&P 500 sectors in the green. The S&P 500, up just over a percent, the Dow Jones Industrial Average up about 350 points, NASDAQ 100 uh, up nearly 1%, and the Russell 2000 bouncing back from that drawdown that we saw last week up 1.4%. <coughs> Tell me break down this market action. Let's bring in my co-host, that's Kevin Hinks. Kevin, uh, a little uh, breath of relief, I think, uh, after Friday's session where it seemed like everybody's getting ready maybe for a ground attack into uh, Gaza from Israeli troops, but that didn't pan out. They're giving people more time to get out, but they haven't wavered from that sentiment. Didn't pan out yet, Yeah, but you're right. There's relief uh, that f what the market was bracing for was some weekend event, Yeah, and that didn't happen, or the fact that they're delaying it, giving 600,000 people a chance to get out of uh, the, the, the Gaza Strip area, that's pretty positive news in terms of potential civilian deaths. This isn't over though. Right. It's not even, I mean, so there's still risk out there, but I think maybe the, some of the risk off that traded on Friday, I mean, the numbers were in, in VIX and gold and bonds were big moves on the upside. So there was hyper sensitivity to risk on Friday afternoon. Some of that has dissipated, Tom. But as you know, we are th th we are waiting on headlines, and any headline at any moment could change the direction of this market. So everyone should still be very agile and nimble in these markets because they are move. I mean, this is a pretty big move for everything going on in the world, though. Yeah, uh, and I think reversing some of those uh, those moves in the asset classes that we talked about on Friday, yeah. where we're getting a little pullback in gold getting a little pullback in crude oil. That's helping uh, stabilize things a little bit. But you're right, definitely not out of the woods. One of the big stories, uh, though, today coming out was uh, on Apple. Uh, let's uh, bring in Jenny Horn, Marcus Correspondent, here to and break I. down this story. Uh, Jenny, it seems like uh, Apple iPhone 15 sales aren't going to be as robust as they thought in China. But, Jenny, my thought process was that uh, Huawei came out with their phone, their Mate 60, before Apple did, is that the reason you're starting to see maybe uh, some dissipating, uh, you know, optimism uh, from sales in China? I think that's definitely contributing, Tom. And I will say it's a four and a half percent drop over last <coughs> year's figures for the first 17 days of the the sale. So it's, it's still relatively preliminary. And it's not like it's a 40 percent drop that we're seeing on a year over year basis. It's four and a half. So all things considered, it is signaling some weakness. But I think you make a really good point. We have also competition that's really facing the iPhone overseas. Jeffrey's analysts did say that these lower sales numbers 
numbers after this Huawei release are largely driven by just that successful launch, like you said, of the Mate 60 Pro. The analysts did say that Apple has seen a sharp double-digit double decline in its iPhone 15 sales compared to previous models, again, specifically, though, in China. Though the poor performance has come at a time when the smartphone market is facing relatively some of its worst demand in nearly a decade, and Apple is also facing criticism over the overheating models. I think take that with a grain of salt. I cannot say this enough, but I have the model that is accused of overheating. It never once have noticed this myself. But despite some of these challenges, actually CounterPoint research did point out that iPhone 15 still saw a double digit percentage increase over 2022 in the first nine days of sales. So it seems like to me at this point, it depends what time frame you're looking at. Feels like everyone is so quick to want to assume a narrative. But we are still in such preliminary parts of, of these sales for the iPhone 15. Now, additionally, we also got some really interesting reports from Barron's that said that in 2015, while your iPhone may still say it's not made in the US, it could feature these chips that are being manufactured in Arizona from Taiwan Semiconductor. Taiwan is plowing about $40 billion into the project, aiming at cranking out around 600,000 wafers a year to then again power these iPhones. Now, Apple's CEO Tim Cook did say that at a tool-in ceremony last year, Apple would be proud to be their biggest customer. So we could see some developments there as that Arizona plant has faced delays now for Taiwan Semiconductor, but this is obviously a win. Apple shares are lower though today, and I just think it's again, the fact that people want to assume a narrative so quickly and they want to really stick to their guns. 17 days we're seeing a dip in China, nine days we're seeing growth. It just really depends on where, you, how you want to frame that narrative. You know, Jen, uh, what we learned from some of this, this story today is, the U.S. is an iPhone-centric market, but the world isn't yet. Mm -hmm. You know, Samsung's still the biggest phone seller in the world, right? I mean, we are. They, Apple's growing in China, but isn't this story? It's just another one of those. Every quarter we get that story on Apple that's bearish, and then it never shows up, mm -hmm. right? And they're they're making a big headline out of what what what'd you say, Jen? Sixteen days, seventeen days. I think that might be a little too early to, to pass judgment on this yet, but Apple is relatively new to the Chinese market. It's not a big percentage of the Chinese market, different in the U.S., but this has more to do probably with, you know, the strength of the Chinese economy, Jen. I completely agree, and all we hear out of China is that the pace of the recovery has been slower than expected. I think that should also be taken into consideration. Is it an iPhone-specific story, or is it a China story? 17 days, yeah, like you said, and I think it's also important to keep in mind that we won't even hear the full scale of the iPhone 15 sales in this next upcoming earnings report that I believe is the first week of November. It's the following one when we finally get a better picture of actually how the iPhone 15 performs. We have so much time. I mean, holiday is coming up that's another big event obviously when you're selling a brand new phone I feel like that is a gift that is frequently given out around this time of year I think the right now we're just jumping the gun a little bit here but like you said 30% of the global smartphone market which is even small I mean obviously much smaller than just the, the overall cell phone market around the world Apple only has 30% so that just goes to show to me the runway for growth we could still see but also how fairly under penetrated we are overseas as as Apple products here in the US it feels like you're in a bit of a bubble that we all have iPhones that's obviously not the case if it's 30% of the global smartphone market India is another majorly lucrative market because that is severely undertapped by Apple products right now to me that says that we could still grow but obviously there are some some logistical issues with building out iPhones overseas just given the fact that right now here in the US there's like an iPhones or an Apple store at every corner that's not the case overseas obviously right, right. yeah and I, I kind of agree with you I was gonna hit on that also the fact that India is gonna be their next big market I mean they've only got one or two stores over in there they yeah. just started production over there on some of their other products so I mean 1.2 billion people I mean that definitely a uh, massive market massive market <laughs> potentially but massive market with people going into the middle class yeah. they have a developing middle class mm -hmm. that's where the yeah. sweet spot is yep all right thanks to Jenny Horn yeah, um, I'm gonna start on calls there down the Apple news it is the only one <coughs> of the elite <coughs> that is uh, actually <coughs> today uh, 
off about a half percent here. Huh. Uh, now let's bring in Alex Crosby, me. senior markets correspondent here. In the <coughs> Alex, I wanted to kind of, you know, we talked a, a little bit about the geopolitical situation that's going to affect the markets, but the other big story this week is going to be earnings. Uh, what are your expectations? We got a l nice little rebound in some of the banks on Friday, but at the same time, they sold off a session highs. Uh, your thoughts here going into this earnings season. I think it's really key for the markets for a maybe a sustainable rally. I think so too. I, I'm not sure that the names we're getting this week uh, on balance will really shape the overall narrative just because you're talking about names like Tesla and Netflix and then a couple of the, of the banks that are still lingering about half of the big banks. I'm not sure that they're going to really highlight what I believe uh, may be the theme of this earnings season, which is Prices on, on, uh, on the producer side, costs, another way to say it, are, are, have been increasing, but the ability to pass those on to the consumer has been decreasing. And we've seen that uh, show up in inflation data where CPI is uh, not increasing at the same rate that PPI is. Uh, we know that uh, certain industries like airlines have basically flat out said they can no longer pass on these costs to the consumers. So I'm looking at this as a uh, potential theme that we could uh, watch kind of play out, which is margin compression, uh, to say it uh, more succinctly. Uh, but I'm not sure that we'll see that uh, in a name like Netflix, for example. Uh, Tesla, I think that that's somewhat self-imposed. I think they have a longer game they're playing. I think they're uh, trying to you know, really firmly establish themselves as a premier automaker, not just an EV maker, uh, and kind of taking more of the razor, razor, razor blade approach uh, to uh, this industry. They've disrupted it a lot in other ways. Uh, and so while they may see margin compression, a lot of that has been at their own choice, which is to choose to lower uh, the, the price at which they're selling their vehicles. That hasn't been Jimmy popped above VWAP necessarily there. Uh, mimicked across the board by other, by other car makers. And Still down two and a half. Costs rise uh, elsewhere because of the strikes. So uh, I'm not looking at Tesla as a barometer for, for, for margin compression, but I do think we'll see it there. Yeah, uh, there were some comments out of the Ford CEO uh, basically kind of pushing back a you know, against the UAW, yeah. uh, they didn't improve their offer. UAW said they had to hurt Ford or Ford at this point, Kevin. But the, the CEO basically came out and said, "Hey, you're Wait helping. No room. You're helping Honda. You're helping to Toyota and Tesla. That's you're damaging right. maybe uh, you know the potential future of a lot of these companies if you don't come to some type sort of agreement. It's been over a month and a reasonable agreement, right? right? And I, listen, it should be concerning to people." Now, when 11 you hear a Ford CEO New saying, there. we have no more room. Right. We've gone as far as we can go. Now, either that's some harsh negotiations or they see profitability coming into question. <coughs> Remember, every time Elon Musk lowers the price of a Tesla, he makes it harder and harder for these legacy auto workers to be, automakers to be profitable when their car comes out. Yeah, because right? they're spending so much money and to develop the electric lines. Right. Remember, when we joke about um, Rivian isn't profitable, they lose money, that's because of the fixed cost. Right. If they produce more cars, they'll become more profitable over time. So these legacy automakers, they don't have that yet. Right. So they, they've got big problems that every time Tesla price comes down, the pressure on them gets worse and worse. And I, I don't doubt Ford CEO saying they have no more room. Yeah, uh, I, you know, it doesn't seem like they're making any progress right now. Yeah. And that's not, uh, you know, Ford's going bankrupt. good for uh, the worker at this point. Uh, but, Alex, when you look at, uh, you know, we talked about earnings moving forward as far as data goes this week. We get some retail sales data, some housing data. Housing, uh, most of the housing stocks were down over 3%. Uh, A little so fake far, out up uh, there. Over the Dang. last week to two weeks here in October. Uh, but what Chomping around there on this the, uh, chop hours. The economic data. I really think it's kind of a light week. Uh, I know we got consumer sentiment on Friday that isn't necessarily seen as a major uh, you know, piece of market data. But I think uh, those preliminary readings oftentimes can be market movers, and we saw that. Retail sales, as well as, uh, of course, some of that housing data, I think is more specific to the sectors that it's, that it's kind of covering. And with it being earnings season, and we'll get, of course, consumer names and, you know, about a mm. month from now, uh, for the most part, I'm just not so sure. Retail sales is a, a, a major mover, absent a massive surprise. So, eco data front, I'm really not that focused on any of it, to be quite frank with you, Tom. But I am focused on the Fed speakers because, given the uh, escalations of geopolitical uncertainty, given the general trend of inflation to be kind of down, right, I'm out of those. some of those <coughs> hotter than expected. Just stop myself out, senior. 
I think the, the Federal Reserve has an opportunity to really lean into sort of its dovish uh, aspects that we've seen recently. If that continues to be the trend, uh, especially if they kind of say, hey, given the uncertainty that we have on the geopolitical front, like we think uh, it's best to wait where we're at, the market could see that as a positive. Um, and the Fed at the same time may feel the pressure is off them to battle uncertainty because you can kind of say, hey, look, we didn't see this coming. It's out of our control. Uh, it's not our fault that uh, X prices are going higher. There's a war now or whatever it may be. Right. It's sort of that best case scenario for the Fed where, you know, the pressure's off them. They don't feel like they need to continue kind of working towards breaking something. Uh, at the same time, uh, the market kind of has delivered this uh, end of the tightening cycle, if you will. Granted, that could be a surprise as well if we get a different message from any of the speakers, mm -hmm. Jerome Powell himself. So that's why I'm going to be watching their words. Yeah. Kevin, the amount of Fed speak this week I, is I, ridiculous. I it is crazy. <laughs> ridiculous. Because it's so many. It, look, it's a whole page, Tom, of <laughs> Fed speakers. I know. I was like going through it on a day to day yeah. basis. I was like, oh my goodness. Yeah. But Harker came out today, pretty dovish. Yeah. Goolsby overseas, a little bit dovish. Goolsby, it's not you would expect. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to take the puts yeah, on that channel think, break, but I'm I think just going to leave it alone. The Fed Wait for the better setup. In the fact that they're now better set up, Fall 15. Willing to say we're done like this with time of day. And it's how long. Right? And liquidity they're, they're being built, chop, to a low volume message that, that they're saying. Because a lot of them, frankly, that it's a tone change to say they think we're done. But Jerome Powell speaks uh, when is Thursday. it Thursday at the Economic Club of New York, and after Friday we're we're quiet into the Fed period. So yeah, I think that you know always ahead of the quiet period they get real loud and that page is ridiculous how many fed speakers there are yeah and uh, that narrative uh you know where they might be done that's still okay because with their you know their policy yeah. at these levels it's just still sort of a restriction at this point so you've got to remember that the lag effects haven't been fully uh you know found i think in this market but uh we'll continue to watch uh, some of that commentary it's going to be a lot this week, uh, led by Fed Chair Powell uh, on Thursday at noon Eastern time. All right, let's take a quick break, guys. We come back, we're gonna take a look at Goldman Sachs. The investment bank has seen its shares under pressure. So Liquor is now red two and a quarter. That's funny.
much the same. So these stocks have all been under pressure. But, you know, Marcus was a bust, right? Mm -hmm. I, I love the fact that Patrick Cantlay, the golfer, used to wear a Marcus hat on tour. All of a sudden, er, switch, Goldman Oh, hat. he did. Okay. Oh, yeah, they took the Marcus hat off. Yeah. So At least it, he's wearing the hat, though. He's wearing the Goldman hat, yes, but he's not wearing the Marcus <laughs> hat anymore. But they need... Like I said, a cyclical business like Goldman Sachs needs a better economy where IPOs and mergers and acquisitions, and you're starting to see them. I wonder if they'll allude to that in an earnings call that's saying, hey, business is starting to pick up and things are getting better yeah. because go, you know, Goldman's, they're exiting the business. Goldman does a great job of, if something's not working, they get out. Right. They're traders, so they get out of things that aren't working. They don't hang on to them. Yeah. So they'll clear the decks of all the things that aren't working. But uh, they're a cyclical business. They need the cycle to turn back up. Yeah, uh, they had a decent quarter last quarter, uh, Alex. The green, green sky, they spun that off, the, sold it to um, Jamie, some private equity volume. firm. Bounce I off think the low they took there. a hit last quarter on that. They're going to probably take another hit because that was a $2 billion investment that they're basically writing down for, they said, around $500 million. So that's going to be a concern. But then they're also, you know, getting out of uh, some of their partnerships, trying to get out of the, some of their partnerships with Apple even, yeah. as far as the credit card and the savings accounts and things like that. So it seems like they're trying to do the right things. But expectations this low, Alex, I mean, it's pretty uh, astounding. It, it really is. But I got a question for you guys. Yeah. So uh, in regards to uh, the Goldman on the hat of a golfer. Yes. It makes sense, right? Like if you're Nike to sponsor, uh, you know, an athlete, you're selling products, they're wearing the products yeah. while they're competing. Who's ever watched a golf uh, tournament and then suddenly seen Goldman Sachs on a hat and like, you know, that's where I'm going to open up my bank. Uh, G Goldman Sachs seems like the place. Like you've already heard of Goldman. You probably already know what it is. Um, I think I, it's I just, just mar it's a marketing thing. I, I know, but why? I'm going to yeah. tell you something you already know, and that is if you're leading a golf tournament on a Sunday. It's a three to four hour commercial that you have every yeah. single shot that he takes. And golf is an uh, affluent habit, a sport. So, I mean, you see KPMG, you see yeah. a lot of financial yeah. firms you out see there. Deloitte, you see all these, and again, yes. I always stand by, and it's like a lot of these decisions <laughs> are made at a business to business standpoint. Like, is somebody really just watching this golf tournament that's running these massive firms and like, you know what? Patrick Cantlay wears Goldman. He's winning this golf tournament. That's who we're going to use but to bring your head. has to be data that says the exposure is real. I think you right. just got marketing budgets and you got nowhere to spend it. And you decide <laughs> this is a this is a good idea. I like golf. This gives me a chance to go to these yeah. events. So. But it's it's like any sport, though. I mean, you, you go into NASCAR. You got Wonder Bread on the side. Yeah, but you, you can buy Boyle Wonder Co Bread at the store. You don't yeah. buy Goldman Sachs at the store. That's my point. But yeah. this is a conversation for another day. These are boardroom I, conversations. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, Wait a minute, stop the show. Wait a minute, we got to stop this. <laughs> no, I want to I talk about Goldman, though, and this is a d uh, dynamic that we talk about a lot, which is the names in this financial world, particularly the big banks that go the second half, have less surprise factor because we've just heard from J.P. Morgan. Yeah. We've heard from Wells Fargo. We've heard from, from Citigroup already. The market reassesses based off those numbers where they feel a name like Goldman will now line up. We got trading numbers. We got investment bank numbers from some of these other firms. Of course, we got consumer banking numbers as well. And the market sort of reshuffles. Well, we saw strong numbers from J.P. Morgan. It was good for what, 2% if, if that? Well, yeah, it was like 4 or 5% early on in the session. that came back. Uh, and then it's doing nice today, but as is Goldman. And so I look at this as... There is a chance that these numbers are okay, or at least better than expected, but how much upside is in these names right now? So I looked at a strategy, Tom, from a trading standpoint mm -hmm. that basically says, be, you know, come and beat me to the upside, because it's not that I think that the numbers will be bad and the stock will go lower. I just think there's a lid to some extent on how high some of these names can go because the surprise factor is going to have to be pretty large uh, in order to catch the market off sides, given the fact that it's a second name, given the part that, that the primary business for Goldman is right now the weak part in, in financial banking. It's going to be difficult for Goldman to come out uh, and really be this top of the line outperforming bank this quarter. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, you get $10, $10 move uh, in the market maker move. You know, what's going to make it move 15 20 bucks? It's going to need to be a big quarter. Yeah. Um, so let's break this one down here, Alex. Uh, I'll walk us through it. October 20th week, uh, monthly cycle that expires in just four days. Uh, Alex is buying an unbalanced call butterfly, but taking a credit. He's buying one 
of the thir uh, 322 and a half strike call, selling two of the 325 strike call, and then buying one of the 332 and a half strike call, collecting a credit of roughly 50 cents. That'll take your break even up to $328 to the upside uh, on this one. Um, and anything below that 322 and a half strike call, you get to keep that credit that you collected. You've got about $450 of risk, and that's above 332 and a half, mm -hmm. where it's maxes out uh, on the upside on this one. Kev, the option market's price is in a plus or minus $10 move. That's come down. It was yeah. over $11 earlier today, so implied volatility's come in a little bit, but still expecting about a $10 move. This takes you, that kicker, to the upside, even if it is a good report and goes up 10 bucks, that one standard deviation, that's right in the wheelhouse of this type of trade. The learning aspect of this segment <clears throat> is that Alex used the platform for strike selection, right? Use the expected move both tomorrow and by Friday and help that with your strike selection. And if, if you're wondering how to do that, that's using the tools on the platform. He's got his peak on that risk graph right in line with the 325 strike, which is right in line with the expected move. So that's how, you know, that's how the sausage is made. That's using the tools to make the decision. Now, he's still got risk, it's defined, but it's risk on the upside. The risk is to the big move to the upside. Right. Any other move, small to the upside in that range, downside, and he keeps his credit. But you, you can see that peak there in is right around that 325 strike. Yeah, Alex, it's mm -hmm. almost like this type of strategy, and we talk about it once in a while, is that, hey, if it goes up, you know, it's fine, uh, uh, anything below that 328 strike, but at the same time, even if it does go down and it disappoints or something, you're still gonna be profitable on this. But you look at this and you think, oh, this is a bearish type of strategy, but it's actually not, right? You kind of want a small up move. I would say you want to move inside the expected move, mm -hmm. but to the upside, but that's only because it expires Friday. If this right. was expiring in November or December, you'll take down move all day, right. short deltas, you'll watch. Uh, the premium sort of slowly uh, decay in that case. But because we're very close to the expiration date, because volatility is going to rapidly reprice post earnings, or at least that would be the anticipation, uh, you know, absent some sort of surprise, uh, this gives us a chance to actually work towards what that theoretical graph looks like at expiration. Yeah. Uh, typically, you should look at that kind of that, that purple or violet line that we have on those as well, because that's how it's going to act in the short term. Right. But when you're super, super close to expiration and there's going to be this volatility repricing, I think you'd be very, very happy with this type of strategy if uh, tomorrow Goldman was 320, 321, right. and you had a chance to really have that 325 in play. If it opens up at 325 tomorrow, you're gonna be sweating for the rest of the week, kind of <laughs> hoping it stays there. Yeah, uh, you can uh, may potentially close it or adjust it if the market's open, the quid is provided ahead of that expiration on Friday, but keep that in mind. But the ideal is here, it grinds up towards that, uh, or at, at or near that 325 strike, as Alex mentioned here. So good look at the unbalanced call butterfly for a credit. All right, thanks to Alex Coffey, Senior Equities Contributor, for joining us, breaking down markets and Goldman Sachs. But coming up after the break, Kevin and I are going to be joined by Landon Swan from Likefolio for a discussion on Target and the data on the stock moves. The retailer has seen its stock plunge about 25% so far this year, but did bounce off those three-and-a-half-year lows just last week. Stick around. Fast Market's coming right back.
You got some calls. <clears throat> I overtraded this morning. I didn't realize. I haven't done that on the, the third train count in so long. Usually there's plenty of buying power. I was just swinging big positions this morning, like back and forth a lot through this you know, consolidation. Well, that kind of sucks. So my position sizing on this one is much smaller than it was going to be, fortunately. Too. It is still midday chop, fortunately. There's the evidence of it. Consumer happiness drop was very, very telling, I think, of what was to come yes. for Target. Uh, and yeah, the stock is down, what, about 40% from its one-year highs. And like you said, it's down even more than that, cut by over half from the all-time highs. Uh, mentions are down about 37% on a year-over-year -year basis. Um, and you can see the happiness here. Um, as actually, the good news here, I'm going to get to some good news. The happiness has bounced back. They were 61%. Uh, down to 50% um, during that whole time, dropping down. And now they've actually bounced back up to about 67%. We've always seen straight. Target higher than Walmart forever in like folio data for a brief period in time during all of that pride stuff. Uh, they actually I got lucky on that river, you two pair. Higher, but now the, the universe has righted itself and Target is, is back to being on top as far as happiness goes. So this is the first slightly bullish sign that we have. Uh, oh, on the very river. side, we've got the change in web visits down about 19%. Like I mentioned before, the social media mentions are down in the 30s uh, percent-wise on a year-over-year -year basis. So you can see Target not hanging with its competition here, Walmart and Amazon. Uh, and they're, generally speaking, they have a good in-store experience, but not if you're in one of those areas where, you know, basically shop to, shoplifting is allowed and they've got to lock everything down. So uh, it just depends on where you're at, how you're going to think about Target. But um, you know, we've always talked about it like folio purchase intent and mentions and demand. That's that's the key for the short term. How are they doing? What are revenues going to look like on the next report? But happiness is a little bit of a longer indicator. We've seen it be a leading indicator for consumer demand. And the fact that Target got down to 50 and then, you know, everything fell through. But now it's bounced back up to 67 on happiness is the very first like glimmer of hope. Like this is a pretty forward leading indicator. So we've got to wait for a while for this to, to you know, work its way through and get consumer demand back up and then revenues up. Uh, but I would say that this is a glimmer of hope for maybe six to nine months from now, looking back and saying, okay, you know, $112 was a pretty good buying price for Target. I'm not quite there yet. Um, I'm optimistic that maybe a lot of the bleeding should be stopping soon. Um, and maybe we're in an oversold type area right now. Uh, but we don't have demand and we don't have uh, web visits and consumer mentions. We don't all have all that primary indicator stuff just yet. We have this secondary indicator of happiness that's saying those will come in the future, but we're not quite there. So depending on your risk tolerance, you know, maybe you could say this is oversold. You could pick some up. I'm still sidelines, but I am, like I said, slightly optimistic uh, that in the future we'll see things picking up for Target. You know, Landon, this company needs a return to normal in the overall economy because cheap chic has turned into just cheap. They just want cheap, right? And th they really have, you know, their discretionary business model, a lot of the stuff they sell is discretionary. They don't, and they, they only have 2,000 stores, a couple less, ba uh, based on your comments. But 
this company has a Walmart problem, right? Walmart has seized this opportunity and really turned the, the, you know, the tables on them with dominating grocery, but also keeping their prices at reasonable levels. So the question is, they're not going out of business anytime soon. So it's not that, but when does this pain end? They need inflation lower where people think cheap chic is back in play here because cheap isn't working for them. No, I, I agree completely. That's not their game, right? They're, it was just, um, you know, just like you talked about, you go there because it's a better experience. Uh, yeah, Walmart's got cheaper prices, but if you start competing with Walmart on price, you're going to lose, um, and you're going to lose a lot of your, your brand reputation, what you're known for. Uh, and so Target, I think, um, maybe have made, may, they may have made that mistake, um, but I think they just, you know, it, they made a lot of mistakes around the customer perception with what they were selling, how they were promoting it, allowing the shoplifting, all of that. It's it just it just doesn't work. It goes against the brand. You got to be agnostic politically if you're a company, and you got to not let you know bad things happen to your stores. It's very simple. Like it's basic business type stuff. But they went the wrong direction, and they're being punished for it. Um, and it's sad to see because how well they dominated during the shutdown. I mean, they they did a fantastic job of offering curbside and delivery, and and really getting out there and expanding their 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 footprint. So, you know, they made a, they great made great moves in 2020 and 2021. But now uh, in 2023, they made some bad moves, and they're paying for it. So, um, I, I absolutely this company's not going broke. I do think that five years from now. You're going to look back, and if you see a 90 on the chart, maybe over the next few weeks, I don't think it'll get that low, but hypothetically, you see a 90 or a 100, definitely going to see a 112 because that's where we're at today. You may look back at that and say, wow, Target was that low. Uh, that's my take on it. Eventually, this thing is going to be back up over 200 well, I just, uh, in the in you, years well, to not come. Even but uh, right Moving now, moving average chopping. I, we're still bleeding a little bit. It's slowing down. Midday. Though. Very optimistic Mid -day, May -day. Of this indicator bumping up but um, we don't have the rest of the indicators coming yet just thought yeah, of that uh, Landon I like that uh, that thought process where maybe you go out in duration on something like this because there's probably still some headwinds with this company they did close nine stores in four different cities that you know theft was just rampant I mean they were just getting cleaned out on a daily basis and I think they're going to do more of that too until some <coughs> of these cities start cracking <coughs> down on the thefts and stuff like that but Landon when you look at the brand here, the brand, you know, a lot of your data deals with the brand and the consumer happiness. The brand hasn't been damaged that much where they can't get out of it, right? Because I think that's the key moving forward where they can see traffic pick up and some normalization. And that's what they need at this point where, hey, they can come back from this, right? Yeah, I think so. I think that, you know, they off that 14 level pretty. have learned a little bit of a lesson. I think the yeah. brand took a hit with all of the, the Snap political 11. stuff uh, that they got into. And, and you know, it, you, you just got to learn from what happened to, to Bud Light and, and Target was the number two. Um, you know, and when a, a large group of people band together and say, you know what, we're not shopping yeah, there anymore, it definitely hurts the bottom line. And there is a little bit of a, a residual um, uh, damage to the reputation. But I think the more that they distance themselves from politics and just – be a store that sells good quality items at a reasonable price, but not cheap. Uh, that's what people are used to. That's what people want out of Target. Uh, and once they get that back, get that going, consumers are going to say, "Okay, this is Target. We can shop there. And it's going to be fine." So you built them both uh, around noon. I'm looking forward well, to that day. I'm looking forward. I mean, to who fault? Gonna be, who's fault is that really? Months, that's... months, something like that. Um, and the fact that they're happening in close to be wow. up, that tells me that that is somewhat in the rearview mirror for consumers. And as long as Target stays, you know, straight and narrow, and just keeps out of politics and is a business, I think they'll do well in that regard. So uh, I'm looking forward to it, and it's not far around the corner. And like you said, that you know, cities. I think we'll get a move here before too long, though. And even the stores, I think, have to crack down on shopping. Maybe, maybe before so one even. Companies that have mentioned this, you know, shrinkage, it's it's theft. Uh, but I mean, what is it? You, you talk about Macy's, TJX, yeah. uh, Ulta, Dick's. Dollar Tree, Lowe's, it, there's so many that have mentioned this. It's a huge problem for these companies. You can't lose a billion dollars in theft on an annual basis. So absolutely, they got to shut down these stores, figure out that problem, and then move forward, get back to the target of old. And then, like I said, $100 is going to look cheap in a couple years. Yeah, uh, got just down to below 103 uh, about a week ago. So we'll continue to watch the story, but great data as always, Landon. Appreciate it.
Thanks, guys. All right, that's Landon Swan, co-founder at Likefolio, breaking down the data. Yeah, Kev, this is one I wanted to talk about last week. We didn't, but I'm glad we did because it was B of A that upgraded the stock, 135 from 120 uh, on this, and they put it to a buy from a neutral, probably based on the fact that the stock was trading near 100 bucks. This is that old conversation that we have, Tom. No matter what stock it is, no matter what they're doing, at some point I want to be short, at some time point I want to be long it. Is Wall is Target there? I have no idea. Yeah. Right. And, you know the problems that they're having with re retail theft. There's nothing nice I can say about nope. that, Tom. That mm -hmm. is not harsh and insensitive. So yeah. I just won't. <laughs> yeah. But they need to get that cleaned up, and they need to get their mojo back. Yeah. They need to make cheap chic cool again yeah. and they can't compete with walmart in so many ways on the scale, grocery side yeah. scale yeah they only have two thousand stores yeah. uh groceries e-commerce they can't really so they've got to get their niche back and get the cheap chic back cool mm -hmm. and for that they need lower inflation a better mm -hmm. overall right. economy because where they make most of their money is discretionary products, and yeah. that's what's fallen out of favor. Yep, uh, definitely. So you got an example trade for yeah. us here, Kevin. Kind of, I think it fits into that longer-term view yeah. as an example that uh, that we got from Landon on a like folio, but go ahead and break it the down The foundation for of this trade time is buying the stock. Okay. Why? Well, because it's got a relatively low P.E. It's got a what 3.9 percent dividend yield doesn't mean they're always going to pay the dividend remember that's not guaranteed there's only twenty thousand dollar raise i don't know why i didn't call right now uh the dividend is 3.9 that's percent. probably a low so what i did i bought the stock oh my goodness don't have the flush i i did instead of a covered call i did something i would have known how to play out that low of flush which is i did a covered i did a hybrid butterfly which time i bought the stock i sold two of the October 20 114 calls bought one of the Ox 16 calls so it's a it's a butterfly in in scope but the one leg the long leg is the actual stock why because because you got a dividend right that was what caused me to do that now if it moves up you know you you do extremely well the risk is on the downside because you're along the underlying but it collects <coughs> data it's about 52 deltas long so you've got some nice upside exposure but this is just taking a, a care of a, a advantage of a stock that looks like it's sitting here and looks like it's stuck until something makes it go higher yep uh let's break this down because it's two separate trades that yes. make up this strategy i think that's something that you have to take into consideration so you buy 100 shares of stock we've got w about a 111.60 it's a little bit higher than that but uh, what you pay for it, for the stock is where it's currently trading, uh, maybe just a little bit higher. And then against that, in the October 20th, the monthly cycle expires, expires in just four neat. days. Uh, you're selling two of the 114 strike calls, buying one of the 116 strike calls. So a two by one, collecting roughly about a dollar twenty credits, probably closer to the dollar thirty five right now. So that would reduce the price. In the, now wrapped up in a in a bow. The price on these two trades, separate trades to combine, would be one ten forty on that, and that would Absolutely be your break nothing. even to the downside. Now you've got a lot of risk on that because had to see my cards along the shares also, right. Kevin. So right. there's the risk part Looks of like you up. Uh, that trade. When you buy a hundred shares, you've got risk of a, over a bad raise. Uh, yeah, you know, saying how we sixty dollars to the downside. <clears throat> if the were to somehow go to zero. But you've got that kicker at or near that oh, short did I just strike. Learn. But even above 116, you're going to get to keep that credit uh, that you're collecting uh, on the short call vertical. But then it's offset by the buying the shares where you're going to start making money on that. But, Kev, wrap it up for us on this tone because it's a little bit more complex than we yes. normally talk about. Yes, it's, it's using the fundamentals of options and skewing them because of the fundamentals of target, which is pretty low P.E., and a nice dividend. And nothing. Right. So go. using that. Oh, means good morning. Thanks. You know, theoretical theta on the Thinkorswim platform is about twenty-five dollars a day. That's nice getting paid. What language away. did if I learn sits though? Here for a while and doesn't move higher. So. All right, super spies ready to rally. Yes. Move each week, 45 That's all I needed. A covered call strategy, which would be a modest hedge, mm -hmm. or a more aggressive is this. Remember, go. you can just do the covered call, and right. that would be enough. Or if you want to. Dare it to Holding go these up, calls or, to Valhalla. Or, you know, play a little more just aggressive. A you could do something like this. But you're right. It's two trades. It's a covered call. It's a short call vertical. Yep. Uh, and you got some assignment risk on that short 114 calls, a two lot that you Ooh. have if it's between that 116 and 
uh, 114, but you do have the shares that might get taken away. You've got to keep that in uh, consideration also. Uh, but risk is all the way to the downside uh, below that 11040 <coughs> level uh, here. But a good look at a different type of strategy here in Target. Now let's take a quick break. When we come back, oh, let's stop. take a look at Bank of America. Stock's fallen about 18% oh. so far this year. It reports earnings ahead of the open tomorrow. Fast until one. Coming right back. Turn off wash sales on Fidelity. Ah, there two pair came out. Cool. No flesh, no hire to pair. Got AMC down two and a half. Give me down two. Snap up to eleven and a half. Hold it. Spy not ready to break. Twelve minutes to one.
their sales are expected to be at 25.1 billion, and that's marginally higher at 2.3% uh, compared to 24.5. Uh, for the same quarter last year. But one of the things I did notice about Bank of America, outside of what they're going to report, if you look at uh, next quarter's earnings, they're expected to earn 76 cents. Now, that's about 9% lower than last year. Uh, and, uh, of course, sales are expected to be uh, below <coughs> this quarter's uh, estimates at $24.3 billion. So they're expecting a, a weaker next quarter relative to this one. But the stock price has already perhaps reflected that, considering it's down in the last year, about 15%. Uh, and overall, like I mentioned, it's been underperforming some of those larger peers. If you look at J.P. Morgan, I mean, you can't really compare this per se to J.P. Morgan because of the fact that uh, they basically got a steal when they got, they got the uh, the First Republic assets with their sales growing 22%, but that wasn't necessarily organic. But overall, that bank has performed exceptionally well considering it has quite an extensive prime brokerage uh, division fixed income currency and commodity trading has been a, a boom for J.P. Morgan, as well as the fact that the wealth management division is quite large as well. You know, George, the, during the March financial and this crisis, liquidity you know, the, this stock, really getting like built all here. the bank stocks traded lower. This one hasn't recovered, George. This is still down or actually right. lower George. than it was in the financial crisis. It is, and that's the thing about it. It's, uh, it's maybe confounding those who are invested in it, but what I'm going to say is, outside of their portfolio of loans, where if you look at their net interest margins, they actually peaked in uh, Q4 of last year, uh, have been down consecutively the last two quarters. Uh, so if their net interest margins beat the estimates, that might be reversal. But I will say this, if you just consider the uh, the core EPS and revenue numbers are quite low, uh, you know, 2% revenue, 1% earnings growth. Now, typically speaking, You'd like to see the the opposite hold true. You'd like to see earnings grow higher than sales uh, higher growth, straight. but that's not going to be the case here based on the estimates for Bank of America, but that could change if they come in with some better than expected numbers, but also denote some uh, some lower loan loss provisions that are expected in terms of uh, holding uh, contingent upon you know, credit losses that uh, that may be better than uh, what, the, what the street is expecting. Yeah, I think this is going to be definitely a guidance uh, earnings event here uh, yeah. because they do expect yeah. some rocky numbers. All right, thanks to George Teller, Senior Markets Correspondent here, breaking down break Bank of America. So, Kev, I looked at this one, and the thing that stuck out to me, it's a low-priced stock, yes, but it then is. I looked at the dividend Always yield. Always has been, really. Yeah, dividend yield about 3.56% if it gets paid out. That's not always guaranteed. So that's the way I looked at this from a trading perspective. So uh, I looked at something where I'm going to maybe push back against the earnings, but going out a little further. So I looked at a covered call strategy here. Where for every 100 shares of stock that I purchase, uh, you sell one of the November 17th monthly options that expire in 32 days, sell the 29 strike call. The option market's only pricing just over a dollar move either way in the shares post earnings. Uh, as far as the option implied volatility goes. So here's the risk profile on that. You're paying roughly a, about a 26.75 debit. So you're basically All right, buying one what the are we shares get? at a little bit of a discount. There's not a lot of option premium and out of the money calls on this cab, but your break even is what you pay about 26.75. Uh, on that, so you've got $2,675 in risk if the stock were to somehow go to zero on it. But, Kevin, this is Damn. relatively conservative, try, trying to take advantage of yield, but with a neutral to bullish uh, stance. By going out 32 days, you're able to sell premium at about 1% of the price of the stock. Right. That's not easy in right. this name. This is a low premium stock. You're always going to have to go out further in terms of premium to get one percent you got to think of it differently but if you do that every 32 days mm. think about one percent suddenly turns into 11 and a half or 12 percent so there's still a reason you got to just understand the change in the dynamics of trading low premium versus high yeah a uh, lot of shares outstanding nearly eight billion share float uh in warren this. buffett berkshire hathaway owns a billion shares a billion shares yeah their largest uh, shareholder yeah. right uh so you keep that in mind also but this type of strategy is as kevin mentioned you have that New ability to roll or adjust a short call as you get closer to expiration I'm big. markets open liquidity is provided creating more yield because if you get to collect that dividend if it gets paid out and selling upside calls against it even if it consolidates here uh, it could potentially be profit because you're buying the shares at a discount. All right, Kev, uh, that's going to do it for us today here on Fast Market. But stick around right here 
on the Stick around. Network. Next Gen Investing's coming up. Move down to VWAP. I did get out of those calls in that break. Uh, I was looking to get into puts. But now we're back to VWAP, so we'll see. entry on VWAP. Choppy mess. That bounce right off of VWAP. What did he build to go up? One o'clock. Stay fun the last few days, but jokes aside, uh, let's talk some markets. You see tons and tons of green on the screen, Jenny. The question is then why? Why today? Why? What is so optimistic about today? And I think it's just that it wasn't that like the weekend didn't deliver anything that was extremely disappointing uh, there was fear going into the weekend of potential escalation on geopolitical fronts um, there was there was of course sentiment deterioration through the University of Michigan sentiment uh, survey on Friday there was just Ugh, pessimism in the market and Bad sometimes job. that just overshoots and I think today is more about just it not being quite so bad uh, I guess maybe being the thought and a little bit of a bounce back I do not feel 
that the story is Just over. I think there is tons of risks that are still both plaguing ways. the market, but at least today there's a generally optimistic feeling uh, seemingly in the air. I completely agree. It almost feels like no news is good news, at least regarding the geopolitical front. This week, though, we do get earnings later on, so we could see that obviously swing the pendulum one way or the other as earnings season has officially begun. Thank goodness. Lots to get through today. As always, we'll kick things off here with our upvote and downvote segment. Then we'll chart and trade those upvotes. And our FOMO discussion is Wayfair, which is Proving the stocking today, horse bid protections. 50% year to date rally. And then we'll be looking hey. at all things Bitcoin, the crypto space, which saw some pretty massive swings today. We'll break down more why later on. And last but not least, Instacart. You might have forgotten about this name that recently IPO'd, but analysts did not as several have initiated coverage on the newcomer to the public, publicly traded sphere today. You could forgive someone for forgetting about Instacart because let's be honest, it's been a pretty forgettable debut for this name. Whoa. Uh, it's not been Alex. Uh, what I think those investment bankers the have hoped there, for man. in terms of its debut, but looking for uh, looking forward to that conversation later on for under 30. We'll get down to the dollars and cents a little bit with George. That's always good. But uh, you talked about Bitcoin, crypto. That's going to be a big part of this discussion later on in the show as well. Renita will help us make some sense of the volatility there this morning. Hard to uh, to have missed it. There was making huge sense. In, in Bitcoin and other <coughs> products. And then, of course, you mentioned FOMO. Looking forward to that combo as well. But let's do up, vote, down, vote. Not endorsements, not recommendations. We got to kick it off with the story of the week. I think that one of the twin stories of the week is going to be uh, the kind of two-headed monster that is Netflix and Tesla both delivering quarterly reports. It has set the stage for mega caps every single quarter. Yeah, I'm and in the call. if there's ever a name that delivers on the expectation of volatility, it's been Netflix over the last couple of years. Yeah, it, it really has. I mean, even I would say dwarfing Tesla. Because After all that, I got stopped, triggered, numbers, so that closed. Would be a huge shock, but almost got into puts. Like every quarter, but I didn't Netflix is, is a mess. wild mover. So they do report, like Alex said, Thursday after Wednesday, excuse me, after the closing bell. Analysts have been naturally updating their coverage. It's a little bit of a mixed picture, I will say. We did get Evercore ISI today rating Netflix as an outperform, saying they're standing by that rating into earnings this week, but they do expect that results could be a little bit mixed here. Netflix has cracked down on some of their password sharing. It's likely to Crack boost down. subscribers by about 6 million in the third quarter. If that figure comes in short, we could see some movement, but the streaming giant could also hike prices when it reports on Wednesday, according to analysts. That's a little bit more of a long shot to me, but of course, that's always a possibility. This is the only profitable streamer. It's Netflix the anniversary of that tweet. Price hike bandwagon the way that Walt Disney has. It's been a year. Years. Previous reports, though, have suggested that Netflix could hike their prices oh at the end of now this Hollywood actor strike, which did reach a resolution a year? five months after that strike. The Writers Guild of America did approve a new contract what? with some of these significant studios last week. But so far, analysts and viewers subscribing to Netflix after this password sharing crackdown have opted for these ad-free plans. The ad tier will likely bring in some $190 million in revenue in the third quarter with subscriber additions of around $2.8 million. Overall, the street is expecting the company to post one of its most robust quarters as far as subscriber additions in several years. So there is that to look forward to. Benchmark today, though, kept a sell rating in a $325 price target. Just goes to show the way that not analysts and all the analysts look at this name and treat this name equally, of course. And the number that always seems to really stick out when it comes to these earnings is going to be that net subscriber additions. I saw a consensus number around 6.1 million for that. So if they beat that <coughs> mark, oftentimes it's a pretty good key about how the stock will perform. And of course, if they fall short of that mark, that's usually a pretty good key. But guidance is as important as anything uh, in terms of how they set the stage going forward. Thanks well. for sharing all that, Millie. They kind of had that ace up the sleeve when it came to the password sharing crackdown. Uh, now that that's been implemented, Jenny, the, end. Uh, the next way to drive revenue is going to be those price hikes and, of course, managing costs as well on the bottom line front. So it was like 10 years since uh, that tweet. Story. Oh, man. You mentioned it being the only. Not if you're in GME kind of, timeline. Uh, streamers also the only kind of pure play in streaming as mm -hmm. well. Uh, Apple might be losing money. You're looking on, at uh, Apple barbecue TV timeline or whatever it is called. But still where most okay of you have invested in it. Disney is kind of finding its way, I would say, if we're kind of be nice about it. And then, of course, some of the other names are really just trying to figure it out. But Netflix seems to be at a, a level of its own when it comes to streaming. I think if you ask basically anyone, at least in the U.S., like what streaming companies do you have? 
Netflix is probably the first that they're going to say, and then it's like they might have others. Netflix mm -hmm. is like that first, and then it's like, what else do you add on? It's kind of like in the old cable days where you, you start with the core package, and then you get the sports package if you want it. It seems like Netflix is where we start, and then we branch out from there. I completely agree, and I think that it's recent. It's recently won, I mean, like the most consistent awards at a, on an annual basis, so it's also showing that its content has improved. I do think there are some very, very interesting Netflix original series and original movies, but it seems like they're working on that pipeline, making their content only more and more in, in, on an improving basis, it seems. Our next name today, though, falls in line with the Netflix conversation. That is Disney. Now, we got an analyst news today. UBS did reiterate Disney as a buy. It reduced its price target on shares to 110 from 122, but said it's standing by, again, its rating into earnings next month. Disney reports on November 8th after the closing bell, but they did say, these analysts at UBS, they expect mm -hmm. their fourth quarter to show continued top line pressure and linear cost cutting and solid, albeit moderate, moderating growth for their U.S. parks, which they have really unveiled these deals for parks. Now, right now, you can save all these different ways if you go with your kids through certain dates. To me, there's like a lot of like, like asterisks to the, the deal saving that Disney has unveiled, but there's definitely trying to get people interested and excited about their parse experiences again. So this name has of the 34 analysts covering it, 25 buys. So seven holds, 200 performs, no sells. Street likes this name. Average price target does imply around 24% upside from here. So it just feels like Disney has had right now nothing to be that exciting about regarding, I feel like we focus too much on its streaming business, but it is such a bigger media company. It just hasn't had enough catalysts in a row to then reboost and reignite some of that overall enthusiasm. It kind of feels, and of course not like this, I mean, we know Disney's a relatively well-managed company, let's say, but it feels like they're throwing stuff at the wall and just seeing what sticks mm -hmm. at this point. They went all in on Disney Plus, didn't really go the way they wanted, so they shifted towards parks. But now they're having the discount during like peak travel seasons and the holidays and New Year's, and that doesn't necessarily signal that things are going great there. Then it's like the ESPN uh, things have been kind of tricky <coughs> the last few years. We know the deals for football games just keep getting more astronomical by the day and then they go all in on betting in, in this espn bet and you know it just seems like they're doing a lot of things at the, at the at the same time and it's like i think investors really like to just see at least one of these things be clicking on all cylinders a core business maybe like parks really driving the revenue and then the rest of these revenue streams from disney plus to espn bat and what have you kind of catch up over time and right now it just doesn't seem like anything's really going well but you know what? Dizzy's been under tremendous king. pressure. He's so jacked. Some of this negativity is being priced he didn't in have a well. king. That is also true. And into this earnings event, I mean, shares are down 2% wow. on the year versus the fact that Netflix shares are up 22% this year. So positioning themselves quite differently into now their quarterly reports. Our next name today, though, is a, a, a name we don't frequently discuss. That is Colgate Palm Olive, which does have <sighs> Very interesting, man. October 27th. So we do have some time. Engineer oh, tears. Coming up. Tears. People today upgrading shares, though. So to buy with a from hold with a price target of $81 a share. That's um, down from $85 a share, actually. But the analyst thinks that volume declines have bottomed for many household and personal product companies, but are likely remaining negative for at least two more quarters. And they said this reflects pricing and heightened global macroeconomic uncertainty that impacts consumer spending. The upgrade, they also said, does reflect modest multiple expansion on improving fundamentals coupled with some un un undemanding current valuation. This name has pulled back pretty substantially as it has so many of these staples. It's down about 8.5% here on the year, down 12% from its highs. We have seen just so many of these consumer product names get crushed. And it's interesting because historically we say these are more resilient. These typically in times of a recession do fairly well. That has not been the case for the last several weeks in so many staples. People are trading down apparently fighting off-brand versions i will say there are certain things especially some of their products i would not trade down on but obviously that is just me and i'm i am like a cleaning product snob so i will never trade down and uh, outside of my my beloved cleaning products you know it's just anecdotal and i have no way of really quantifying this at this point but i'm sure there's a way to but it really feels like e-commerce and Amazon in particular really have been a threat to companies like this that have had long-standing uh, kind of places within consumer staples. 
Amazon Basics, the fact that you're not there at the store, grabbing it off the shelf, comparing it to others, it's oftentimes listed first when you, you know, maybe go to buy trash bags or whatever it may be, you don't really feel that weird just clicking, oh, that, that, that works, so rather than searching for maybe these other brands, I really feel like you, maybe trading down has become more accepted uh, for even more affluent consumers. And in this time of increased costs and more cost conscious consumers, maybe just trading down is the way to go if the products are relatively the same. Now I'm with you, not every product is the same, uh, but oftentimes these products are uh, quite comparable between <coughs> the uh, off-label brands, the basic brand, and maybe some of these name brands when it comes to this. As for the resiliency, well, t things have been better than expected largely throughout this year, at least that's the, the feeling. Whether or not that's actually reality or not remains to be seen, but uh, the feeling has been we haven't gone to recession. So we aren't really needing defensive investments, or at least we haven't thus far. It's really been a year of tech and growth outperforming. It makes sense that consumer staples have not been the place to be. That's a really good point, too, and I also agree with the, the Amazon effect. What's amazing about Amazon is you can go on to some of these Amazon basic products, and you can see like 40,000 reviews, then you're like, oh, if I could save a few dollars here, and it is 40,000 five-star reviews, of course I'll trade down. But again, I have traded down for my, my cat litter before, and it was the most horrible decision I ever did. So stick with what you know when it comes to some of those those key products our last name today is at cat the end. lady is our worst performer on the year and by a lot down 45 percent here this year also with some analyst news today barclay is reducing its price target right, to took a little profits so some stop losses eight with an took a little more high day of its third quarter report that's not till wednesday november 1st but if you the zoom out see some investor fatigue around the health of the consumer debate heading into third quarter amid some of these small and cup and handle maybe names, just formed most names they mentioned so are down the retest is higher breaking out with this handle and filling that gap estimate revisions but the firm does say that this market cap volatility as well as the the ongoing geopolitical conflicts and student loan repayments may further erode consumer confidence and stock narratives. We always say Etsy could be one of the most discretionary names in the market because I actually recently was shopping on Etsy for Halloween stuff. It's never anything you need. It's always things that I'm like, I should probably not be buying this, but that does serve a purpose for that very reason. <laughs> It's a company uh, alongside maybe a name like Shopify, and of course the list is not limited to those two that I think have served a really uh, important purpose, which is helping uh, much smaller businesses <coughs> reach their <coughs> markets, and it's uh, kind of democratized uh, commerce a lot more, particularly names like Shopify if you want to own your own kind of site, but also a place like Etsy that allows, you know, what would have been maybe a local marketplace that is kind of friends and family uh, to reach a, a much wider, uh, you know, of course, net and a potential customer customer base. That being said, it does seem to be a lot more arts and crafty, a little bit more trinket-like items that, like you said, are truly quite discretionary. So if we're a little bit more budget conscious, so much so that we're trading down from name brand trash bags or cat litter to uh, basic uh, and off-label brands, are we really going on Etsy and buying some of these uh, more trinket-like discretionary items? Time will tell, uh, but I think uh, conclusions could be drawn. And paying for shipping. I hate paying for shipping now because I'm so spoiled with the way that like Amazon oh, You're paying it. for it. It's just, you it, aren't yeah, it's all the same. It's all Come on, Jenny. That's very true. It's something that's like a mental block there. But we'll be looking more at our two FOs today. Those in the media space, of course. Disney, Netflix, I'm sure the comparison will be made between the two quite frequently this week. We'll be looking at some example trades as well as some key technical levels. Stick around. Next Gen Investing will be right back. Um, I think it could. Yeah, if we, if we break that high, we could fill that gap up there. It's somewhat choppy today, though. Not, not awful, awful, but not great, really. Not continuation, at least. Nice head and shoulders play back here was like the only one I really was able to capitalize. I guess I got the calls on here, but that wasn't a great setup.
Parrot has an anal exam coming up. Hope he's okay. <laughs> Sounds good, psych you up. I can't really test the high. Definitely shouldn't have a big chop zone. Stopped out of uh, all those. Too choppy. Chop, man. Slow play, get people with an ace. Oh, anything. Um, Blackberry announced generative AI. Creative. I don't know. I don't think that was. Oh, maybe, yeah. It's ripping. That's true. I forgot it was rallying today. Maybe that's today. It's up 8.3. Like an hour ago, at least. Five hours ago. Yeah, it was this morning. That's the reason for the bounce. That ain't bad. Spy's coming down. Wow. Chop fest. keeps gapping over the the stop losses wow look at that drop though <coughs> holy oh who's speaking right now Parker no there's some news going on though no one's speaking not that I know of Something's happening though. 
was an ugly drop. Putin tells Netanyahu that Russia is ready to help end confrontation in the region and resolve it peacefully. Mm. That was eight minutes ago? Maybe. It's kind of a late reaction to that. Maybe they said some more stuff. This is what I'm trying to prepare for with the Fed speakers too this week. I'm gonna get crazy moves like this, potentially out of nowhere. The strikes creates a three to one risk reward ratio. You see that here. 125 max profit, 375 max loss with break evens at 323.75 and 401 and a quarter. Simply adding uh, to the call, the, the, the short call at 400, the dollar 25, and subtracting from that short put at 325. But I also thought it was quite interesting because you have about $30 of a market maker move. Of course, that's not a limit, but rather a one standard deviation range that the platform spits out doing some math, looking at real time option prices. But at a $360 stock, that'll bring you down to 330. And it'll bring you up to 390. Well, that is inside that, uh, of course, uh, the two short strikes here. But also, Rick talked about support and resistance uh, uh, levels. The furthest to the downside, I heard him say, was 324. It's basically right in line with our short strike. And the furthest to the upside was 398, which is just inside of it. So a lot of things converging at once. Neutral strategy, doing the maybe unthinkable here, Jenny, which is looking for a smaller than expected move in Netflix, the name that seemingly never delivers that. That would be why, I mean, we saw that with NVIDIA this past quarter, so they, it's not unheard of for some of these names that do promise volatility. And also, if the expectation is for $30, it can still move 25, and that's still inside the expectations. That's another thing to consider. And that's still a pretty big move. I mean, it I think is. we're just, we're used to Netflix with these massive swings, hopefully not to the downside like we had gotten all too used to. But our next name today here is Disney. Disney doesn't have earnings for a few weeks now, Rick, so we do have some time there. Walk us through what you're seeing from a technical front. Well, kind of the reverse situation here. We, we have a longer downtrend here, a falling wedge type shape, breaking out to the upside this time. However, we can see that we're, we're crossing above our short-term yellow 21-day exponential moving average. We're crossing above our medium-term 63-day EMA today, but there's a fly in the ointment here. We are coming up short right at a level that I thought looked important here. This 85.30 level, that's the old lows from right here, bottomed out near that point many times here. That's about where we topped out here as well, bottomed out there as well, and uh, just recently failed to break above. So today we're once again hitting this familiar stopping point. Not really clear if we're gonna make it. We're about 15 cents away. There's still plenty <coughs> of time left in this trading day though, but that would be a key area to be watching out for as we head into the close here, if we can crack above that level. So overall though, things look like they could be rounding a corner here. Our 21 day EMA is trending upward now. Our 63 day EMA is sideways, which is better than down if you're, if you're- That's the only news I'm seeing here on see we Weeble have a East. Pronounced downward move here that's starting to, starting to flatten out overall. But, you know, our long-term EMA, our 252-day EMA, uh, trending downward here. Why do we pick 252 days, 63 days, 21 days, all these kind of seemingly random numbers? Well, 21 trading days in a month, 63 and a quarter, 252 in a year. Uh, so that's why we pick those numbers. Ooh, that's still flush in there. Thinking behind that. And as you can see, the long-term one still trending downward here, though. So the prevailing trend is downward, but it seems like it's starting to maybe round a corner here, Jenny. So as far as now momentum of the overall trend, tell us what you're looking at. Well, looking at RSI as well, we can see some interesting things have happened recently here. First of all, take a look at this. We can see that RSI made a low and then was trending upward. 
that's at the same time price was trending downward here. So we've got some bullish divergence. We had, uh, uh, you know, a mismatch between our RSI, our measure of momentum, and our price action here. So that's usually a sign that potentially there's some steam building up in the name. There's some, some bullish activity happening. We can also see something else kind of curious happened here. RSI made a new high above its previous high here. Price did not. So we've got another mismatch, another more bullish, bullish mismatch in the RSI versus price. So obviously price is the more important of these two things. You really want to be basing your trading decisions off of price. RSI is more of a confirmatory clue you can use when you're seeing something like this here. This is a way you can make an educated guess about perhaps which way you think price might start to move here when you have a situation like this. But you know, price is the more important thing. Right. So now in terms of some key price levels you're keeping on your radar. What are you seeing here? Well, Disney, uh, you know, we, as I said, we're, we're coming up to a very important level here, the 8530 level, this red dash line right about where we are right now today. That's the mark to beat. Beyond that, if we keep going upward, 8850, roughly our volume profile point of control there, the area of heaviest trading. Uh, so that's where uh, you can look to find support or resistance based on this. These heavy. Yes, I'm glad I wasn't in calls at that point. Expect some consolidation potentially there. The drop uh, did gap though, over my stops though, which kind of sucks. Close from our previous rally, <clears throat> right around 91.76. That would be an area to be on the lookout for. To the downside, maybe a retest of our of our downward sloping trend line just a, around that point we've also got our 21 day ema near 83 the real point to watch the low point our our low <coughs> point that we reached for the year there was about 78.73 so i think really great breakdown on disney obviously seeing different performance than netflix but we do have some duration before earnings so i guess things could change i mean i think that investors are hoping for any sort of turnaround right now we will leave it there get the phone pretty easily Kat, our chart master so Alex, now in trading Disney, considering that they are not a pure play into streaming, they have obviously the parks, they have various merchandising considerations to think about here. What are you thinking as far as an example trade? The earnings in Disney, as you said, is slated for the week of November 10th, or the expiration week that uh, expires on November 10th. So I stayed ahead of that. I went to November 3rd on this so that earnings volatility, at least in the case of Disney in particular, aren't going to potentially impact uh, this particular trade illustration unless there's a surprise early release. One other thing that I uh, focused on too, Jenny, was UBS uh, reiterated a buy, but they lowered their price target. That could be construed as neutral to bullish, I think. You kind of want to, you say buy still, but you don't think it's going to go up quite as much. And so I looked at a neutral to bullish strategy in which <laughs> yeah, we're selling in bluffing. that November 3rd weekly uh. cycle, the 84, 82 put vertical, 60 cent credit is 30 the cents bluff, on the dollar and risk on this guideline there somewhere between that and maybe one third the width of the strikes you can see that max profit is 60 max loss is 140 back up to view I'm, I'm not been trading this uh, at expiration uh, we'd anticipate these options would wild. expire worthless that's the best case scenario for a trader deploying this strategy keep the i don't know if it's, uh that speaker or someone uh, our strikes here speaking. max loss is capped out below 82 at 140 break even 83.40 simply okay, take that 60 cents away from 84 and you're left with 83.84 as a theoretical break even at expiration straightforward trade strategy here jenny neutral to bullish I didn't think there was anyone Disney, else, but not even necessarily to go higher, just to stop going down. I think that that's also the sentiment of the overall market with some of these names that have been somewhat taking it on the chin for the back half of this year. But we'll leave it there for the segment 20. Now coming up next. It's, it's time stupid. to look at all things Wayfair. As some analysts still it. feel optimistic about a name that's already risen about 50% here year to date. We'll discuss more with um, shares up around 2% uh, Yeah, Harker's not till after next. hours. Oh, not, I don't know. I don't think that was necessarily anything. Unless it was from that Putin Putin talk. <clears throat> Putin telling Netanyahu that Russia is ready to help end confrontation in the region and resolve it peacefully. Maybe that's what it was. Something else was said on that phone call. That's, that's gotta be what it was. If that doesn't make you think, make you see how bullish war is, 
Well, that's good. Peace talks, and this thing just plummets. <laughs> Maybe because Putin's getting involved? I'm not sure. There's some volatility and uncertainty. The market will go down. Dislike. Don't say no, though, if it's war. War is bullish. Twelve percent on snap. That ain't bad. Pi found its way back to the view op job. What's up, Jay? going to make the world greener but I'll, I'll take them at their word my question to you though is just integrating this as another way to potentially buy their products is that a good thing for ferrari is that a good thing for bitcoin to see companies like ferrari working with these products is it a win-win or uh, what what is our takeaway uh, from from this headline I think it's a really good marketing strategy. I mean, a lot of investors, especially wealthy investors, do have a, a small portion of their uh, money maybe into crypto, either directly or indirectly. So I think it is, one, once again, trying to, to market out to those uh, potential investors. But it also is a key cornerstone for trying to get crypto up and running. You need to have a utility for the crypto market in order to get investors or get people to actually partake in it. And I think that's one of the things that's kind of been lacking. We've actually seen more uh, around <laughs> crypto when it comes to trading but less around the utility and i think ferrari is really trying to break through that space and trying to command uh you know at least uh getting some of the interest that is out there uh, when it comes to accepting bitcoin now bitpay which is who they are actually partnering with is going to also verify that the cash that they're receiving is not a part of any illicit activities as well i think that's another concern that we've seen from a lot of major players in this space that really don't want a little bit more appeasing uh for those to accept crypto payments in order to uh, deliver goods. 
Yeah, I think I completely agree with you. And really great breakdown on uh, this very interesting story. Kevin Green, senior markets correspondent here for the network. Now it's time for FOMO. So we're going to discuss all things Wayfair that at one point, I believe it was back in 2020, this was one of the most FOMO-esque name. It was, it was one of the best performers throughout the pandemic. It's since fallen back a bit. It's up 50% this mm -hmm. year. Again, year to date it looks a lot different than its three year chart, but Street still likes this name, at least Loop Capital today upgrading share to hold from sell. I guess to say they like it is a little bit of a stretch because we're just no longer having that sell that rating bothered. overhang on shares, but they do raise their, re reduce their price target, excuse me, to $50 a share from 60, saying the company's revenue trend is shifting now into growth territory in its current quarter. And while growth should bounce given some of its volatile comps, the overall trend should be positive. They did add that, however, the return of these student loan payments could be a near-term headwind for Wayfair shares. They are still modeling their 2020, 2023 sales to be down around 1%, though they believe the downside is priced into shares that are down around 16% month to date. So even with a nice 50% gain, that is not necessarily even indicative of some of the strength. We've just seen this recent pullback in shares. This name is pretty split among those covering it. 16 by 17 holds, one underperform, and now no more sells as far as I could see. But average street price target, this was what was so amazing to me, is $89 a share. That obviously considers that there's some really optimistic price targets. So the skew is a little bit dead to the upside. But that implies 85% upside from where we're currently trading, Alex. What really sticks out to me is if you look at where this stock was prior to the pandemic, because we know the pandemic was seen as this huge uh, you know, windfall for a company like Wayfair, at least initially. This stock was about 100 bucks a share before the pandemic. Well, it's $48 a share now. So it's lost half its value over this roller coaster ride that has been the last few years. You know, this is a company that I'll, I'll be honest, I you know ordered some things on it during the pandemic when uh, I did a move to a, a different space. And I'll think twice about it, not because the products were bad, but because it came in like 44,000 pieces and I had to put it together. And you know, sometimes that just isn't really what I'm looking for. But then on the other side, I remember, you know, I, I visited my mom not that long ago and she had recently moved and she talked about how she was buying some things on Wayfair. And I was thinking about how, you know, the demographic shift and, you know, how, how much more comfortable, uh, you know, let's call it like uh, the baby boomer generation has become in buying things online. That's massive because I'll be honest, I'm sure my mom can uh, buy a lot more things uh, furniture wise than I can, mm -hmm. both space wise and just maybe willingness to spend that kind of money on uh, on furniture that's going to be critical for a company like wayfair going forward but i mean if i were to sum up this company over the last three years it's one step forward like 10 steps back <laughs> yeah i agree and i do agree that it's like
Yes, I am. I am still under 30, even though everyone apparently doesn't doesn't believe that. That has nothing to do with Instacart, though. Just the price is obviously under 30 here, but Instacart has been disappointing since its IPO. It's down about 16% now month to date. It's just consistently sort of sold off a little bit here, but here to tell us now more on what the stream really thinks about this name. I'd like to welcome in George Tillis, Senior Markets Correspondent. George, you can pass for under 30 as well, but walk us through what you're seeing in Instacart. George. Well, you're flattering me there, Jenny. <laughs> Way over 30. I mean, look, uh, Instacart, it IPO'd back on the 19th of September. I think a lot of folks, including myself, are familiar with this business, uh, either from a consumer standpoint or effectively because of a marketing standpoint. But uh, it's a very interesting business. I think food delivery on is, uh, is another step in terms of uh, how we shop from the standpoint of e-commerce and groceries. It's very convenient. Uh, I think it's uh, it's going to be growing. And if you actually look at the estimates for the entire Eight and industry on tops. space, uh, the estimates in the next five years is that total 20% uh, of total grocery shopping will be done through e-commerce. And, of course, Instacart will capitalize on that. And I think if you look at the market uh, of this uh, of this industry space, it's really starting to develop into three major players, DoorDash being one. We actually look at Instacart as another one. And Uber, by the way, is actually making a lot of uh, headways into the grocery delivery space as well. So. Uh, because it's a new IPO, we still have to sort of let things sort out from the standpoint of earnings and sales. But if you look at the uh, the analysts now, uh, for instance, a whole slew of analysts today that are that are starting to provide coverage on the name. On the high side, you like you have companies like Goldman Sachs. They've got a forty eight dollar uh, price target. Bank of America is neutral at thirty. If you actually look at Citi, they've got a thirty four dollar price target on this name. Which, if you look at it uh, from the standpoint, it's important here because we've seen a lot of these. You know, SPAC reverse merger names, especially going back to 2020 and 2021, that are, are in terminal declines because they haven't demonstrated any profitability. Instacart is profitable. They did generate on about $2.9 billion in sales last year, or for the trailing four quarters, about $180 million in net income. So I mean, this is an interesting name in a space that's growing. And right now they're growing profitably with about $2 billion on the balance sheet relative to $7 billion market cap. George, as we kind of look ahead in this space, you have Uber on one side that seemingly has, I guess, attempted to build out all of these different services within its ecosystem. And then you have the DoorDashes yeah. of the world, the Lyfts of the world, the Instacarts of the world that are really focused on one aspect of it. Down the line, is there some sort of strategic partnership or merger uh, between these names that are sort of uh, operating in comparable uh, you know, services, but in different parts within it. So you take DoorDash, for example, no. that's primarily delivering restaurant food, and you have Instacart that's going into stores and shopping. Is there a partnership that can be there between a company uh, like those two or Lyft um, to help being better positioned to take on a company like Uber that's doing all of these things? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I think the dynamic of this whole space is quite quite interesting. They're all they all have respective niches in their markets, uh, if you will. I think Instacart is a pure player because if you look at you know their their business, it's really technology. So they don't they're not capital intensive. Uh, I don't suggest they have problems at the very least right now uh, that, that Uber faces because of, for instance, the you know cabbies are are the taxi industries protest against them or if you will dealing with some uh, some labor disputes so i think it's a pure play in the grocery delivery space but i think there's also you know competition we have to be aware of because if you look at walmart even target they're developing their own delivery services uh, i'm not sure about kroger but i could see a potential for partnerships of instacart with major grocery outlets like kroger but that would be again something they'd have to consider because they they would isolate themselves <clears throat> away from other retailers the grocery outlets smaller ones that are going to be using using their services so right now it's a pure play company in the space but i think partnerships are probably going to be in the cards for this company yeah and it's, it's always amazing to me the different like fees and things that instacart can charge i do know from doing this that they charge like an alcohol fee they charge like all these strange fees that ed ends up being very very expensive it's great if you don't have a car but then it's like it serves a very, very niche consumer, and I am that consumer, so I guess I understand it. But it's, it's not cheap, George. That's one thing I will say. But we will leave it there. Sure. Really great breakdown yeah. on Instacart, of course, still relatively new to the publicly traded sphere. But that will also do it for Next Gen Investing for Alex 
and myself for this Monday. Now coming up next, we have the watch list right here on the Schwab Network. I picked up some calls. <clears throat> Might get more on a break on this upper channel. Ten point seven five on snap, seven and a half on overstock. Yeah, I think I think that phone call between Putin and Netanyahu must have been the catalyst for that dump on spy. Biden campaign to launch account on Trump's Truth Social. U.S. Secretary of State Blinken and Israeli Prime Minister. Netanyahu sheltered a bunker for five minutes when air sirens went off in Tel Aviv during their meeting. We've since moved out into our continuing discussions. Maybe that's what it was. Yeah, that sounds like more like it. It's moved out in our continuing discussions at the command center at Israeli Defense. calls.
here going forward. Not today, not this moment. Down 75 cents, 86.97. And Bitcoin, and we're going to have a great conversation about this, up five and three quarters percent off the earlier highs, but still gaining 28,000. 385. So that'll get me. That's a good way to segue into our next big story here in the markets. And we welcome in Caroline Wood, senior markets correspondent here. Oh, on Israel said no. Talk about Bitcoin, which in fact moved over your source on that. And that was on a report that a spot Bitcoin ETF, boy, we've been hearing this forever, <laughs> um, you know, could be coming now that it got the OK, but it really didn't get the OK. Right. I mean, what's going on here? Well, th exactly that. We're keeping an eye on Bitcoin, as you said, up about almost 6% right now, trading above 28,000, but uh, not nearly as impressive as the gain that we saw earlier today on that unconfirmed report that BlackRock's iShares spot Bitcoin ETF had been formally approved by the SEC. That report was an, unable to be confirmed, so the Bitcoin shot higher and then lost a good chunk of those gains, still seeing you know, an impressive rally today. Uh, but there was a now deleted post on X, formerly known as Twitter, by a crypto news service called Cointelegraph that basically said the SEC had approved that ETF. But then they have since said, we apologize for a tweet that led to the dissemination of inaccurate information regarding the Black BlackRock Bitcoin ETF. An internal investigation is currently underway. We are committed to transparency and will share the findings of the investigation with the public once it is concluded within three hours. So we'll look forward to that. Uh, the results from that, BlackRock has told multiple media outlets, though, that the iShares Bitcoin ETF is still under review by the SEC. I will say another little bit of, bit of uh, news that I've seen on Bitcoin today is there was actually a Bernstein analyst out with a pretty bullish note on Bitcoin, mm. noting that it's hard money, money properties make it an attractive safe haven asset, which we know during some times of turmoil, people might flee to safety. Not necessarily the case today with uh, what we're seeing going on in the major averages. But uh, this analyst also points out that since Bitcoin's its inception, it has consistently outperformed gold. So potentially uh, better play than gold in his mind. So that could also be a, giving a little bit of a boost to uh, Bitcoin. We're seeing it currently up about, let's call it 6% at 28,460 right now. And I know you're buying a Ferrari, Caroline. No, she's not. <laughs> not today. Ferrari will now let you pay for your new car with crypto. Um, that came out over the last couple of days. I mean, that's sort of another. But it just shows the big picture and the footprint that crypto really has. Every time I speak to an international investor type guest, they all say that internationally it's certainly much more accepted than it is here in the States. And that that's why Gary Gensler is really holding this up, right? I mean, Thanks, in Jay. January we might hear more. That might also help with the bull case for, for crypto because right now we're not really seeing it being used right. all that often. So there are those that right. say once you can make the case that that it's a you know an actual currency that people are going to be using, then uh, you know maybe you can right. become more bullish on it. But yeah. I certainly I don't have crypto to buy a Ferrari, and you know me too well. I'm too frugal to buy Tomorrow. a Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe tomorrow. Um, and, you know, and on those Bitcoin, um, spot Bitcoin ETFs, there's a lot of them. There's eight or nine of them, and including BlackRock. So we'll wait to see whether, because the word was it was coming out in October. And I think that's why people believed it so fast. Mm -hmm. And that's why you saw that um, sort of gut punch reaction. Let's get to another story, and that's all about Apple and iPhones. Tell us a little bit of that iPhone sales in China. Well, they both green. Stocks, it's really not because the market's up today. You take there's a little lighter seven, green that might not come through. Higher. Apple is lagging, shares down only about a half a percent. I like mint green right now, but still in the red. There are reports that the iPhone 15 is off to a disappointing start in China, actually, compared to the iPhone 14. Bloomberg says that 15 sales are down four overstock new high compared with the iPhone 14 over their first 17 days after release. So that news. Could be Weighing on shares, Morgan Stanley also lowered its price target on Apple to 210 from 215. Still kept an overweight rating on shares, so still a bullish call, but just kind of scaling back expectations. They expect Apple to post a relatively inline September quarter when it reports in November. Uh, says they're expecting 89.9 billion dollars of revenue on a dollar 39 EPS. Uh, that's within one percent of consensus, but. They're already more concerned about the December quarter, saying that their prior forecast, um, it, it's going to be weaker than they were initially expecting, not because of worsening demand data points, but because supply, both labor and component, remains a headwind that's resulting in a push out 
of iPhone 15 Pro and Pro Max models from the December quarter to the March quarter. Also pointing out that the stronger US dollar and unfavorable 14 week comparisons were also factors behind their scaled back estimates. So scaling back, you know, looking ahead to the end of the year, the key holiday quarter and scaling back their expectations there. They did say Apple reports on November 2nd. They don't think that the bull bear debate will be solved at all with this report. So they don't really see it being a catalyst in either right. direction. So still bullish, just scaling back expectations. That being said, I mentioned the new price targets 210. The median price target for Apple is 200. So they're still higher than the median right now. Apple currently trading at about 178 right now, off about a half a percent. So still with some upside potential there. Thank you so much. Two big stories. Thank you, Caroline Woods. Now let's take a look at the bigger picture. Andrew Rosen's with us, president of Diversified. Thank you for being with us. I mean, today we see the markets, all 11 sectors are in the green. We will be hearing from the Fed soon enough. Um, what are your thoughts on what the Fed could tell us? Beyond's up 2.6. What do you think they're sort of trying to translate up four. to us? Yeah, thanks for having me, Nicole. Yeah. I think the overarching sentiment is going to be don't get too excited too quickly. I believe that they were right. going to keep rates where they are, if not raise them one more time this year. It's about a coin flip. Oh, there. this, this Friday is OPEX. As long as the economy is humming along, until we see there, until we see interest rates really <clears> drop, <throat> or <throat> I mean, uh, inflation really drop, they're not in a rush. I think that's clear. Right. And so, be patient. The economy is strong. Unemployment is strong. You're going to have to wait to see a lot of that play out. And we're not anticipating any quick moves to reverse course because. And, and either are they. They don't want to make the same mistake twice. So maybe almost hold steady, and then next year, one or two cuts possibly. That's basically your thought? Yeah, that's exactly where we're projecting out. And probably the second half next year. I think you see this <laughs> She's going for three is a high card. Or one more possibly rate increase. We're getting conflicting information. Probably hang tight Just there. Just trying to see the cards. Maybe watch watch the the economy the, tighten as certain things are going to play themselves out that are a bit lagged here and then second half of next year probably start start uh pulling back a little bit and getting more towards towards our terminal rate all right um you know we have seen the nasdaq in a great uptrend up 25 percent this year um the russell about flat even last week had russell had a terrible week um, you know, the NASDAQ stocks were always known as growth stocks, and now they're sort of translating into value. Do you think that this group can carry the market? I mean, can help it to move to higher levels than where we are now? I do. I do. I, and I don't know that I even look at them at value anymore. I think earlier this year you could have made that comment. Now things are so hot and frothy from a valuation right. standpoint that I think you're really looking at prospective future growth. I think they are back to trading like growth stocks, which is an will be an interesting case study. I do believe that's probably your smart play here unless we hit a real recess recession and now you're looking at some of those value or consumer staples or defensive. But I think for now, seems to be where the innovation's happening. It seems to be what people are lobbing on to and why, why, why fight the, 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 the inertia? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we have a big week ahead. We'll get a lot of economic data. I saw, you know, housing starts, home, you know, existing home sales. You'll have LEI. Any thoughts, retail sales, anything on the economic data this week that you're watching for? Uh, it's, it's the Fed. I mean, it's the Fed and everything related to inflation. I mean, that that is what we are keen in on. Them tipping their hand. It's what you're seeing moving, moving the, the markets. Heck, war's not even moving the market. It's it's so it seems to be Fed, unemployment, inflation. So interest rates, unemployment, inflation. If you're looking at three things right now, I'm moving really up here a little bit. What's going to happen and how the market's going to react. I think that's that's really where to keen in on, and that's been our major focus. So if you're calling for some patience for investors, what should they be patient for? 
what should they be watching and when should they make some moves? Yeah, great question, Nicole. I think you're being patient knowing that the next three to nine months will be these choppy markets and there'll be winners and losers, but you're, I, I think you're gonna be hard pressed to have a sustained bull or bear market. And so we are big fans of diversification. I would play that card all day long. Bluffing. Here, and I would tell you, don't worry, you got hire straight. don't worry about the next three to six, nine months in markets until we have more clarity. It's out. Let these things play out and be patient on that front more than anything. I think that's that's really what we're telling our clients. Of course, we're making tactical changes under the hood, but nothing, no major overhauls right now. It's more of diversifying is going to work, expect it to work, and patience has been our motto for the past six months, candidly. But we should mentally prepare for a short and shallow recession, right? I think that's right. For first, second quarter next year, narrow recession, I think is what you're going to see. Probably still positive GDP growth to some degree. Uh, the million dollar question, does that matter if you're an equity investor? Not so sure it does. I think by the time we are living in that recession, the markets have moved on. Candidly, I think what you've probably seen the past few months is with, with the bit of a sell-off is that anticipation as markets are generally about six have months a full house looking. Maybe. So that's my in, intuition on what we've <sighs> seen. And I think once we get He's there, kicker. assuming we get there, which I think just yesterday me, dude. I was reading that the, the economists aren't even convinced <laughs> there will be one, but I wish once I had a full we're house in the there. recession, I honestly think the markets have moved on. Right, understood. Okay, Andrew Rosen. How in the world we got all the nines? Thank you so much. Good to see you. Oh my gosh. Coming up next, so we're watching the tech giants, Meta, they got Amazon, so lucky. Google. What happens if the market slows down? Our next guest really believes that those names are the names to watch and that they are, in fact, value stocks. We'll get Might be done trading on the day. Ended up being a hugely sketchy day to trade. Um, I think still up a little bit. I was up much more before. Let's see. I was up nicely by here, and then. Yeah, I mean. Yeah.
This guy going with a straight? Uh, guy's getting dealt some cards, man. percent inflation in this environment with the amount of money the government is spending considering where energy prices are probably going to go over the next 12 months and so i still believe though strongly that the fed really is at the top end of the range um 10 percent we're within a 10 percent peak of these rate of, of their raising rates but but the one thing nicole that folks have to understand is interest rates move in two ways one by fed action and two just by the markets and organically they've come up 100 basis points in the last 90 days without the Fed doing anything, actually pausing while maintaining a hawkish tone. And so the marketplace is really doing the Fed's work right now and slowing down the economy. Right, understood. And that's what they were saying. I mean, they talked Nine about what are you the doing? environment slowing things down and maybe, the, you know, whether it's the credit crunch or things like that, that could just weigh on the markets and they won't need to raise rates. So you think that they really have decided to pause. I mean, what then what about a recession and or cuts next year? Well, they haven't stated that they're going to pause, but we'll find out on Thursday at Powell's speech of this week. And so there's lots of activity going on, lots of earnings this week. We've got 530 companies reporting. We've got some key economic data that will influence the, in the inflationary mood here. And what we expect based on this week's numbers is that we're going to see probably organically interest rates are going to go back up another 10, 15, maybe 30 basis points from here and almost hit that 5% mark on the 10-year. And so from here, though, you know, nobody really knows because it takes a long time for the economy to work its way through this effect of high interest rates. And there was so much steam forward and momentum from all the stimulus, all the cheap money, the expansion of credit. And we're still making our way through it. But the consumer is 70 percent of the economy and the consumer is still very, very strong. And so I don't see the consumer pulling back, even though we're starting to see some small pullback in rents. And, uh, and and home prices aren't really accelerating anymore. They're kind of in a state of decline. I think nationally we're down 3% um, over the last six months, which isn't a big enough move for the Fed at this time. And tell me about these price targets. So you have Meta 400, Amazon 175, Google 180. Well, these price targets are in the neighborhood of where everybody else's price targets are. So they're not specific to me, but that's kind of where we see things going the next 12 months. And if you take, you know, Meta and Google and Amazon, um, these are going to be the new value plays going forward. If the economy hits a hard landing or a medium landing or a soft landing or no landing, these companies are going to do well. And so, you know, that's been the main theme this whole year. Um, they have bucked the trend of rising rates and the stock prices have still come up. And so they're kind of uh, antithetical to the economic mood from the Fed. And that's really what you want to own at this time, as opposed to the broader market and a lot of companies that are really getting squeezed due to the fact they've got too much debt, not enough cash flow, and not enough engineering on, these, on their balance sheets. But all that aside, all these companies take care of that, right? But the other issue is there's also going to be a secular bull market in AI, and these three companies are going to be on the forefront of that. And so in this environment, if inflationary indicators go up, 
and these prices dip, you want to be a buyer on these dips, by all means, buy the dips. Because right now, Meta is trading at 24 times earnings, despite 160% increase in stock price this year, it's still relatively priced. And even at 30 times earnings, we're going to see it go up at least one third in price here. That puts it at a hair under 400 at today's market price. And so that's not far fetched at all, as long as they continue to outperform. Right. And, you know, I understand that these were normally the growth names, and that's what ran us up. And that was basically the Magnificent Seven plus Netflix, you know, we'll call it eight, really pushed the market higher overall. But the question is the growth versus the value. And I know you just explained it to a certain extent, but some folks would say they're back in this growth form because um, over, let's say, three months, up 12.5% for a name like Google Alphabet. A name like Meta, for example, has also been running hot. Let me check it out. And so over, let's say, three months, Meta right now is up just 3%. So maybe that one's not a good indicator of growth. Uh, month to date, it's up 7%. So how could you argue value versus growth on these names? Well, it's, it's funny, Nicole. You know, when the market is growing, these are growth stocks. But when the market is going sideways and not growing like it has been since about July 31st, there's been no move in the market on any component. So it's not specific to these stocks as, as it is to the broader market. And so, you know, when the market goes sideways, these become value stocks. And so what I'll point to is the, uh, the end of QE back in November of 2014. and 2015 and 16, we were in a corporate earnings recession, very similar to where we are today, even though we haven't hit a recessionary level. We've had seven straight quarters of negative earnings growth on the S&P. But back in 2015 and 16, when QE ended, the, the FANG stocks basically became the new value stocks because they were able to grow their earnings despite a challenging economic environment with no government stimulus on deck to help feed the economy. And so I see that happening again. I, I, you know, look what's happening. I mean, M3's pulling back, credit's tightening. Uh, the only difference is Bidenomics is, is causing inflation and it's hurting the middle class like you wouldn't believe. And you said it's not based on one kind of economy. My picks are for economically soft, mild, or hard landing. That's amazing. Well, it's it's reality. Um, you know, it is amazing. Um, these these stocks will buck the trend, no matter what the trend is. And so, when that trend is not good for the markets, they become value based. When that when the markets are growing or more in a secular pattern of bullishness, then they become growth stocks. I mean, pick your poison. It doesn't matter. The stock prices are going up, Nicole. That's all that matters. <laughs> Right. Right. Understood. Jeffrey Small, Arbor Financial, thank you so much. Still to come, the big banks kicking off earnings season, and we've been in high gear now. We have some big names to watch. We'll break it all down when we come right back. Spy is ugly and choppy today. <clears throat> it's really a huge side of volatility to get your FOMO meter going. Bad. Dude, 
30. I want to have to see if we get a continuation to the upside. Or settle back down and view up. Whoops, I thought I had middle pair, like low pair. Treasury fund or things of that sort, um, and that has been kind of a, a persistent short-term treasury bond or short-term treasury fund or things of that sort, um, and that has been kind of a, a persistent theme here over the course of the past few quarters and a year and a half. Play calls? Where we've seen Is that Dave Buster's outlandish, outlandish, but outsized uh, net interest nice. margins. Five and a half percent move. The banks are able to charge not really. You're not in a trend. Did you just happen to buy those on a? Have to pay they were never cheaper. On the uh, not as high Actually, as I'm RSI divergence there. And that slowly started to change, but ever so slowly. Might not be and done. I'm a bit surprised by how slow that has been to, to change. But basically, we've seen sort of a continuation of this trend over the course of the past year, where activities such as uh, trading... We've had a bottom up yesterday. Not ...muted, not doing terribly well. The day before. But the bread and butter business of lending, of consumer lending, corporate lending, are doing very, very well indeed. Why are you just defying this? Interest margins. And so that's been the story. The reason? But that is going to basically peter out over the course of the next few Peter. quarters as more and more depositors chase 13 and a half percent on oversight their money out of cash put it into bond funds into money market funds and try and get a higher return yield than they're getting in their checking account or savings account where they're getting close to 1.1 percent just the support you yeah. know you won't even quite at the support any of the other names specifically city said expenses were on the rise but the ipo revival was good news for the investment banking department wells fargo topped estimates but loans we're falling. I mean, we You're near it. Pieces from each one. Um, near this support, like from all the way down to 29, 30, 31. Are we going to see a little more of a resurgence of that? Well, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, if you look at Citibank, for example, they Happy are sort that, of underperforming. Though. At least if you look at their return on equity, it's much, much <clears> lower than the other big banks. They have not done well. Though they've benefited from this high net interest margin environment. They certainly have benefited there. But they have a whole bunch of different legacy institutions around the world that they're trying to unload. They've got they've Oof, been trying to figure out nine. what they're doing in Mexico. They've unloaded up at 11. their operations in Taiwan this year. So there's a lot of stuff that they're trying to work through. And the CEO there, Jane Fraser, she's trying to sort of get her ducks in a row and make amends for the fact that under her basic tutelage since she took over, basically when it was in March 2021, the stock price there has come down over 40%. So she's trying to correct that and do some big restructuring there and get on the right path. So that's sort of the, the Citibank story. Citibank did have a pretty good year in I'm its down a bit. good quarter in its fixed income trading, I think much, much better than others. But that's a bit sort of the luck of the draw. It was a very volatile market and fixed income interest rates went up and down a bit. And the Citibank traders happened to be on the right side of that equation. But that's not sort of a systemic back sort of uh, tailwind pushing everyone forward. That was particular to, uh, to Citibank. You didn't see that kind of upward trend in the trading and investment banking at other banks where it was pretty muted overall. So that's where, where Citibank is. Wells Fargo was interesting because their earnings were up quite substantially, but more than anything on the back of a, a very aggressive cost cutting exercises that has borne some fruit now. So we basically saw them bring their expenses down $1.2 billion in this quarter, which is quite impressive. But otherwise, their revenues are sort of flashish, so not, not terribly impressive there. And JP Morgan, sort of the perennial outperformer, doing really well indeed and, and, and really sort of knocking the ball out of the park. I may be retesting so, VWAP. And JP Morgan certainly seems to be a favorite. You can tell me what you thought as you talk about knocking the ball out of the park. But PNC seemed to be the name. I mean, it did miss on at least one part What's of it. What's up with that The beats that we've seen um, on top and bottom line. But oh. PNC, I guess, showed a little bit of weakness. And spin it forward to the names that we're <clears> waiting <throat> on, right? We'll have Bank of America and Goldman Sachs tomorrow. Well, if you look at banks like PNC, some of the regional banks, they are not constrained Gosh. by the same kind of capital requirements as some of the very biggest banks are. So they or take a little it? bit more risk uh. than maybe they should have. Uh, and they also have sort of a flightier deposit base. PNC is not one of those, perhaps, but some of the other regional banks. Just go to uh, showdown, guys. Right? Come on. But much more quickly searching for high yield. In fact, Charles Schwab's numbers came out and we saw a big decline in the deposits there as the kind of people who hold their money, Charles Schwab, were chasing that high oh, yield and taking the money out of cash and basically putting it to work somewhere in bond funds or in, 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 in money market funds. So how do we see that moving forward? Well, <clears> the other <throat> big two names that are coming out, we've got Bank of America coming out, where I think we expect to see pretty much the same kind of trend. 
a big increase in sort of net interest margin, but slowing down, the, the, the growth rate is slowing down there. We've got Goldman Sachs coming out, um, and I think they're in, in a bit of trouble. They have basically retreated from the consumer banking business to refocus on investment banking and trading, but that's an area that hasn't done terribly well over the course of the past couple of years. So they're sort of stuck there. Uh, they have to sell off their consumer lending arm, Greenstone, at a yeah. loss. So that's going to drag down their earnings this quarter that they've already announced. So I expect we're going to see pretty miserable numbers coming out of Goldman Sachs. And Morgan Stanley is somewhere in the middle overall. So that's sort of the, the terrain that we see there. Morgan Stanley compared to Goldman <coughs> Sachs has a big advantage. It has a big wealth management business. And that has fared somewhat better than the sort of the trading business and the investment banking business. So I expect to see... Morgan Stanley do better Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs will do <laughs> better. And I think Bank of America is going to follow very much in the footsteps of Wells Fargo and JP Morgan in terms of big increase in interest down. margin, um, but slowing down it, but... maybe on a quarter to quarter mm. basis, not that much of an increase. Uh, and then eventually we're going to see that peter out in the course of the next uh, three to four quarters, I would say, in the, on the banking off. side. But I will say the high net interest margin story that has persisted in U.S. banks has caught us by surprise. We didn't expect it would last this long and be Lock this good right? for them. But all, all things, right. good things like that have to come Call to an end eventually, out. I suppose. <clears throat> One eight hundred. Hello. I'll let you bluff. Yep, twelve percent. Our stock twelve point eight. Resisting that resistance. Well, I, I have think that drawn from. We were talking before about what the Fed is going to do. Oh in terms of yeah, interest look rates. at that prior I think the support. The risks are that the Fed is going to have to continue to increase interest rates, and that's going to be a dampening effect on the economy overall and on the markets in particular. So I would expect that the Fed is going to come back to increasing interest rates. Inflation is running much, much higher than they claim they want to have. They say they want to get it down to two percent. I'm not sure how they came up with that number, two percent. It happens to be my lucky number, so I'm very happy about that. But I think overall, there's some question about why are they now sitting on the sidelines and not carrying on increasing interest rates when inflation is obviously much, much higher than they would like it to be. So I sometimes sort of question uh, how the Fed actually comes to its decision-making process. Goodness. I always thought in the past that there was some sort of formula or model have they had of the economy and they plugged in the numbers and it spat out what the money supply should be or where interest rates should be it doesn't seem to be that's the way things work at all it's all the very one of you does sort of politically driven process with people debating and oh, arguing maybe back and you. forth and they, they come up with a result but it's not very quantitative and i if it were i wish they would share their models with us so not enough to get exactly them all in. what they're thinking how they come to the conclusion that they do but there i'm you go. not sure how if you're on the board of governors of the Fed, oh, the yeah, that's great. I, mean, I wasn't even looking for this straight. Just waiting and not doing anything. That's really funny. I knew he had the jack, though. I think there's some confusion there. But I think in all likelihood, they are going to have to increase interest rates further. And that is that going to be quite out well negative for, for the economy and for stocks in particular. And for growth stocks and tech stocks, most of all. And we'll have a big week for earnings. I mean, I know you've been hitting on Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, but we'll have Netflix and Tesla and Procter and & Gamble and AT&T, CSX, Johnson & Johnson, UAL, Lockheed Martin, American Express. Did you have any thoughts Small's on any earnings. of those? I mean, if there's a knee-jerk reaction one way or the other, can that sometimes provide a buying opportunity, let's say, if it pull, pulls back and it's a good name? Are there any names here that you like a lot? Well, listen, there's a lot of good names, but I, I think we'll have to wait and see exactly where the earnings come out on those. I, I think there are certain expectations for each one of those, uh, and we'll have to see and sort of react quickly if we see that basically outperform or underperform. But I, I think at this stage, no, it's, it's, I, I think all these prices seem to be rel relatively fairly priced at the moment. But I think there's an overall downward risk for the markets overall, not in particular names and particular stocks, but for the market overall and for the economy overall. Octavio Morenzi of Afimas. Thank you so much. Nice to see you, Octavio. I'm going to review today's so trades. The half of our show, we're talking Today. Agriculture and construction with a CIO see where, of CNN right, where it kind of went wrong. <clears throat> like, I kind of know it's through like, some of this chop. Of hemisphere, much more right after this. I, I just overtraded. I think. Yeah, I overtraded today. Even on my winning trades, I was trading too much. get into trades that I didn't have enough conviction on to hold, then I'd kind of get her out of them. So that's because I kind of missed missed a lot of this. I can only caught it from here to here, so I was trying to reload up here for a bigger move, and it just didn't happen. So, a bit of FOMO, I guess. I don't know.
But I'm up on the day I just I gave back most of my gains. I actually had pretty good gains at one point. But green is very nice, especially after the last two weeks. Green days. up six. Base is up five. Look at that barcode. some of the earnings that we're expecting, also economic prints that we are expecting, and that is all ahead of the Fed, which starts on October 31st. In the meantime, as I mentioned, all the sectors are higher. You have um, consumer discretionary, communication services, utilities, and materials leading the way. The S&P at 43.70. The Dow is up 300 points right now. Even those small caps are participating today. Let's get some more detail here. Ben Futures contributor to talk about the final 90 minutes of trading. Ben. Hey, Nicole. Uh, good Monday afternoon and uh, good one for the bulls, that's for sure, right? Green arrows across the board. Uh, all four of the major indices enjoying gains here as we kick off another week. And I did see the S&Ps, the SPX up to 43.83. Uh, to put that in perspective, last week's highs, 43.85. We're currently trading, as you can see, right around 43.70. And again, I think a win for the bulls considering the risk of escalation of the war in the Middle East. We've got all four of the major indices up near 1% or greater, and it looks like the Russell leading the way here up over 1.5% as we speak. I did notice here, taking a look at a couple of the other uh, majors, first and foremost, where we are relative to last week's highs and lows. Again, I mentioned we're beginning the week just up near the highs from last week. Wanted to point to the NASDAQ, which is, well, at 15,299, we're holding above the 50-day moving average here. It's the only one of the four majors that is above of the 50-day moving average. The focus here this week is going to be on the financials. Uh, after the better than expected numbers at the end of last week, uh, we've got Bank of America, Discover, Amex are going to be on our radar and definitely going to be watched closely. Taking a look at where we are relative to the 200-day moving average, you can see uh, that you've got three of the four majors at or above. The bottom right corner here is the Russell. That's the one that's actually leading today, but you can see how structurally it's been relatively weak compared to the other four. Uh, three majors. In addition to uh, some of the companies reporting quarterly results here this week, we also have retail sales, Beige Book, handful of Fed speakers. I think, that's, think something like 13 Fed speakers. And then we'll hear from Fed yeah. Chair Jerome Powell on Thursday as well. Right. Thursday is the up, day Dink? to hear from Jay Powell without a doubt. Happy Monday so Monday to you. For any sort of glimpse into what could happen at the next meeting or even next year. Um, then you're watching what's going on with rates mm -hmm. today. Tell us your thoughts there. Relatively contained for the most part, but looking at the two-year uh, as we start off the week right up around this 5% level, I mean, again, this is also why I say I think the bulls, uh, the indices, the, the at 4,400, the S&Ps, I think it's a win for the bulls in many ways. Taking a look here, you've got the two-year 
hanging out again, as I mentioned, right around 5%. Let's we'll step away from the two-year and look at the future side of things. You can see the bonds on the left. you got the 10-year on the right. We haven't been above the 50-day moving average since mid-May, so it just really speaks to that really prolonged trend we've been seeing to the downside. And with futures lower, while well, yields have been and continue to be higher. So again, uh, it's just, we're off the extreme highs, Nicole, but stubbornly elevated levels right now, right? You've got crude, which is hanging out uh, today, starting off the week up around 88. I mean, we're back around 86 right now, actually lower on the day. But speaking of stubbornly elevated levels, this is all a bit of a headwind for stocks. And again, investors have managed to focus on the positive and shrug off rates, uh, the ongoing crisis in the Middle East and uh, what we're seeing in crude as well. Okay, thank you so much, Ben Lichtenstein. Good to see you. Now let's turn our attention over to the world of agriculture and construction. Mark Kermish is with us, the Chief Digital and Information Officer at CNH Industrial, joining us right now here on the watch list. So CNH just closed that acquisition of Hemisphere. It was a $175 million deal. Stock higher today, up about a third of 1%. Um, what do you think folks are watching when it comes, the ticker symbol folks, CNHI, what do you think folks are watching when it comes to CNH Industrial? I mean, what's on the agenda here for the company, especially now with this acquisition? Well, it's great to be back on the show today, Nicole. And from a perspective, what our customers are looking for, I think what investors are looking for is our continued push into providing a full tech stack of precision solutions that really gets us a long way of towards full <laughs> Yeah, we're all on. Well, on hot holiday, deserving other people at another beach. Atmosphere really allows us too to cold wherever you are, I bet. And fully integrate our guidance uh, and positioning capabilities. This is really the root or the base foundation uh, that we need to ensure that we can provide the autonomy and automation that our farmers are expecting out of us, as well as our construction operators. Right. And what kind of time frame are we looking for for this and the integration? Yeah, so uh, officially closed last week. I think when we look at an integration standpoint over the next two to three quarters, you'll see full integration of the hemisphere capabilities. And then we've already started working with hemisphere on the long-term product roadmaps, uh, making sure that uh, they are fully integrated into our receivers that sit on top of all of our vehicles um, to provide that, that you know, centimeter based uh, accuracy on positioning. How are we feeling about demand and uh, work going forward in a high rate environment? Yeah, I think as you've probably heard, you know, I'd, I'd say we believe there's some headwinds in the marketplace for ag, for construction, we're feeling pretty confident uh, in the current market. And, you know, for us, what's really important is to ensure they're providing cost right solutions that allow our farmers and our operators to uh, improve their productivity and yield uh, overall, no matter if they're on the farm or, or in a construction site, and acquisitions like Hemisphere really allow us to do that uh, as we start to bring that technology in-house for a competitive advantage and providing unique and uh, innovative solutions in the marketplace. Yeah, and that's part of it, too, as we're moving forward and you come into alternative energy or alternative fuels, you're trying to stay environmentally conscious, and that's something that you're talking about. The transformation, I mean, you have improvements when it comes to all things digital, and then you have the improvements or changes that are supposed to make that are more environmentally conscientious. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think, you know, certainly alternative fuels, electrification, uh, biomethane, gas, regenerative uh, fuel from, from farm waste is really important. And what's really unique in our world is bringing that together with a capability like Hemisphere allows that farmer to continue to reduce their input costs and improve their overall P&L, uh, as well as that construction operator to ensure that they're providing safe working environments and driving productivity of the operator regardless of the experience of that operator. And bringing those together allow us to really drive to a more sustainable future for our customers as well as their customers. What about the competitive landscape and what needs to happen going forward? I mean, where do we see the most demand happening? I know you have a, a few really recognizable brands under the umbrella. Um, where do we see the most demand happening? Yeah, so I think you know, the most demand that we see today is really in what we call cash crop, right? If you kind of drew a line down the center of the Americas through Canada, North America, and Central Europe, where you're providing and feeding the bulk of the world, that's where our highest demand is. 
And that's where acquisitions like Hemisphere allow us to, you know, outperform uh, and provide that that special uh, geolocation capabilities. You know, beyond that, there's you know continued mechanization in the emerging markets. Those are pretty exciting for us as you look at Asia Pacific and India in particular. Uh, and we can still continue to see strong demand within Australia as the farming practices between North America, Australia, Central Europe, and South America are very similar. You know, all looking for that high levels of automation and precision capabilities to drive yield for the farmer. Yeah. And the buyback program, how's that being received? That's still fully underway, Mark? Yeah, the buyback program is, is being received well. It is underway. Uh, we continue to look at opportunities to, to invest in our, ourselves and believe strongly in our future. All right. Mark Kermish, thank you so much of CNH Industrial. Thanks, Mark. Congratulations on the acquisition, too. Thanks. All right, coming up next, we're going to take a look at theater stocks. Everybody knows Taylor Swift's movie has been a blockbuster and breaking records, at least for IMAX. I saw that. How about a name like AMC and others? Cinemark? For IMAX? Oh, oh, there's, okay, not for Taylor Swift in IMAX. I was like, what? I'm assuming they didn't shoot any of that movie in, with IMAX. Not to say you can't. Checked it in IMAX, but yeah. I'll leave that up. I don't care what they say. Hey, Taryn, what's up, man? Swift, the Eras Tour movie crushing it at the box office this weekend. There were pre-tickets. It grossed nearly $100 million, and it's still going. It was easily number one. It was the best ever at IMAX, and really, it was an unprecedented move by Taylor Swift's team to bypass the Hollywood big production companies and go and partner directly with a large exhibitor like AMC. That brings me to our guests here. Alita Reese is with us of Wedbush Securities and Chad Bainan of Macquarie Group. I'm dying to know, Alicia, what is it? Right? We don't normally Check see you. this kind of move. Um, we know Taylor Swift has already had issues with other big companies like Spotify. And Love maybe it. she just wanted to get through the weeds and say, this is the way we're doing it. And how well it worked. What do you think? Well, I think most movies need a, a big marketing budget, and to um, to deal with the scale of that kind of marketing, you need a studio um, that's large enough to um, to do that. For Taylor, she is a marketing machine. She doesn't need any big uh, marketing companies to do that for her, so she was able to pull that off on her own and go directly to the theaters to do that. I'd say there are to the theaters to do that. I'd say there are very few artists out there who have that capability 
Um, but, you know, we may see towards the end of next year or mid next year, some artists at least attempting that. Mm -hmm. Chad, what do you think of this move? I mean, is this a good thing for a name like AMC? How good? Is it good enough to, to save AMC when people were worried about it? Absolutely, Nicole. Yeah, we've been talking about this for years, the opportunity for artists, for sports events, to kind of climb into certain windows that are underserved. Uh, this was a perfect window for Taylor to come in. October historically is one of the lower months in terms of seasonality. Six to seven percent of your annual revenues come in this month, and it's usually kind of the the horror Halloween type movies that are that are the movies that are seen here. Um, this movie, this this performance got people off their couches to actually move away from the NFL screens uh, to watch someone like Taylor, and obviously we're excited for more things like Beyonce and more alternative content in the future. Right. Chad, um, do you like all of the names, or when you look at the group, do you have a buy rating? There's AMC, IMAX, uh, Cinemark, just to name a few. Which one's maybe sure. buy rating? Yeah, IMAX is our top pick. We have a 40, uh, or I'm sorry, $26 price target, 46% upside. Stock has sold off a little bit in the past week here. We really like the name, into earnings, diverse, uh, diversified company, good balance sheet, good strategy, and a strong backlog, particularly outside of the United States. Cinemark, ticker CNK, would be second. That's a $22 price target, 35% upside. Uh, looking for good things as well for this third quarter, uh, given the public numbers. Um, and then a AMC would be third. We're at $10. Uh, the stock has sold off. It's actually below our price target now. So we're becoming more interested. Uh, we are above consensus for 24 EBITDA in earnings. Uh, so I like where my numbers are. I'd like to see uh, you know, where things shake out when uh, we see the third quarter and when analysts have a finer point on you know, 24 margins in revenue projections. Right, so you have it in that order. IMAX, Cinemark, AMC. Alicia, where, what kind of order do you have these names? Is there a least favorite or most favorite theater stock? Yeah, we're very similar, actually. Um, we also have a $26 price target on IMAX, also our best pick in the space. I um, think they have a lot of upside opportunities here, lots of you know footprint growth um, globally. Uh, local language films and it's age, Asian markets, a lot of footprint growth possibilities in Europe, and it's growing market share pretty substantially um, domestically. And I think they have an edge for the alternative content um, into next year as that might become more important. Um, same with Cinemark, we have a $20 price target on Cinemark, but um, you know, I think there's some, some nice upside there. Uh, upcoming catalysts would be them uh, reintroducing their dividend. Um, think that they have made a lot of progress toward repaying debt, right sizing their balance sheet this year, uh, particularly with the you know the third quarter um, uh, North American box office up 38 percent. That really helped them, I think. And then fourth quarter is off to a really strong start. So I think they're going to be well positioned. I think they would like to see the SAG-AFTRA strikes behind them before they reintroduce. So I think they might wait one more quarter before they do so. But um, being in line to do that, I do think the shares would rally on that. They're still trading at a, a low multiple um, based on their historical trading range. So that dividend should shoot them up to the at least the mid mid range of that historical valuation. Um, similar to um, AMC, you know, um, it certainly dropped a lot. It's now below our price target, um, although we are a neutral. So we are, you know, looking at it more constructively. I think they have an opportunity with the price trading above nine to repay more debt um, by issuing more shares. I don't think their shareholders will particularly like that, though. So we could see some more volatility in the coming quarters. Yeah, and by the way, just to name one more, National Cinemedia, in case people were wondering, I see you have a Wedbush downgrade to neutral, so yeah. I figured I'd add that in, folks. Um, also, just to the privatization of, in China, of IMAX, Chad, can you give me All two right, seconds? It's rallying up. I mean, I know that they proposed to make that acquisition. It doesn't seem to be going so fast. Does it matter that it failed to pass the vote? I don't think it matters. I don't think it was a core part of the strategy, and the stock hasn't really reflected kind of bringing the minority interest into the company. Uh, the backlog, of, as we've talked about, you know, you have 1,700 screens out there in the market with a 500 screen backlog. That's kind of why you're owning the stock. You're owning the stock for block uh, uh, blockbuster blockbusterization, and then kind of bringing it back to the Taylor Swift. You have a movie like this. I'm oh my gosh, I like 10% of the domestic the and global box office. 
for something like this with less than 1% of the screens. So nothing changes in terms of the fundamental view. I would have liked to see them bring this in-house. I think it fits better, it simplifies the story, uh, but we still really like it here and think it's the best name in the group. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, MC actually moving up a little bit. Now has been able to, she just moves everything, right? From football prices to friendship bracelets to whatever outfit she's wearing. And of course her tours sell out and now her movie sells out. And to your point earlier, Alicia, right? She's her own marketing machine. Alicia Reese, Chad Bainan, thank you both. That's going to do it for us here on The Watch List. I'm Nicole Petalides, live on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for watching. Market on Close is next. That's like the second or third hand in a row where I got outkickered by like one card. Bugger. I still doing VWAP chop above it though. Look at this. That's ridiculous. This whole hour, you have. Once start breaking out, then the news in Israel. Then we're just back to the chop. Last hour. I want that hand. Gonna break out now. Okay, some power calls. Do it. little rally here as we begin a week that will be denominated by earnings but also has a lot of fed speak so far though for the most part everything we've heard from the fed speakers has been pretty well choreographed along the lines of uh, higher for longer but no hikes this year bond market's selling off stocks are okay with it that's always notable when you've got higher yields and higher stocks it still is notable when generally the two have been inversely related here over the last three months 
Bond yields up and above 4.7 every time in year <laughs> still below the high of the year means equities are taking it in stride right now Nasdaq's up 1.3 percent Russell's up even more small caps the winner of the day pretty good little comeback for a group that's been beaten down over the past year and lagging well behind the rest of the big cap peers we'll be talking a little bit of the earnings on deck this week as highlights but We'll also be talking some big picture heading into the end of the year. We'll be talking a little retail with the team at Colliers and we've got Dan Niles, giant joining us to talk some macro and connect the of Fed expectations with the market expectations. Talk about some of the business trash themes and stocks that have been a big reason behind the rally, including AI, of course. All right, let's uh, check out where we are with some of the movers from today's session. I think probably a uh, first thing to realize is that crude oil is still stuck below 90 bucks even as conflict rages in the Mideast. The market's reaction no. so far to what's uh, happening yeah. between Israel and Hamas and in the Gaza region is that ultimately it's not as big of an impact for markets as we saw with Russia and Ukraine. They hit right in the middle of an already major inflationary crisis, worsened it by way of huge commodity moves. Just not seeing that right now. So now a week going, and the impact of this particular yes. conflict on market seems to be fairly limited. We also Next saw a call, pop tens call. Some follow through in some of the defense names, but for the most part, the market is still trading on the oh market. And the expectations of a Shit call pocket jacks this guy. Fed. And Wait, why did he win? To try and fill in some of the Their full house all past year. Gosh. Definitely he got on the river. To see how tech companies are responding to the actual numbers that come out to justify oh, wow. the relations that continue to wow. climb. Companies like Alphabet, Meta, Amazon that have done really well over the last <laughs> couple months. The dollar is also oh down my. too. I think that speaks very directly to the and one, Fed theme one right now, which is that even though the economy card shown and I still play it and he, last week we saw <laughs> that inflation is still well above their goals. The river's a full house. not going to hike right now, then perhaps the rise in the dollar has run its course. So the greenback continues to soften up. Not too much. Yeah, you better leave, buddy. So generally our economic yeah, that kind of luck doesn't stick around well ahead of what we see around the rest of the world. Huh? look for numbers out of china and if there is any greater pickup in their economic recovery and any effect of the stimulus that they've injected to see if perhaps the narrative shifts around the u.s economic leadership right now but still generally looking around the world especially looking to europe u.s data has been extremely surprisingly strong how far the dollar will slip might limit how far equities can run generally Stocks have done the best when the dollar is down, though recently we have seen evidence that stocks can go up even when the dollar is up and when yields are up. And that's what bulls really need to happen here. So we definitely want to keep watching the bond market as it relates to the dollar because yields are up and bonds are selling off. As you see the 10 year future there, it's a pretty juicy sell off today. 10 year treasuries are down about half a percent. And there is one thing to keep an eye on here because this is not all totally perfect in the bond market. As we uh, look at the curve for a second here, this is the tens to the twos. A lot has been made about the steepening of the yield <coughs> curve that began in the summer, something that I've described as very positive. And generally, the better Ultimate of the two chaparinos. One being yields blowing out due to runaway inflation and a super hawkish Fed. That was last year's yield move. This year's move has been it. Yes, yields blowing out, but on the back of good economic data and the yield curve widening. However, I wish I had a better hand. just in the last couple days, this is a 10 day chart. So right in the middle of that so is risky. when the inflation data oh started gosh. coming in last week. So basically since PPI and then CPI, the curve has actually flattened a little bit. So the tens to twos are no getting spades, scrunched, no not a ton, but it definitely is a little bit of a pinch. That's a straight though. And if last year, that is the indication, the bear market of 2022, stocks don't like yield curve flattening. So if we just kind of think about it in those simple terms, yield curve steepening ugly, better than yield curve flattening. There has been a slightly negative implication of the most recent inflation data from last week. It's just something to watch. Not a big deal yet, but definitely what you want to keep an eye on because that yield curve flattening is when we start having that more of a stagflation and recession conversation instead of a recovery and reflation theme, which has been this year so far. All right. Finally, stocks. Spy. There, there's the, the rally. Is running today, up one and a half percent. Uh, SPH maybe. ETF leading the charge. This is not like a value trade. This is not a defense trade. This is a risk on trade, a big way. 
you don't believe it, look at Bitcoin. It's still up 6%, even though the headline on the ETF thing wasn't even real. They've got plenty of risk in this market being taken sure right the headline now. wasn't real. The chart I'll be watching this week is Tesla. It's always a fun one. It has a way of leading the rest of the market. And it's got a lopsided triangle here that's been showing up in a lot of these tech charts. A great six months, but still off the highs. And coming to a point, the Tesla chart is super exciting. So that's what I'll be keyed in on. Let's bring in Kevin Hanks from Renita Young. Talk some more about some of the stories here moving this afternoon. And uh, we are really finding a lot of strength here, right, Kevin, with the stocks being led by the Russell and the small caps. Uh, notable, it seems like, given that those have been the laggards for some time. Uh, anything in particular uh, that could get in the way of this strength this week, Kevin? You know, Oliver, being in the autumn of my trading career, you don't <laughs> see a lot of days like this that really shock you in terms of the recovery in this market because basically what we did is we took Friday's complete risk off environment, not necessarily in stocks as much as those risk off assets like puts in the VIX and bonds and gold futures that were spiked higher on Friday. And then you get to Monday and you flip it and everything goes just back to risk on and you realize that over the last 10 days, other than the Russell that has its own weakness, you guys are playing loose. the other three major indices are higher Good hands will be for that 10-day period. Highly favored. So everything we've been through with the geopolitical risk, with the inflation data, with the Fed speak, stocks are still higher over the last the 10 days. Flop. That should give investors <clears throat> a big bit of comfort going into earnings season because stocks look pretty impressive here, even with the amount of risk that's out there in the world. And Oliver, what can derail this? An escalation of that geopolitical risk. I this think be a big pot. you've got interest rates at a level that the market was uncomfortable with and now is less uncomfortable. Let you've me got raise. the dollar down today fueling stocks. Buddy. So all things considered, uh, this market uh, looks really good, except... I mean for that looming geopolitical in. risk that seems to be out there. King, we get so a straight. If they can manage their way through this, we get trips, Jerome Denny. Powell's going to feel pretty good about Almost himself going there. into another Got meeting it. where he can ha where, where, where he can With that kicker too, pause. 12 million. So, yeah, Oliver, it's uh, impressive. These stocks have been so resilient over the last 10 days. Yeah, they just stop calling. Higher. What can derail that? The bigger picture, the geopolitical picture that's always out there, Oliver. Besides that, no, stocks look really good here. Crude oil right now uh, below 87 bucks, so it's uh, not showing. Oh, up yeah, nice. I was wondering if you're still holding through those. To, a yep, crazy dump. Back above $90. A pretty nice well done, Guts. Of winners in the mix today, too. Nike's in there. You were given a uh, gift Microsoft, there. Microsoft, Home Depot, even though we saw kind of a cautionary Little note on some of the home builders, they're having an okay Middle East. Day. Turmoil One of the gift. Other surprising winners, Renita, was actually the day. the other way early on overnight. Bear. And that was Pfizer. And this is kind of like a, you know, uh, out of left field a little bit. But I do think, given we're talking about autumns and seasonality, uh, still in the post COVID world, we always get kind of nervous around wintertime on what's going to happen with flu, COVID, et cetera. That story hasn't materialized in anything negative. Pfizer came out and put a big percent. cut on their wow. guidance that basically admits their COVID sales are way down. In a way, I feel like we could spin that positive Breaking too, that resistance. about like how far removed we are from the last couple of years. Yeah, we could. And so there are a few things impacting Pfizer stock today that's got the bulls buying today. But I feel like the most compelling headline is the cost cutting program that the company announced, saving okay. it three and a half billion dollars between now and next year, the expectations. And so they're going to be uh, initiating that at some point Oops. between now and the end of the year, they're expected to save about one billion before the by the end of the year and then two and a half billion for next year they're expected to realize that and some of those costs that are associated with the program are going to be about three billion dollars majority cash though they'll include severance and then the implementation costs though but of course other things are happening with this stock we heard about the restructuring program but we also heard just as you say about the guidance cut and because they respect of that, that resistance perfectly their price targets on this stock today citibank Morgan, Wells Fargo, BMO Capital. Although City did cite in the me modest near term, they'll see a modest near term revenue upside to estimates, excluding that COVID 19 number, which the company did say that it expects far less COVID 19. King Ace Diamonds, I think he's favored here. They also said that they expect 
lower yeah, value good for job. a few of the other drugs Give as well. Back. And we'll dig into the details of those too. Boy, the market though rallying it anyway. Mm -hmm. Nothing terribly there you positive go, spy. here. Is it breaking it? Other than again, like the fact that they're not selling a bunch of COVID because COVID's not making many problems for us right now, which is good. Right. From a market perspective, I would have thought after a stock that's been getting killed the past year, it would have gotten killed even more on this, but instead it's popping. Exactly. So that was exactly what I was going to point out. You know, it's been trading at multi-year lows yeah. recently. And so today it's popping off of those lows. And that's a good time for people to just, you know, realize this and get in right now. Well, so it's a little uh, <coughs> sign of risk on, you know, mm -hmm. in a market when they can find the losers and then turn them around. We've got a winner, though, that's also breaking out. So if we kind of just run down a list of what's working today, huge rally in Lulu up 11 percent, 52 week high. How bad the, can it, the consumer yeah, small be? Yeah, Short squeezing. $120 yoga pants is getting added to the S&P 500. It's the conundrum Over that I cannot 16 understand and a quarter right now. now, you know, <laughs> and I think that should be um, an index, by the way, the Lululemon index. We should create that somewhere. Yeah, However, it did replace Activision Blizzard. Well, it looks like it's ready to break down. It's broken in that channel. Activision Blizzard was successfully acquired by Microsoft on Friday. That deal closed. And this is one of those stocks that, it's always going to stand out, but even more so as a brand, it stands out because of the loyalty that people have to this brand. Now, I suppose people could have said the same thing. I'm going to let it go. Years yeah. ago, you know, but I don't see people trading in their Lululemon pants now, their yoga pants for anything else, because there's still consistent commentary about how high the quality is of Lululemon products. So, and they're expanding oh God, more these products and into other areas as well. This company has so much more ground to cover since it's primarily United States based. All right, there we go. Nice little lead in for us to talk about some of the holidays. 45 minutes to go. Thanks, Kevin Hankson. We can retest the high. Guys. We can break Andrew out of the high. Joining us from Collier is the National Director of Retail Services and with the always uh, interesting insight into what's happening on the ground and kind of the brick and mortar. Obviously, if you're a store connected to any mall where there's a Lulu, you've got some traffic coming through. Angie, uh, is the, this company now gets its uh, reward for being such a leader, joining the S&P. How many other businesses are there like that out there that are showing such resilience at this point in the economy? Jack. I mean, there's a handful of um, what I would call emerging uh, concepts and retailers out there. There's a handful that we're seeing that it's doing quite well in the in their specific segments. So for example, you have Travis Matthews that's doing a phenomenal job. They've opened up locations across the US. They continue to expand very thoughtfully and selectively. And we're gonna continue to see different offshoots in different formats. For example, we're seeing smaller format stores from the likes of Ikea, Macy's and others. And it's really to do a few things, right? It's to get closer to the consumer, have that more conversation, more thoughtful conversation with those consumers, but it also helps with operating costs. And I think that's a real key function today when retailers are looking at expansion. Okay. So uh, we saw some of uh, the opposite with Rite Aid uh, filing for bankruptcy. I mean, it seems like uh, we are now getting a very business specific, product specific type of uh, dispersion this. within this sector where it's kind of hard to cast uh, or paint too broadly with the brush, given that there's wildly huge wow. success stories like a Lulu and then that. huge failures like a Rite Aid. I mean, it's, it's very, very case by controlled. case, it seems like at this point. It really is. I think retail is definitely has been resilient. We saw, you know, the consumers continuing to spend. It is softening, of course. They are being much more, um, you know, focused around how they spread their funds. But when if you look at, you know, the Rite Aid component and you look at other brands, there's definitely a, a handful of success stories, more successes than there are bankruptcies. Yeah. I think we saw that in 2022. <laughs> Why we are they raising? To see that in 2023. Uh, and so it's just allowing those brands no, and those bluff. retailers all raising. to kind of right size or, you know, Steer, take the ship and and make it go a you know, slightly ships. different direction but it all has to boil down to how the consumer is spending where they're spending what's convenient for them and how is that brand or retailer getting that convenient um channel to that consumer because if they don't have the ability to provide curbside in-store pickup online purchases or delivery and demand on demand it can be very challenging and they'll lose that loyalty from that consumer mm. Now, a lot of these brands, to your point, because of the online avenues they've built out, don't need as much of that retail brick and mortar presence, but there's still some disruption happening there with Target shutting down some of their stores. 
Are you seeing any effect from the real estate standpoint? These are in some pretty major cities, not uh, far from like uh, uh, off the grid locations. Uh, We're gonna lose on the kicker here. Stories uh, this year. Do you Pocket see that Kings, having bluffing. any lingering effect on oh, that's um, too bad. the real estate attached You're not to bluffing, but hoping one has an ace. I mean, it's difficult to say. It depends on the market, of course. So market conditions are going to change um, location to location. Yes, there have there has been, you know, certain closures. There's also, you know, Target at that time was also exploring, you know, their city target format. And the city target format is one where they have a reduced number of SKUs. And so with that, it could have been a com combination of a couple things. One, of course, is going to be, you know, the, um, what they're offering against the labor costs associated with these locations because they're in locations where there's going to be a very high operating costs. So we really have to look at it from market to market and location by location. The good news is we're still seeing expansion. Uh, if we look at what we're seeing today, Ross Stores, for example, is actually, they, they're opening a handful of locations, uh, in the, in they've, which they've opened in the months of September and October. So we are continuing to see growth occur. I just read that Primark is opening two more locations in New York, as well as in Charlotte. So that's another large department store format that's opening. So we're going to continue to see growth. It's going to be market specific. And then we'll we'll you know monitor from there who you see is the big winner for the holiday season amazon had a uh release last week talking about how much they saved people on their prime day which i thought was a pretty artistic uh, marketing effort on their end uh, definitely we definitely had seen about 46 percent of consumers is what we've said um are going to spend uh, well before, you know, the, the holiday season. So that is your Black Friday, your Cyber Monday, and all the other holiday uh, dates in the month of November and December. So spend started quite early. So not only did it start in July with the first Prime Day, but also we're expecting the numbers to be pretty strong for October this past week here. I know numbers are not out as of yet, but if we stop and think about how people are spreading their spend, which is they are spreading their spend because they are still conscientious about, you know, what's happening in the marketplace with inflation and continuation of uh, softening uh, in terms of that. And so we are most likely going to see a very strong um, continuation of spend for, you know, that we're forecasting. I think it was roughly 6.6% was the year over year growth for Spades. Amazon. From oh, you July. got the flash. Well done. And we, we anticipate that's going to be maybe in around that number um, for their October spend. Uh, but people are spending still on electronics. They're spending on fashion and apparel, um, maybe some of that Lululemon that you were discussing mm -hmm. earlier. So I think it's gonna be, you know, it will be interesting to see. I think the, the spend is gonna be mostly, um, you know, with family, with friends, some holiday decor, and of course in the beauty segment. All right, sounds like apart from a couple landmines, that uh, have hit in the sector over the past year that it's on a pretty uh, good pace still even with some of the pricing down and selective spending that's happening signs of some robust activity appreciate the call out to a couple of those specific brands there thanks a lot angie thank you absolutely Ms. Solanke joins us from colliers when we come back let's talk some trading and investing themes to close out the year as we head into the latter half of the fourth quarter dan niles is up next we're going to talk some macro, but we're also going to talk some micro too. GPT or GLP? Look at that shot. raising
else am I gonna do? 40, 40 minutes or so left. Just slowly chopping its way to the high, maybe. trips prices are going to hang in pretty well just because people people aren't investing in expanding oil production etc so i think you have you're trying to balance those two things out in terms of short term versus long term DPC drop. the one other big piece to this DPC is don't forget student loan payments it. which have been on hold for three and a half years they restarted <laughs> I don't know that in October, for and that's going to affect about 25 million people and that's 15 right and a quarter on the overstock. And so that's a big change relative Ow. to the last three years Ow. going into Q4. 
and mm. need to keep that in mind as well. Absolutely. Okay, let's um, talk a few of the themes that uh, you do like still, it seems like, and you want to be a part of, which is the GLP and uh, chat GPT, <laughs> right? There's a lot of G's and a lot of P's. So, I mean, here's the thing, though, is that um, the kind of short-term bulls versus long-term uh, bearish, I mean, it's, a lot of people are arguing right now that what's happening in the AI world is going to be so tech revolutionary that we might be able to just power through some of these macro weights and kind of overhangs. I mean, is the AI rally that big that maybe it can overpower whatever kind of macro burdens we must carry? What do you think? I mean, yes and no. And what I mean by that is everybody's trying to throw all the companies in the same basket. But if you look at it, NVIDIA absolutely crushed their forecasts mm -hmm. when they reported, right? Their July quarter, they beat revenues by 21%. They raised the October quarter by 27%. Yep. The stock is down from when they did this. So that in and of itself tells you that you're going to have to get a little bit more picky around things like valuation. But NVIDIA is the exception to the rule. If you look at Microsoft, which owns 49% of OpenAI, which produced ChatGPT, when they reported in the, their June quarter and guided to September, they actually guided the September quarter in their intelligent cloud division below forecasts. Not by a lot, it's like a half a percent, but it was still below what people were thinking. And Oracle's another example of that. The stock went down the most it had ever gone down in a day in over 20 years when they reported and guided, even though they're you know, talking about how AI benefits them over the longer term. They guided below revenues and EPS for their upcoming quarter. So I think you have to go through this one by one. This isn't like it was at the beginning of the year where you could pretty much buy anything and it went up. And so you're going to have to, I think, oh, spies look up. very closely at earnings season because, as I said, the Magnificent Seven, on Just average, high. these stocks have almost doubled from the beginning More of the year. The day but I think, much like you saw last quarter, the results are going to be very different. That's why, for us, we like NVIDIA, Google, going into this earnings season coming up, as well as Amazon. But, you know, okay. we're short Apple, for example. We're mm. short Tesla, for mm. example. And so... You know, it. I think it varies depending on the company um, uh, in terms of how you should be positioned. Love those specifics. If I can get a 60 seconds for you from you on Ozempic and the other Gs, I mean, this market has gone wild the way it is now trading, not just like the snack companies, but there's uh, analysts out saying it's going to affect airlines. Uh, I mean, like, I'm waiting for companies to start staying on their conference calls that, oh, they've been in the fat loss, you know, business for years, just like they did with AI. I mean, has the market gone uh, bananas on this, or is this really a, that big of a deal? I think it's a, it's a big deal for the following reason. If you go back 15 years ago, according to the World Obesity Atlas, about 24% of the global population, about 1.6 billion people were obese. You fast forward 15 years, that number is now 3.1%. 3.1 billion people and 39%. And this is a major health issue. You know, you've got diabetes, high blood pressure, heart attacks, strokes. And the one thing I guarantee that all of us want is to be able to live longer, healthier lives. Sure. So this isn't, you know, this isn't sort of a, you know, nice to have. We all want to live. And so this is going to, I think, be a massive change affecting all these different industries. And so for me, you know, we own both um, NVO and Lilly for those trends, and we've owned them off and on all year. But I think these have the potential to be the biggest drugs of all time wow. for, those, for that simple reason of we all want to live longer sure. and healthier. So, and so that's where we're sticking. And side of it instead of trying to short the other stuff that's going to get disrupted by it? Yeah, I mean, we're looking on the short side as well, but but it's sort of a balancing act where a lot of names we think have gotten beaten up too much because this is going to take this is going to take place over a longer period of time. It's not like this is going to happen all of a sudden in the fourth quarter. And you've seen a lot of the consumer staple stocks get just absolutely destroyed off of this. And so we actually have we actually bought into some of the consumer staples a, a pretty wide basket. It's over forty names. And we actually bought into the small cap basket as well, which has some of those plus you know, a whole bunch of other stuff in there because they've really lagged the market. So we sort of have this barbell strategy of 
we own the the G's as you as you said, Oliver, right? You know, GPT and GLP stuff. <laughs> and then on the other hand, we have the stuff that people absolutely hate right now, like consumer staples and the Russell. Mm. And that's sort of our barbell approach going into uh, the fourth quarter. I like that. And the, the barbell approach uh, to the uh, to the weight loss trades. Uh, Another one, to, another way to cast it there. Uh, thanks, Dan, for the uh, convo and the deep analysis. Appreciate the catch up. Thanks, Oliver. Absolutely, Dan Niles, founder and senior portfolio manager at the Satori Fund. All right, there you go. From the macro down to the stock picks and the particular company narratives going into earnings season. When we come back, let's trade some options. We've got three bullish trades and three bullish stocks today, and we are in the middle of a major ramp heading into the close. Jay, thanks for cruising by, man. Got a good, happy money Monday. You on Discord. I don't know. What is it missing? Is it missing? I don't know. Have they been that good about being alphabetical or numerical? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Good game. I have clubs, I can't believe that. No. Um, let's go over these trades. So I'll start the day gapped up. Fill that gap actually. Yeah, all these, these small caps are rallying today.
Okay, did overtrade a bit this morning. My position sizing was a little aggressive too. Alright. 9.43, I bought five puts. These are all going to be tomorrow's puts or calls. At 4.30, uh, yeah, 4.34 strike. 9.43. Here. Yeah, I didn't like this trade. Why, why did I take that? Way late. You know I was late. Thankfully, I think I was out of out of a lot of these in the morning really quick. Finding out that it was chopping. Well, I didn't. It wasn't on this candle. It was actually on this bounce. At least looking for low of the day. Anyways, got five there, sold one at 945, which is here for a small profit, and then stopped out of the rest for break even. So, tiny profit to start off. A little scalp, yeah, I did a lot of scalping this morning, that's what it was. I don't like that, but I did it better than I normally do, so I'm happy about that. You just gotta be quick, and I can't, be, I can't trade quick on this brokerage. 950 was in uh, calls. Here, you up? Hold one at nine fifty five. Go right up here. Hold one. I was late on that. Down that cell. More decisive on my cells. Um, and then stopped out of the rest. My stops are missing also. It was gapping over all my stops today, Fidelity. Like all of them. Never once, I don't think, hit my stop. Which is odd and unusual and shouldn't really happen. Not with this. Not unless there's like crazy movement. The spread is like one penny. I'm not trading hundreds or thousands of contracts. It should be able to fully move it. I don't know why that was going on today. Uh, back into five puts at 9.58. Right here. Okay. Oh, sorry. That's when I closed those puts. I closed all of them at 9.58. Yeah, that was a small loss. Um, bought five alls at 10.27. Yeah, so I missed that. That's right, I wanted the calls. Uh, and then it stopped me out or I stopped myself out. Well, that was maybe later. Anyways, 1027, about five calls. Oh yeah, right on this break. Break of this channel that I derived from here. I think it was actually from the bottom. Initially, I flipped it around. Twenty-seven by five calls. Old one at ten twenty-nine. Right there. Old one at ten thirty-one. Right here. Yeah, this it was, it was high, but I was trying to reload to get more movement. I was up a little bit at that point. And then I started over trading here. I bought 10 more calls at 1041. Trying to get this next move. And then bought 10 more calls at 1044. Yeah, so my position sizing for here was too aggressive. Or did already make that move? And I don't think it had started tapering or anything yet, so 
Yeah, then I had about like 25 calls. If I'd sold them faster, I would have been better. Anyways, it wasn't too bad because there were still upside. Uh, sold one at 1045. For a profit. Sold five. 1046. Yeah, that's when I just started getting out of them. Like this big position sizing. I'm starting to chop up here a little bit. These were all for profit though, so not bad. 1047 sold five more here. Sold two at 1048. And then bought five. Bought five more calls at 1050. There. So, yeah, just too much trading. Too much, too much. Getting into them, I was selling them so quick, and I was already getting back in. Yeah. Um, it was somewhat working though, since I was quick to get out, take profits. Uh, 1051 sold, sold two. That was a little loss on those. It's hard to tell now though, because the averages. 1052, yeah, sold another two on that double top potentially. And then I sold the rest, or I stopped out of the rest at. Oh yeah, it gapped over. I think it gapped over my price here. Stop out of the rest at 1052 right here. Wait, did it? What? Yeah, my stop was for 273 and it stopped me out at 270. 270. I sold a couple manually and then I stopped out of the rest. Huh. And then I bought 10 puts at 11.11. Kind of a starter position. Not bad, not bad. Seeing that the highs were not as aggressive. Starting to roll over. Sold to at 11.17. That's for a profit. Yeah, I was just in this area. I was trying to really, really squeeze the top of that. Top of that range in case we kept going, but it was already starting to show signs that it wasn't going to keep going. I just you know, wanted it to and wanted to have a big position, and <clears throat> it was a bit forced. Um, 1117 sold two. Sold two more for profit, 1118. Normally, I would kind of hold these and just kind of keep averaging in if I'm playing the reversal, but being Monday or something, I'm not sure. I just was a little more, a little more hot-handed, just kind of a little more jumpy. Wasn't, didn't have super strong conviction um, on channel breaks or anything. I just get warmed up, I guess. Sold two more at 10.21. Sold four at 10.22. So then I think I was totally out, maybe, thinking that we might you know, rally back up and make another double top or something, but it didn't, just kind of melted. <clears throat> um, bought 10 more puts at 10, 11.32. So right here, yeah, I remember that, that head and shoulders were calling out. And I had a channel in there too that it just rejected. It was like right on the resistance. So I got 10 there. Got 10 more at 10.36, so right here. More confirmation. Another little head and shoulders actually on this candle. But then this kind of sketched me out because I had a pretty big position size and I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I, I was a little skittish today. Um, sold two of those at 1041. So right here. So not too bad. I held them for a little bit. Sold five. Yeah, this is where I actually, this is where all the money came today on the trades. This made up for over trading and the losses. Further down, 10, 1144. Because I had a big position, I had what, 20? Let's see. 20, yeah. I had 20 of them, I guess. Then sold five more, 1144. Right here, I meant to sell more near VWAP. More near VWAP. Um, oh, and then on the small account, my full port account, I bought one put also on that break at 1136. So, I remembered, but then I forgot to close it at VWAP. This one I held till 11.51, unfortunately, for a tiny loss. Um, 
back to this other account. 1144, sold five. Sold two to 1147. Okay, so I got out of a fair amount, round view up. And then I stopped out of 11, 11.49. Yeah, right here on this candle. And I bought calls at 12.08, where the chop begins. Get you buying calls in the middle of the day. Sold them for a loss at twelve thirteen, and I wasn't entering or exiting these at a good timing either. I was entering on the breakouts, and then it would sell off, or vice versa. I would close it. I wasn't waiting for the rebound to, to close it back out. It was just a little bit emotional, I guess, and not enough conviction in opening it. So I get a bad close. I'm not waiting for it to move back in my favor, at least to close it. Um, thankfully I only did that twice, but I did it one more time, 1231, right here, trying to do the breakout again, bought eight calls, uh, this was a bad close then though, because I, again, was a little, yeah, I closed here, uh, or no, actually I closed before there, so that's good, close at 1254, right here, um, those calls would end up working for us, but, I, this, this chop is this is this will get you right here. That is a trap. It's a trap. Yikes! Super yikes! So that was the trade today. Um, I had a couple on another count that I can review, but just shouldn't taken them. Small small positions and um, I think I'm green though. Yeah. So I think that's maybe one thing I did right today on my biggest conviction trade and my biggest sizing. So up through here, my sizing was increasing and I shouldn't have, but once we had the break, I don't remember where the channel or the line was, but once we had that break and it did show rolling over, we had that head and shoulders, my position sizing at that point was the largest, which was good. That's where it should have been the largest. Um, I threw some of it away for, for sure through here. And my position sizing was probably not good either. But then I ran out of buying power, which is kind of weird. I'm not sure. But yeah, 10 minutes of Fugazi is upon us. We've made it. Space up 6.4. Give me down 3. MC's down 1.5. Nine. Probably nine percent year to date. Meta's up over one hundred and sixty percent. Pinterest is up around thirteen percent this year. But again, they all operate in such different worlds of social media. To me, I have a difficult time making the comparison of Snap to Meta, especially just in terms of like market cap. But we did see some analysts, specifically at Modest, Crispy, and Hart, saying that given some of the challenges that have haunted Snap's house, the company executed a significant downsizing last year. But incremental issues have spooked investors this year when comp competitive have recovered. Aside from Snap's internal challenges, they said the competition landscape does remain relatively daunting and they believe the darkest days of the downturn are ahead of us. And they did maintain a neutral rating. You look at the bigger picture though, the other analysts covering Snap, this is honestly the first name in quite some time, Oliver, that I can recall. There are no strong buys. Mm -hmm. There are four buys. There are 30 holds, five underperforms, no outright sells, but the average price target is $9.70. That is exactly where we're currently trading. And again, I can't re recall a time I looked at a stock that had no strong buys. So even those <laughs> buys don't have exactly the strongest conviction. Names pulled back around 30% from its 52 week high. It's not even close to all time highs. And I think, unfortunately, I've been raised in the era of social media. So I can recall names like Vine, names like MySpace. The cycle is vicious and you have to be on the forefront of what is, I'd say, the, the popular interest. Snap mm -hmm. has fallen a little bit out of favor. I'm a little bit biased. I've never had a Snapchat, but I'm definitely never going to have one, that's for sure. <laughs> Whoa, host next gen never had a Snap. That's okay. Uh, you're not missing a whole lot, but uh, yeah, we'll right. say that, yeah, when like everybody on the street hates the stock this much, 
Sounds like they've got an opportunity to surprise to the upside here if they just uh, try and get the act together a little bit and figure out how they're going to fit into that uh, regime of social media. To your point, they are kind of uh, a little bit of a sore thumb in the last couple years. Appreciate it, Jenny. Thanks mm -hmm. for the look. Stock popping. Everything else, too. We've got a big rally heading into the last 10 minutes. We've got our Schwab big picture discussion up next. You could think getting commission-free trades is as good as it gets, but you know better. At Schwab, free means more. You get commission-free online trades and quality trade executions on our powerful platform, plus the satisfaction guarantee. Expect more from your firm. Trade up to Schwab, the better place for traders. No politics, no noise, from bell to bell and beyond. Available anytime, anywhere, on any device for free. Schwab Network. Power your portfolio with the Schwab Network. Schwab Network, available anytime, anywhere, on any device for free. Schwab Network. All right, we got some time left for bulls to squeeze out even more of the juice from this market, which is up big right now. Let's bring in our Schwab team. Nate Peterson is Director of Derivatives Analysis and Cooper Howard's Director and Fixed Income Strategist. Hey, bonds are selling off, but for once, it doesn't seem to be dictating the entire market. Where is this equity confidence coming from, Nate? Hey, afternoon, Oliver. Yeah, you know, if you look at Friday and the, the behavior of basically gold being up as it was, bond buying taking effect, the VIX up, it's, the VIX had its biggest pop basically since March on Friday. I think there just was a lot of that risk off mode heading into the weekend. And then the only way that I can interpret higher yields and a higher equity market like we have today, coupled with a VIX that is down 9%, I think the most logical conclusion is that, relatively speaking, it there, there wasn't a, as much escort. Of course, it's a you know tragedy what's going on over there. But I guess in terms of the market's interpretation of it, I guess that there is some relief buying here. You throw in bullish seasonality and then optimism over Q3 earnings, which are really going to be getting a lot of uh, big names this week, including Netflix and Tesla. And that's the most logical explanation for why we're up over 1% across the board. Yeah, Russell leading the way, the small caps making a big comeback. Well, what about the world of bonds, Cooper? Uh, have we seen the Treasury market now through a week of geopolitical risk, inflation data? Uh, what's the clear takeaway here? Because it's a bit, a bit of a push and a pull. I think that there is no clear takeaway in this market. I think that we're going to continue to see volatility in the Treasury market. And there are a lot of things going on, Oliver. There is the geopolitical aspect of it. Um, we've got the term premium that's moving higher. That's kind of this weird thing in the fixed income market that we oftentimes talk about. That's the compensation for rolling over short term yields. But it's really just a capture all for just a lot of the unknowns that are going on in the fixed income. So I think that there are a lot of events in one of our premises, at least in the near term. Term, we should continue to see a little bit more volatility. Okay. So uh, we might not be totally done yet with uh, the bond bears? I wouldn't say that we're totally done with the bond bears yet, but I do think that we might have some um, room for increase or decrease in the Treasury market. So I think if we look at Fed policy, Fed policy is another unknown. We're going to hear from a lot of Fed speakers this week. I think that the storyline, kind of the narrative that they're going to preach is that they are going to be continuing to hold for an extended period of time. I don't think the important thing to look at is necessarily another rate hike. I think the odds of a rate hike are relatively low for this cycle, but more importantly, important is going to be the story of how long do they continue to hold at these elevated levels and then what is going to change the picture as far as if we do get another rate hike later on the road maybe inflation reaccelerates what are they going to do under that scenario what happens if growth continues to look good and we get into the kind of the soft landing narrative what do they do under that narrative so i think that that's yeah, going to be a into close. factor for what happens even the five finger slot can't get it to move uh, do you think nate that uh, uh, stocks 
holding on Market's to the pissed. ranges of the past several pissed months. at the traders Those making money off of it. Lows. Some of these tech companies actually grinding out 52 week highs. A couple examples of them in the big cap world. How All right, two minutes to close. Thanks you guys so much for your support. Regime. I really appreciate it. Is playing a role here. Your weekend was good. Be ready for a good that. profitable week. Well, Happy Money Monday. Like Coming to a close. Coupled with the technicals that, you know, that nice bounce off the 200 SMA in, try and, in terms of the S&P 500. Try and keep our green weeks flowing this week. Uh, to push us Someone anticipated me thanking you for your likes yeah, and threw one in there. Thank you guys for 18 be, likes. You know, I appreciate it. Question mark around corporate earnings and earnings growth. Um, if you're not on Discord, feel free to join there. It's free. Even if we in chat. You know, estimate that uh, and the, the, the impact of a rate hike uh, still takes. Follow me on Twitter. Happy Money YT. Six months to 18 months. Uh, well, we got our last one in July, so I don't even know if we're fully baked in terms of, you know, what the Fed has done, how that's going to impact the economony. We're going to get GDP next Night week. Night Have a good evening, sir. On the consensus side, See where SPY closes up. It's, it's up a lot, though. It I guess it like kind of makes sense. It has to build liquidity at this there, big, big resistance to break. Thick it easy. Thick it easy. Can't just go busting through there without some strength. Um, it is up 1%, though, so pretty solid. Pretty solid consolidation shop. I think we might hit the top of this uh, range this week. But uh, I'll to see, I guess, a lot of Fed speakers, a lot of earnings. Thanks, Guts. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, Psych You Up. Thanks, Jay. Push next Thanks, Maui. Thanks, Dink. This, uh, coming Thanks, Bubblicious. Uh, has to live up, you know, to, uh, to the expectations. With Thanks, Taryn. As far as Fed speaking, Jerome Powell, uh, anything, Cooper? Uh, any ding, strong ding, ding. Feelings Thanks, guys. We'll see you. Whether or not he's going to, see you on Discord. See you, you know, in the morning. Anything other than what has okay. been okay. He's out. Choreographed. Uh, Fed, uh, you know, speak over the past week across everybody. It feels like everybody's saying the same thing. Yeah, I'd really be surprised if he tries to go outside of the narrative and gives us something kind of a shock.